Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. And the question, uh, call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day number 7, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment, Save the Koala Bill 2021, second reading speeches only. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, President, I rise today to speak to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Bill, the Save the Koala Bill, introduced by the Greens, a bill that we are incredibly proud of, standing up and fighting for the survival of one of our most iconic animals and uh, part of our most beautiful nature here in Australia. Our iconic koala, much loved around the globe, could soon be extinct in the wild. Just last week we saw the Prime Minister of Japan cuddling a koala here in a zoo in Australia. Without urgent action, sadly, Mr Acting Deputy President, zoos will be the only home to where koalas will be seen. WWF's recently released Living Planet report this year was a damning indictment when it comes to extinction. It found global wildlife populations fell by 69 per cent on average between 1970 and 2018. We are indeed facing an extinction crisis. And shamefully, Australia continues to have the most mammal extinctions in the world. This is a record we should not be proud of. The report details a disturbing story of continual decline of more than 1,100 wildlife populations in Australia due to the pressures of climate change, habitat, habitat destruction and, induce, and introduced predators. When it comes to koala populations, it found they plummet, they've plummeted in Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT. We know all too well that the koala is much loved and needs to be saved. The report found that globally, land use change is still the biggest threat to nature, destroying or fragmenting the natural habitats of many plant and animal species on land, in freshwater and our oceans. And I couldn't stand here, Mr President, without acknowledging just how devastating it is that we continue to have native forest logging in this country. It clearly, it, the, this report clearly stated that if we cannot limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, climate change will likely become the dominant cause of biodiversity loss in coming decades. The irony in this, Mr Deputy President, is that in order to stop dangerous climate change, we need more biodiversity than ever before. We don't just need to stop destroying nature, we need to start restoring nature. The Greens have also got a bill for a climate trigger, which would require polluting projects to be assessed for their emissions and their impact on the climate. Another vital reform for our environment laws if we are to make them fit for the crises that we are facing. 
At home here in Australia, we know from our own National State of the Environment report published in July that overall the state and trend of, environment, of our environment in Australia is poor and deteriorating, and it is as a result of increasing pressures from climate change, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution and resource extraction. If urgent action is not taken to address these pressures and threats, then the koala and many other precious wildlife species will be pushed to the brink of extinction. This bill goes a long way to stopping habitat loss. Whether that loss is due to a new coal mine or gas mine or big property development or other, some other type of project, a cement mine, a new road, so long as that, that proposal is on critical koala habitat, it, I put to you, Mr Acting Deputy President, should not go ahead. This is the type of action we need to reverse biodiversity loss and secure a nature-positive world. Earlier this year, the koala was officially listed as endangered. This uplisting, rather than it sounding as a positive thing, it is a devastating uh, mark, means that within a decade, koalas have gone from not being listed as threatened at all to being vulnerable and now endangered, facing extinction within the next three decades. It's not really a coincidence. Mr Deputy President, this trend has happened at the same time as we've had a decade-long government who did nothing to protect the environment and, in fact, put their foot on the pedal to environmental destruction. The environmental wrecking Liberal National Party were in power for that exact amount of time. And of course, we know their attitude towards the koala, Mr Acting Deputy President. All you need to do is listen to the debates coming out of the New South Wales Parliament to know these members do not care about the significance of the extinction of the koala. I hope that the Labor Party will be different. I hope that this government can turn the tide. I hope that together in this place we can see that if we cannot save the koala, we have no, we have no hope. No hope of turning around the trend of environmental destruction. It was during, of course, in the, for the Liberal National Party during their reign that I first introduced this bill. But of course, the pressures of the mining corporations, their donor lobbyists, their property developer mates, they were never going to come at stopping the destruction of critical koala habitat. I hope Minister Plibersek will be better. Minister Plibersek has announced an objective to stop extinction. Well, here is an opportunity to do just that. Because we can't just talk about saving our koala. We can't just talk about saving our wildlife. There's no point just having a target for, for extinction unless you are going to stop ruining and wrecking the very homes of these vulnerable animals. The single most important thing to halting the extinction of the koala is to stop destroying koalas' homes, stop, stop destroying their habitat. There is a number of proposals right now on the desk of the minister where companies are asking for her to sign off on the destruction of critical koala habitat, whether it's BHP, whether it's uh, property developers. The BHP proposal in Peak Downs coal mine expansion, I mean, this is just this beggar's belief. BHP want to expand their coal mine right into koala, critical koala habitat. This proposal sits on the desk of the minister today. If the minister agrees and signs off on this proposal, gives it the green, line, the green light, she is condemning koalas to extinction. So stand strong. Stand up for the koala, stand up to your convictions and ensure that big companies like BHP cannot continue to make profits off the destruction of koala homes. Then there's the Mount Pleasant coal mine expansion in the Upper Hunter region that would cause almost one billion tonnes of carbon emissions. It is also right smack bang on critical habitat. There is other projects like massive housing developments near Campbelltown, threatening Sydney, the Greater Sydney, uh, and threatening the Greater Sydney, only di disease-free, growing koala population. 
more and more threats on koala habitat, and where is the minister in this? Then, of course, there's many projects on the minister's desk where big companies are asking her to green light their projects at the cost of the survival of our native species. And it's not just about the koala, of course. We know the impacts of the MMG tailings dam in the World Heritage Tarkine, the impact that that is going to have on the native species there, particularly the masked owl. There are so many projects of which this minister can actively step in now and stop in order to save and reverse the extinction of our wildlife. And the reason that this is so important is because we know our environment is in crisis. The state of our environment it is at its worst point in time ever. We have to turn the trend around, which means one project might not seem so much, but when you add all of these up, what we see is a devastating tsunami of threatened species, endangered species and extinction. And Once these animals are gone for good, they are gone. They are not coming back. It is an international shame that right here, right now, the Australian koala is on the endangered list, and yet there are still corporations wanting to destroy their homes. This legislation would stop that from happening. This legislation would put a moratorium on the destruction of critical koala habitat to give the koala the opportunity to survive. This isn't about being anti-development. This is about making sure these projects are done in the right places, not the wrong places. And when you are facing a world where the koala may be extinct within the next few decades, you must make the right choices. And allowing in a coal expansion or a big development or a cement mine to happen smack bang in the middle of koala habitat, that is the wrong choice. I hope that this government has a bit more guts than the previous one. I hope that this government fulfils their promise to the Australian people that they will care more about the environment than the last mob. But we need to see this action in full. It's not good enough just to talk about the koala or have your nice cuddly photo you actually have to stop the destruction of their homes. And the Minister for the Environment and the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, they have the power to save the koala today. A moratorium on protecting critical koala habitat would save not just the koala but many, many other species that live within that environmental pocket. As we face the crisis of the dual crisis of climate change and extinction and biodiversity loss, we must be smarter about how we manage these issues. We need to make sure that the extinction crisis is considered as seriously as the climate crisis, because if it is not, we will lose the koala and many of our other Australian native wildlife and species for good. And it's not just about the um, impact that that has on us as a community, the global and international shame. It is the biodiversity loss that we all suffer from. If we want to deal with the climate crisis that confronts us and to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees or 2 at the very least. We know the destruction that climate change is already having. We can see it. We can feel it. The floods, the fires, the more floods, the extreme weather. The climate has changed. 
It's here. It's already threatening our homes, our livelihoods, our jobs. We do need to change the way we engage with our natural world. And one of the major things, urgent things, that needs to happen is the protection and restoration of nature. Because it is biodiversity that is an essential part in our toolkit for combating the climate crisis. But why on earth would any minister in 2022 allow for the destruction of koala habitat knowing that our koala faces extinction, that our biodiversity is needed more than ever, and that nature is crying out for such help. I look forward to hearing the other contributions on this bill because this is an important debate. This is about choice, it's about trade-off, it's about prioritisation. And I don't think for one second that BHP's expansion of a coal mine should be put, should be given a higher priority than saving the koala in, in their critical habitat at this point in time. It is not the right place to do it. For far too long, Corporations have done deals with governments that have traded off our wildlife, that have offset their homes. And over and over and over again, we see these offsets as absolute shams, rorts, bordering on corruption. All you need to do is look at the, report, the Auditor General's report out of the New South Wales Parliament to show the koala has been undersold too many times. It's time to save the koala. Senator Green. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to rise and speak on um, this important uh, matter before the Senate. Uh, a special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef. I've um, had the chance to see uh, the important work that the Albanese Labor government is doing in delivering to protect protection for Australia's unique landscape and environment. Uh, it's been a pleasure, can I say, to work with the new Minister for the Environment. Um, and despite the, the um, objections uh, at the other end of the chamber, uh, she is doing an incredible job of managing. Uh, the very difficult processes around um, environmental protections, uh, approvals, uh, and making sure that we deliver in our budget uh, for the environment. Uh, it was, of course, a Labor government who created the largest network of marine parks in the world, and of course it was Labor governments in office that uh, delivered conservation agendas that have protected some of our most treasured environmental assets, uh, particularly, for example, the Dane tree in my home state. Um, we know all too well that our natural environment and our unique flora and fauna are in crisis. Um, it is true that under the last government, the environment absolutely copped it, and uh, not just in a, in a real way, but in a reputational way as well. Uh, we know that through the Senate, uh, there were many attempts to um, deal with the Environmental Protection Act, and there was a real um, uh, watering down attempt by the previous government uh, in those negotiations. And it is clear that there is finally a Labor government and a Labor Environment Minister who is willing to work to protect the environment to protect native species, to protect, protect the Great Barrier Reef, and I'm very proud of what we've managed to deliver in the budget last night to protect the environment. Um, this bill um, deals with environmental protection, and it deals with um, listings and the way that approvals are made under the PBC Act. Um, we know that the uh, 
environmental laws that we have right now um, have an established legal framework to protect and manage all threatened species and ecological communities as matters of national environmental significance, and that includes the koala. In February this year, it's been noted that koalas were listed as endangered under the Act for the combined populations across the East Coast where they are most at risk. And nobody wants to see this happen. Nobody wants to see a listing of this kind. But it is really important to understand that a listing under the Act that has been referred to today in such a um, uh, misleading way does actually uh, provide uh, an opportunity for assessments to be made around risks for that um, species. They have, uh, as a result, koalas have comprehensive recovery plans in place, uh, and that is the same fact for every native species. I know the koala is incredibly important and popular and iconic, uh, but we want to make sure that every native species that is at risk is dealt with in the same way and is protected under the Act. Last night's budget showed that Labor, the Labor government is making significant investment in the protection and conservation of our environment and, of course, of koalas. We saw last night in the budget that our Labor government is making a significant investment in the protection of $76 million towards koala conservation, including a new commitment of $24.5 million under the new Saving Native Species Plan, which will fund habitat restoration, threat management and monitoring and health initiatives. The budget also included funding for a national koala recovery team that has been convened to guide and track the implementation of the recovery plan, because we know that a recovery plan on its own will not do the hard work of delivering uh, protection, so we are funding a national recovery team. They held their first meeting on the 7th of October. They're already getting on with the job, and, they look, and we are looking forward to seeing the important work that they do. Uh, it is really important to understand that what this bill proposes is to change our environmental laws to afford uh, preferential treatment for koalas over other species, and that is something that we need to consider. Um, I know the lead beater possum is, and loggerhead turtle are other favourites of people in this place and, and in um, the community, uh, but we, we consider that all of those species should be um, dealt with in the same way under the Act. Uh, that's why it is important to understand how this act actually, uh, this, this legislation would actually impact uh, powers and responsibilities under the EPBC Act. Now, um, Labor's budget last night also delivered for uh, the environment more broadly. And I think what's important to understand in the context of this debate and of bills that we will see from time to time from uh, our, uh, the Greens, the political party, from members um, down that side of the chamber, uh, is that when you are a party of government, you can deliver a budget that delivers for the environment. It's all well and good to come in here with private members' bills uh, that seek to tinker around the edges of, of environmental laws uh, and seek to do things that practically would be very difficult to deliver. But when you are a party of government, when the Labor Party is in government, we deliver real investment for the environment, protection that is funded, protection that can be delivered on the ground. That is an incredibly important thing to understand in the context of this debate. Uh, President, under Labor's um, The Environment is, is back on the agenda, and I was pleased to see so much investment in the budget last night under climate change, a new word for those, those opposite in the budget, but also for the environment more broadly. Australians can see the difference. People order, are telling me order. it's the breath of fresh air our nation desperately needs, and we saw that last night. The budget delivers $1.8 billion in funding for the environment. This is a down payment on our commitment to prioritise the environment after almost a decade of neglect under the former government. The Australian government is delivering on its election promises as well. Um, unlike those opposite, we don't just make um, media releases and announcements, we actually deliver on our promises. 
there are a range of targeted investments to reverse the decline from the previous government. The Australian government will build on our commitments in the budget this year, and this is a very important investment uh, in regards to the debate we're having today around the PBC Act. We have included funding in this budget to respond to the Samuel review of the EPPC Act. Um, it was released, we know, um, a few years ago, put on the shelf, ignored by those opposite. But what we will be doing is responding to that review, and we have funded a response to that review to make sure that um, it can be delivered. Um, we can't fix a decade of Liberal environmental damage overnight. Um, we can't undo the recklessness of um, no consistent energy policy over 10 years. We can't undo the years and years of internal chaos around whether climate change is even real. Uh, we can't overnight undo um, the lack of investment and certainty around climate change and around renewable energy. But what we can do is deliver a budget that is focused on getting things moving and hitting the ground running. We've got a higher ambition when it comes to climate change, a clearer path to net zero, a pathway to no new extinctions. We are cracking down on gases that are bad for the ozone layer, new laws that better protect the environment and give business quicker and clearer decisions, something that people have been crying out for, an environmental protection agency, which is, will be a tough cop on the beat to enforce those laws, something that those opposite refused to do when they were in government. And we have made a commitment to protect 30 per cent of our land and 30 per cent of oceans by 2030. We've announced a new nature repair market to reward farmers and other landholders for their work in restoring and protecting the environment. We are working with the agricultural sector, who are some of the people telling us that we need to take action on climate change and deliver um, lasting reform when it comes to environmental protections. Uh, we've committed to expand blue carbon projects more mangroves, seagrass, making our oceans cleaner and getting carbon out of the atmosphere, reducing problematic plastic, developing environmental friendly plastic and alternatives, making it recycling easier for families and businesses. Look, there is more work to be done, but it would be wrong for anyone to come into this place and use this bill as an opportunity to attack the current government or the current environment minister on her commitment and our government's commitment to the environment and to delivering real protection for the environment, real investment, something that we can do and something that Labor governments always do is stand up for the environment. There's more that we can do, but we are getting on with the job. Uh, in addition to this investment, it's it's been fantastic to see the work that we are doing on the ground with land care rangers, and we are investing $19 million over six years to employ and upskill 1,000 land care rangers to help us conserve and restore the environment. Uh, we're also making sure that we're investing in uh, actions for threatened species, places and recovery activities. There's $224 million in the budget for that action. Uh, and I am, of course, incredibly proud of the investment that we are making to protect and restore the Great Barrier Reef. That includes $1.2 billion and 204 of that is new funding to protect the Great Barrier Reef. And we know, we know that under the last government, the reef, one of the biggest economic drivers in regional Queensland, was put at real and reputational risk. That is very, very clear. We know that, uh, and no amount of you know, obfuscating on those from those opposite would consider that um, you know, would, would, be able to, would be able to say that they stood up for the reef, that they protected those jobs, that they made sure that all of the communities that rely on the reef were protected. Uh, but that is what we are doing as a government, and I'm incredibly proud that of that $204 million, 
15 will be going to a centre of excellence in Gladstone uh, to make sure that there is research and science going into our reef protection. And $96 million of that funding will be on on-the-ground projects, working with farmers, working with Indigenous owners, working with traditional owners, sorry, and working with Indigenous rangers to make sure that we are dealing with water quality um, projects, that we are measuring and monitoring water quality, and that we're giving people real-time information. There is um, so much to be proud of of this budget when it comes to the environment. And that is how you protect species like the koala. You invest in the Samuel Review, which we are doing. You deliver a response, which the minister has committed to do. You make sure that your approvals under the um, Environment uh, and Protection Act um, are sound and that they're not based on rants in the Senate, but on sound advice. You make sure that investment is going into threatened species and making sure that we have funding to deliver recovery plans. We don't just leave them on a shelf uh, to gather dust. You ensure that you are investing in the Great Barrier Reef and that you are protecting our environment that actually delivers economic benefits all across the country. That is what you do if you are a Labor government that cares about the environment. That's exactly what this country needs and it's exactly what this country got last night. I am incredibly proud to be working very closely with the Minister for the Environment. I know she takes her role incredibly seriously in assessing approvals of projects and the uh, responsibility that we have to protect threatened species like the koala. What we won't do is come into the Senate and pretend that a bill uh, which tinkers around the edges and looks at um, uh, treating one species different to other, others is the, answer, is the answer to delivering long-lasting environmental protection. That's what Labor governments do. We, we protect the environment by making sure there is long-lasting reform, long-lasting investment and that we have people committed to these protections. That's what we are doing in the budget last night. That is what the Minister for the Environment is continuing to do. And we will continue to do this as a party of government who is building on uh, fixing the last 10 years of mess Senator and Green, reducing the neglect. Your time has expired. Senator Dunning. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, um, it, you know, it's a great a uh, pleasure to be able to join others in making a contribution to an important debate. Um, uh, while I agree with much of what Senator Green has said on behalf of the opposition, um, not all of it is something I can sign up to. Uh, but I do want to start by, um, in my contribution on this, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Save the Koala Bill 2021, just acknowledge the passion that the proponent of this bill uh, has um, in the causes that she uh, prosecutes as the Greens environment spokesperson. Um, I don't think anyone in this place can doubt Senator Hanson Young's commitment to the cause and what she stands for. Matched with that, though, of course, is the rhetoric that we heard in the contribution she made around development versus environment, economy versus environment. And uh, I think that's something we do need to uh, interrogate a little bit in the time available to me and in the debate on this bill and exactly what it does. And it was pleasing to um, hear Senator Green look at the effect or the impact of this bill and exactly what it would materially do, what difference it would make. And is it the answer that we heard in the first speech of the 2022 consideration of this bill uh, that it would be? Um, look, no one argues with the fact that we need to do everything we can to preserve and to protect our precious and fragile environment. Not a single person in this place thinks that it is worth uh, burning, chucking away, destroying. No one. Um, most people who are characterised as having that view, of course, are people who believe in balance. And that's a concept I'm going to come back to a little later on, be they farmers, be they foresters, be they people who are making a contribution to the Australian government's commitment to build a million new homes for Australians to live in and to ease the housing crisis. They're all characterised in the same way as developers who want to, want to quote, destroy the environment. But I think it is uh, a falsehood to suggest that this bill is the only way 
to address the issues and the <coughs> pressures being faced by the koala and the environment it um, uh, lives in. Uh, it's wrong to suggest that this is the only way, or indeed even a way, because I'm not convinced that what this bill would do would materially improve the outcomes for the koala in the way it's been suggested. Uh, the debate that's being set up here, of course, um, you know, frames, a, frames the parameters of discussion up to suggest uh, that the only way to protect the koala is, of course, to stop all land clearing. Um, now, we know. We know very well that uh, to enter into an arrangement of that nature, to put in place a moratorium uh, on any form of land clearing in habitat that would be uh, under the uh, elements of this bill uh, contemplated, would have um, a dire impact on other parts of our society. Um, you know, that balance I've talked about between the environment and the economy. Um, look. We, we have to have the best standards possible when it comes to the, ma the management of our environment and to habitat management for endangered and for threatened species to ensure that we don't make situations worse. That is absolutely central to what we as a developed nation must put in place when it comes to our environmental legislation, the regulation around development, around resources extraction, around managing the forestry industry. We have to have all of those uh, regimes in place. Um, as part of international obligations we sign up to, uh, and rightly so and proudly so, as uh, Senator Green said on behalf of the Labor Party. But stopping all clearing of land is not the answer. And it's a point that was made in 2021 in the last parliament by the then uh, opposition as well, that this is a blunt instrument that's not effective. Um, of course, uh, it's important to point out that uh, by dealing with this one issue, land clearing, whatever cause or whatever reason there might be behind it, be it clearing land for productive purposes such as grazing cattle, cropping, uh, dealing with our needs for sustenance and food, or for uh, creation of land to indeed build houses. And we know as part of last night's budget that there was a commitment to uh, construct an extra million homes to assist with the housing crisis that uh, we know Australians are facing. Um, you know, they are not the only reasons, and I only have to reflect on the uh, debate um, on this bill in the last parliament to consider another uh, cause for habitat loss and uh, habitat destruction for the koala. And I refer to the uh, contribution from Senator Faruqi, uh, February of last year, where um, Senator Faruqi made the point that uh, the bushfires of 2019 and 20 were a major contributor to habitat loss for uh, koalas. And uh, the point is, this bill isn't going to actually stop bushfires. And Senator Rice makes inter uh, an interjection there about if you don't log them, they don't get burnt. Again, this is. Uh, oh, you don't log what doesn't get burnt. Right, OK. So Senator Faruqi, uh, in her contribution, said that the 2019 20 bushfires destroyed more than 12 million hectares of forests and killed more than a billion animals and devastated communities. Right, let's take that at face value. That is a massive impact on the environment and a massive impact on the habitat of koalas. But the bill doesn't address any of that. Uh, to suggest that this bill would be the panacea for the koala, and we all want to see the best outcome for this great icon, we want to make sure that we put in place the best arrangements to protect its habitat and, of course, its future. But this bill doesn't deal with bushfires, for example. You know, we, we need to consider this too. But rarely are we given the opportunity to look at things like fuel reduction burns and other regimes of good forest management that would contribute to preserving the habitat of koalas, concurrent with the points that have been made around what this bill would actually do. It does cut off the ability to contribute a holistic approach to uh, species management and species preservation. And Senator Faruqi bells the cat on that by pointing to a year ago, over a year ago, the fact that 12 million hectares was burnt, impacting on koalas. But there isn't one bit of contemplation of that in this bill introduced by her colleague. Looking again at that debate that occurred uh, over a year ago now, nearly two years in fact, um, 
I, I do want to reflect on the contributions that were made. And the, the Labor position hasn't really changed, which I think is a good thing, uh, because Senator McAllister, who made a contribution on behalf of the Australian Labor Party, then in opposition, made the point that, unfortunately here, uh, this private senator's bill is unlikely to be the solution. This bill, uh, as uh, entitled, has no chance of becoming law. And even if it were to pass the Senate, um, you know, it wouldn't make it through the House. And of course, making the point that uh, this bill, in its creation, in, this cre in its creation, uh, was never taken to the communities that it would impact. There was no consultation. Uh, we had no idea about this because there was no evidence of any discussion at all in the development of this bill with the communities that it would affect. Uh, indeed, what's lacking in this bill is any consideration whatsoever of local communities. And that was Senator Jenny McAllister making that point over a year ago. She goes on to say this bill would have an impact on people and their livelihoods. Every natural resource decision does, but this bill doesn't establish, contemplate or reference any mechanism for conservation with community about how to approach this problem. It doesn't reference or contemplate any mechanism to balance competing demands for land use, and this should matter to conservationists as well as communities that are dependent on forestry. And I think there are very important points to make. It's a point I've made in relation to this debate before, uh, that, of course, we do need to balance these things. We live in the environment. We rely on the environment. We need to ensure that we look after the environment. Uh, I don't think that's an amusing fact. But we also need to consider the economy we also depend on for livelihoods. We talk a lot about poverty. We talk about pressures on housing. We talk about the need to ensure that Australians have a good standard of living. But the net effect of these bills, when taken alone, when viewed in a silo, of course, have a negative impact on that other element of Australians' lives, the economic impact, the social impact. And by considering just one part of this equation, environment, to the exclusion of everything else, that is when we have these negative impacts. So again, I commend Senator McAllister for her views on that uh, and the need and the call for there to be balance in this debate. Um, Senator Fawcett, in the same debate over a year ago, talked about the effect of the bill, and he referenced um, uh, the effect that it would have in his home state of South Australia, with particular reference to Kangaroo Island and how the provisions of the bill, uh, if implemented, would have an impact on the forestry industry there. He talked about how koalas weren't uh, native to Kangaroo Island um, and estimates were before the fires that destroyed much of the forest on Kangaroo Island. There were an estimated 50,000 uh, koalas rather, on Kangaroo Island roughly in half uh, of the native vegetation and half in blue gum plantations. And of course, a prohibition on being able to uh, utilise plantations for the purpose they were planted because they get caught up in this bill does raise the issue that we are talking about here, what the net effect would be. And of course, coming back to that point around balance um, and uh, any unintended consequences that might flow from that. It is important to put on record the investments that were made, the $50 million that uh, was invested in the future of the koala uh, in January of this year. Um, the former government invested $50 million uh, to uh, provide for the long-term protection of the koala and uh, support recovery efforts, um, bringing together some of the best researchers, land managers and veterinarians. Um, and it was something that I think was much needed. The $50 million included $20 million for habitat and health protection projects, uh, grants for large-scale activities run by natural resource management and non-government organisations, $10 million for community-led initiatives, grants for local habitat protection and restoration activities, $10 million to extend the National Koala Monitoring Program and $2 million to improve koala health outcomes, um, which would be uh, run through a grant program for researchers to uh, undertake work a million dollars for koala care, the treatment and triage programs, uh, taking the total investment in support for koalas up to $74 million between 2019 and 2022, which is not an insignificant amount of money. But look, I come back to this fundamental point, and I, sorry, before I do that, I do want to reference uh, a point uh, Senator Green made, and that was that we are currently facing 
uh, the review of the EPBC Act, the response to the Samuels review, uh, what that will mean for environmental laws in this country. Here we are seeking to amend a bill that is probably going to look nothing like what it does now. And so I would have thought the better thing to do would be to uh, put the contribution into the Samuels review around uh, koala habitat protection rather than trying to amend a bill that probably doesn't have a very long life in front of it. Um, that is what we should be doing, looking at this holistically. And on that um, notion of uh, <coughs> looking at things holistically, again, that point around balance. You know, again, we live in a time where, and uh, with last night's budget being handed down, many references to and nods to the cost of living crisis that wasn't referenced in the first speech given today, uh, the cost of energy going up, the cost of housing going up, the cost of food and fuel going up. Those things don't matter when we consider the environment as a standalone issue. But the reality is every decision made with an environmental lens has an impact on how we live, how the economy functions. And we cannot uh, have this view uh, of looking at just one element of a decision-making process. You must balance environment with economy, and it goes the other way too. We know what happens when decisions are made with a purely economic focus. I'll take you down to Tasmania, to um, the beautiful community. Yes, I'll take you down, Senator Farrell, to Tasmania, to You Can Come, uh, where decisions back 150 years ago were made with absolutely no regard to the environment. You only have to look at the river that flows through uh, Queenstown and the decisions that were made about how to deal with mine waste. Uh, we don't do that anymore. That's not how we operate. There was no regard for the environment. And thank God we don't do things that way anymore. It's 2022. But by the same token, we cannot make decisions purely based on environmental grounds. To save an animal is important, but to shut down industries, to remove capacity for land use, including uh, finding land to build the million homes that this government wants to build that Australians so desperately need, I think my goodness, uh, I think is uh, short-sighted and indeed something that will have devastating impact. So, again, in this debate, uh, the uh, opposition's position is pretty clear, as it was in 2021. Balance is required. I commend the mover of the bill uh, for her passion, matched by the rhetoric in her speech, uh, but indeed there are better ways to achieve the outcome she seeks to achieve um, uh, through science, through balance, and through consultation with the community. Thank you, Senator Dunian. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Save the Koala bill. Uh, and if the Senate would indulge me, a personal story to start. I moved to Australia as a 14-year-old. Uh, we arrived in Brisbane uh, not knowing many people in Australia, but did have family friends who had um, moved to Cleveland uh, in, uh, in Brisbane uh, a few years prior and so stayed with them. And the first, my first morning in, in Australia, uh, a bit jet lagged, was up early, out the door uh, with my, my brothers and uh, our, our friends uh, cruising through the, the parklands of Redlands Bay and stumbled across a koala, probably head height in a in a tree, it had obviously been going from one tree to the next and was, was scampering up and was just transfixed by this incredible animal that I'd seen so much on TV but had never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would see one on my very first day in Australia. I assumed, well, this must be pretty normal in Australia. There's wildlife everywhere, koalas are everywhere. Uh, not so. <laughs> in the 20 years since then, I think I've seen maybe two other koalas in the wild, despite uh, spending a fair amount of time looking at them. And let's remember when we talk about this bill, we, we look up and we have school children um, come up here and, and watch us. We do things in, in here to ensure that the children who, who come and uh, tour this place, who, who watch proceedings here, who watch the Senate, that they will be able to see koalas. And the way we've been treating the environment, the way that 
both major parties have been treating the environment. That won't be the case. And so we're in, we're in a dire situation here. The koala is a flagship species. It's a national icon. And it, it is a travesty what is happening to koalas in Australia. It's, when we focus on, on one species like the koala, I think it's important to, to view it as a, um, a flagship species, that when we actually talk about protecting the koala and the koala habitat, we're protecting uh, habitat for hundreds, uh, probably thousands of other species that, actually, that call that, that same habitat home. I uh, appreciate Senator Dunham's sentiments about how much our attitudes towards land management have changed in Australia. And I think the koala is a great example of some of that. Australia went through a frontier period where natural resources were used as fast as they could be. Some would argue that that's still happening in, in areas. But when it comes to the koala, between 2.5 and 3 million koalas were shot to supply the fur trade in America and Europe from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. Clearly there were a lot of koalas across the continent for that to happen. In contrast to these astounding numbers, the current po koala population is believed to be between 40,000 to 100,000 animals. Yes, that was in the past, but we now have choices. And despite having those choices, we're not doing enough. And that's why we're here today debating this Save the Koala Bill. Over the last 20 years since uh, I saw that uh, koala in Redlands Bay in Queensland, we've lost one in four koalas. They are now listed as endangered and scientists tell us are on track to be extinct by 2050, which is, is not that far away. They're being pushed closer and closer to extinction by clearing cars, dogs and disease. Yesterday the budget uh, committed 57 million to assist in conservation of koalas. I commend the government on that. And I'd like to recognise this is largely due to strong advocacy from people like Deborah Tabart and the Australia Koala Foundation. I'd like to congratulate her on her work and, and thank her. But it's clearly not enough. We can do more and we, we must do more. Again, Senator Dunham talked about rather looking to science to help us solve these problems. Thankfully, we have some of the world's best environmental scientists in Australia, some of the world's leading ecologists right here in Australia, a mega diverse country, a place where it is such a privilege to share this continent with an incredible array of species. And it turns out that a bunch of these leading scientists actually did get together and they said, what will it cost to halt Australia's extinction crisis? Which is a firm commitment from the new government and I welcome that commitment and I thank them for it, but that's got to be backed up with action and that's got to be backed up with cold hard cash to ensure that these leading ecologists and land managers across the country can actually deliver on that promise. I think the Australian people, they hear a lot of these big promises and platitudes. When it comes to saving the koala, Australians want action. Back to these leading scientists. They put together a paper called Spending to Save, What Will It Cost to Halt Australia's Extinction Crisis? The authors were Brendan Wintel, Natasha Cadenhead, Rachel Morgan, Sarah Legg, Sarah Beckersey, Matthew Cantell, Hugh Possingham, James Watson, Martine Marin, David Keith, Stephen Garnett, John Wynarski, and David Lindenmeyer. And I'll quote, in Australia, the drivers of extinction broadly reflect the global profile, although invasive species have played a relatively larger role compared to most of the rest of the world. A potent combination of rapid 
habitat destruction, which is largely what this, this debate is about, and introduced predators, herbivores and pathogens has resulted in Australia losing more biodiversity than any other developed nation in the past 200 years. We know these facts, but they should be sobering and they should, actually, they should spur us to action. They concluded in this paper that given what we know about the, the dire situation when it comes to the biodiversity crisis in Australia, it will take, this is a 2019 paper, around $1.7 billion a year to halt extinction. So while it's great to hear of 57 million for koala and uh, 225 million over the, over the forward estimates, it's clearly nowhere near enough. And we have to continue to ensure that we're actually investing in the, the protection of this incredible continent that we should all want to leave for future generations in a better condition, more, <laughs> more biodiversity than when we entered this place where the, where the big decisions do get made. That group of scientists go on to say that improving the accountability and transparency of expenditure on conservation of threatened species in Australia would also enable a better understanding of the effectiveness of conservation investment. At the moment, because funding is so scant, our monitoring programs are not up to scratch. And so, so many of the species that we think are threatened, we, just, we simply don't have the data to, to back that up. So clearly this is something that the Labor government is going to have to think a lot more about and come to the May budget with a significant increase if they're going to get anywhere near close to their bold plan to halt extinction. I'd like to quote uh, from one of our leading ecologist, Dr Ewan Ritchie, who recently said, after the Labor government committed to no new extinctions, it's well and good to say you love wildlife and be photographed cuddling koalas, but if you're still approving the destruction of their habitat, if you're still committing to fossil fuel use, it's very hard to see how these things are aligned with the zero extinction ambition. And I'd really like to put that to the Senate today as we debate this important bill. Do we want to continue with the platitudes about how much we love our environment, how important it is, uh, while continue to chronically underfund it, uh, to give billions of dollars to a fossil fuel industry that is hauling in eye-watering profits? Uh, or are we going to change? Are, are we going to finally say our environment is fundamental to us thriving as people, as a country? Uh, we understand that we are part of nature. If nature goes down, we go down with it. And so there's, there's a huge element of self-interest in this. Investment in the, in the environment is an investment in ourselves, in our futures. And so let's not entertain the arguments that pit uh, the environment and, and actually looking after the place that we live uh, against good lives for, for, for everyday Australians. Those two things are... are are so, so tied together. You can't have one without the other, as we're starting to see when you turn on the television and, and, and see people going through floods for the, for the fourth, fifth, sixth time in, in a couple of seasons. We should protect native species for their intrinsic value. On, on their own, they, they deserve to be able to continue to exist where many of them have been here for, for millions of years, long before uh, humans uh, arrived on this continent and, and certainly long, long before um, 
modern Australia, the last, the last 200 years where we've seen the catastrophic decline in our wildlife. But even if you don't buy the intrinsic value argument, the economic argument is, is strong. It's very hard to argue with. Half of Australia's GDP, around 900 billion, is directly dependent on nature. Again, we, we are part of nature. If nature goes down, we go down with her. As I mentioned earlier last night, we saw 225 million committed over four years to slow the rate of native species decline. This is a, a small increase in election commitment. I welcome it. More money for, for conservation is a good thing. But clearly, we need to be upping our ambition. A leading uh, ecologist in Australia, Professor David Lindemeyer, and his colleagues at the ANU and elsewhere have done a huge amount of work that makes it just so clear how important it is to halt the clearing of our native forests. They are critical habitat for our native species, including koalas, but they're also invaluable carbon sinks. We know that forests that are logged burn easily. It's, it's, it's potentially counterintuitive, but the research is very strong showing that. So there's a real incentive for us to bring an end to the native forest logging, to move to plantations. There, there are enough plantations for us to make that transition. Native forest logging is largely not profitable anymore, and taxpayers are subsidising the cutting down of our native forests in an extinction crisis where we have a government committing to halting extinction. So this seems like a really sensible way forward to actually deal with this, bring native forest logging to an end, stop clearing koala habitat and ensure that the, the school children who come through this place are able to see koalas in the wild, that in five years' time we have more koalas in Australia than we do now. In ten years' time we have even more koalas. That's the kind of world that I want to live in. I don't buy the argument that you can either have a prosperous economy or you can have an, uh, you know, koalas. We're part of the environment. We're part of nature. And I commend this bill and the work that Senator Hanson Young has done. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Ross, before I do give you the call, just remind you the hard marker is, I believe, 12 minutes past 10, Clark? 12 minutes past 10. Senator Ross. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Recently, I joined a tree planting day, a koala habitat tree planting day, with the Koala Clancy Foundation. It was industrial scale tree planting. As far as the eye could see, there were trees going in the ground. There were about 50 volunteers on the day I was there, and over a period of a couple of weeks, the Koala Clancy Foundation was planting out, I think it was over 50, 100 hectares, with thousands and thousands of trees. It's a fantastic contribution to be trying to be creating habitat co for koalas. The day I was there, however, my, as I was sort of planting these trees in the ground, my mind kept on going off to the fact that less than 100 kilometres away in the Wombat State Forest, soon to be the Wombat National Park, the Andrews government, meanwhile, is logging koala habitat. They're calling it salvage logging. But I've seen the photos. It looks like clear felling to me. The Victorian National Parks Association know, and the local environment groups, knowing that this logging was going ahead, and it is going ahead, did some surveys of the areas of forests that are planned to be logged. They found in surveys overnight in these areas of forests that were being logged in areas of forest that's about to be national park, 40 greater gliders, one powerful owl, four koalas, one boobook, one feather tail glider, and seven ring tail possums. 
It is outrageous. And I think of all the wonderful work that groups around the country like the Koala Clancy Foundation are doing. Meanwhile, our native forest, our precious native forest, home to koalas and such a diverse range of other species, is continued to be destroyed by logging and by clearing. It's not hard to understand what needs to happen to save the koala and our other precious wildlife. If there were kids in the gallery, they would understand it. Koalas, greater gliders, lead beaters, possums, other forest-dwelling animals, they need trees. They need forests. That's where they live. And if you destroy that forest, they don't have homes to live in. And logging, just like clearing, destroys their habitat. For some species that don't need hollows in, in old trees, they might come back within 10 or 20 years. But other species, like the greater gliders, like the lead beaters, possums, like the owls, they actually need the hollows in the old trees to live and to breed, which means after a logging operation, that bit of forest is not going to be of any use to them to live and to breed in for over 100 years. If we are going to save the koala, if we're going to save greater gliders, if we're going to save other species, we need to be protecting their homes. We need to be protecting their forests. For koalas, in fact, in Victoria, koalas have got it relatively easy because they don't need the hollows and it's, the cooler climate means there's more suitable forest. But in New South Wales and Queensland, where they are under threat from logging and from land clearing for coal mines and from land clearing for urban development, it's predicted that if this continues, koalas are going to be extinct within 50 years. And we look about the impact of bushfires, as Senator Dunning was talking about, how bushfires destroyed the habitat of so many of our species, of so much forest in the Black, Saturday, the Black Summer fires. Yes, it was devastating. So what should your response to do be to that? You do not log, you do not clear the areas of forests that weren't burnt. They are even more precious for the animals that have survived the fires. And you make sure that you take action to reduce the risk of fire. And in fact, what that means is reducing the amount of logging, stopping logging, because logging, the science is very clear now, logging, clear felling our forests makes them more prone to fire. It means fires will occur much more frequently and they'll be more intense when they occur. So it's pretty clear what we need to be doing. We need to be protecting habitat. We need to be stopping logging. We need to be stocking, stopping native forest logging. In response to the lack of protection at, a, at state and federal government level, Citizens are taking it into their own hands. We've seen so many court actions in Victoria against Vic Forests. And in fact, the latest court action, it was decided just yesterday, where the wonderful citizens of the Warburton Environment Group, they had taken action against, against Vic Forests because they were logging endangered, an endangered plant species, the tree um, gibung, and they won. Because, and in fact, the, the um, Supreme Court judge, Justice Gard, stated in the judgment that no attempt was made by Vic Forest to show that it was not reasonably practic practicable to protect the significant number of tree, tree gibungs which have been destroyed in harvested areas through the use of bulldozers and mechanical equipment. And that given the evidence as to the past harvesting and burning practices of Vic Forest, it is highly likely that significant numbers of mature tree gibungs have been lost in the Central Highlands in the past through harvesting and regeneration burning. The precise extent of the loss will never be known, but on the basis of recent records, it's likely to amount to many hundreds or even thousands of mature trees. This is the reality of logging in our native forest today. It should not be up to citizens to spend millions of dollars going to court to protect our, our heritage. In response, we've got state governments that are in fact making, changing the laws to make it easier to log and changing the laws to, to stop people protesting, to stop even the citizen science like this. These are draconian laws stopping people from protesting and even doing citizen science. And in Victoria, we've got a state election in a month's time where the future of our forests is going to be a key issue. And it's only the Greens who are wanting to be protecting our forests, only the Greens that want to end native forest immediately, because that is what needs to happen. 
if we are going to protect koalas, greater gliders, lead possums, wallets, and all the other threatened species that call our forests home. But of course, it shouldn't be up to the states on their own to be protecting our forests and having laws to protect our forests, because the Commonwealth has a responsibility. These are issues of national significance. This was found in the Samuels Review into the EPBC Act, where Graham Samuel found that our existing laws were not protecting our forests, that the regional forest agreements were not protecting threatened species. And he found that logging should be um, assessed by the same, the same way matters of national environment significance in forests should be, protect, should be assessed in the same way as other destructive um, where, as, as they are if they are being, um, being, being impacted by other destructive activities. This bill that we've got before us today, in fact, is a very modest, a very modest bill. It's very reasonable. It's very moderate. It's actually not calling for an end to all native forest logging, which is what the Greens really and we do, and we're up front that that's what we want to see. It is a modest interim solution to be protecting some of the most significant, some of the most loved species, the loved animals in Australia. I mean, all this bill does is what the Australian public would think was already happening. All this bill does is to prevent the minister from approving an action under the EPBC Act where that action consists of involves the clearing of koala habitat. Yep. Surely that's what people would have thought already occurred, that our national environment laws actually would protect koalas, which people love so much. And the bill also removes the exemption of regional forest agreements from the requirements of the EPBC Act, where there is, may or is likely to be a significant impact on koalas. Surely this is what the Australian community expect. People do not expect, people do not want logging to be destroying the habitat of our precious wildlife. We don't need to be logging our forests. Plantations are already providing 90 per cent of the wood that's coming out of, it, Australia's, um, out of Australia. And in fact, we are exporting 70 per cent of that plantation timber. There is so much potential to be doing more through our plantations, through, through farm forestry and through urban sawmilling. We don't need to be logging our forests for wood production. We need to be ending logging immediately for wildlife, for koalas, for all other species, for Senator climate, Rice, because the uh, best way— The time for debate has expired, it being 10.12. Thank you, Senator Rice. Sick leave, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, the president has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the supply bill number three, 2022 to 2023, and two related bills for concurrence. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question, is, uh, uh, put, the question to the Senate put by the Minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Supply Bill No. 3, 2022 to 2023. Supply Bill No. 4, 2022 to 2023. And supply parliamentary departments bill number two, 2022 to 2023. Minister, I seek leave to move a motion to exempt these bills from the bill's cut-off order. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister, I table a statement of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. That the provision of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to these bills. The question uh, is that the uh, motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, Clark. I'm sure I should say sorry that the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business and I'll call the clerk. That's what you're telling me to do here. <laughs> All right, change of plan. Senator Smith, spot on.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak briefly on the Supply No. 3, 2022-2023, the Supply No. 4, 2022-2023 and the Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2 of 2022-2023. The Opposition will support the passage of these bills. It is appropriate that the important functions of government continue and departments are resourced to effectively carry out their duties when the examination of the appropriations bills uh, continues through the parliamentary process, and the passage of these, the expeditious passage of these bills, means that there will be no delay. And there's a lot, of course, that this budget does deserve examination over, and the coalition looks forward to the estimates process that will begin uh, later this week. Unfortunately, for many Australian families, this budget confirms that the cost of living is going up, that electricity and gas bills are going up for Australians that taxes are also going up for Australians, government spending is going up, um, employment is going down and real wages are forecast to go down also. Labor's budget last night has confirmed that under this government growth will be lower. Last night we heard a long speech from the Treasurer. A lot of rhetoric but minus a clear plan to bring down the cost of living for Australian families. It's clear that just after six months since the election, the government has ditched the guardrails on good policy. No handbrake on spending, and spending is up under this government. No speed limit on tax, and no cap on the Australian Public Service, with an additional 8,000 more bureaucrats since they came to government. Maybe, just maybe, when the appropriation bills are progressed through the House and considered by the other place in their processes, a plan may become clearer from the government. Unfortunately, the opposition is not optimistic. In keeping with the convention, on the basis of discussions between the government and the opposition, the coalition will support the passage of these supply bills this morning. I also note that two amendments have been circulated in the chamber by the Australian Greens, and I note that the coalition bill will be opposing both. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Mr Albanese was elected. He made a promise to the Australian people. He promised that no one would be left behind and that no one would be held back. Well, that promise that he made to the Australian people was broken in his first budget last night. After this budget, we know that we're not all in this together. Too many Australians are being left behind and many more are being held back. This is a Labor budget in name only. They say they're going to get wages moving again, but wages are flatlining over the forward estimates. They say they're committed to full employment, but unemployment is flagged to go up. They say they're providing cost of living relief, but those on the lowest incomes are going to bear most of the pain. The Treasurer's buzzword is responsible, but if you're leaving behind people who need it most, if you are publicly subsidising the burning of fossil fuels in the middle of a climate crisis, this cannot be considered as a responsible budget. There is more than a whiff of austerity about this budget, because it's the people in our country who are the least well off who will feel the most pain. And meanwhile, in a deliberate policy choice, the stage three tax cuts for billionaires, for CEOs and for politicians are baked in. It's champagne for the top end and it's real pain for the people who are doing it the <coughs> toughest. And we're facing two crises here, a cost of living crisis and a climate and, and ecological crisis. People's incomes are going down and people's homes are ending up underwater. Food is getting more expensive. Groceries have risen 17 per cent this year, and too many Australians simply cannot afford fresh, food, fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables. And thanks to the climate crisis fuelled floods around this country, food prices are flagged to go up even more. And meanwhile, the big corporations, like the big two supermarkets, are raking in mega profits. Housing is getting more expensive. 
rents are currently rising four times faster than wages. But if you've got wealthy parents, you're going OK. Young people are being locked out of the great Australian dream of owning their own home. They're being forced into unsafe tenancy just to keep a roof over their heads. Electricity is going through the roof. Bills are going to go up at a retail level by 56 per cent over the next two years, and we are being extorted for our own gas by multinationals who send the profits offshore. We're in the middle of a global gas boom, and our gas tax is so utterly rorted by the big corporations that we're actually going to get less tax as a result. There is a half a billion dollar reduction in the petroleum resource rents tax revenue forecast in this budget. Childcare going up, education going up, transport going up. There is real pain for a lot of people in this budget. But instead of doing something significant to provide genuine and immediate cost of living relief, We've got a Treasurer who's playing at the margins with many measures that are delayed and won't be implemented now when people need the help. As I said, wages aren't going to move. We've got insecure, too many people in insecure work, too many people suffering from wage theft. Short-term contracts and labour hire are all driving down wages. Working people need more power in this country because the big corporations have got too much power. They're making huge profits. Their share of the economy, the share of the economy that is going into profits, hasn't been this high since the Gilded Age. And at the same time, we are facing in the short, medium and long term the collapse of our climate, fuelled by the coal and gas corporations and the psychopaths that run them. And the climate crisis is part of what is driving the cost of living crisis. Insurance costs, damage to infrastructure, disruptions to supply chains, including food supply, or just your suburb or your town going underwater or burning in a bushfire. The fear, the anxiety and the stress. Burning coal and gas for cash, for profits, is killing people and it's costing us billions of dollars. So what's the government's response to all of this? Labor's response, bake in the stage three tax cuts for the billionaires, hand out billions to fossil fuel corporations. They're driving inequality higher and pouring petrol on the climate fire. Labor is leaving too many people behind. The stage three tax cuts will destroy Australia's progressive income tax system. They're going to give a $9,000 a year tax cut to the billionaires and to the CEOs and to everyone who sits in this place as either a senator or an MP. They will benefit predominantly already very wealthy, rich, old white men, but they won't benefit many young people, they won't benefit as many women as men, and they won't benefit as many people of colour as they do white people. They'll drive inequality. And let's think about this. $254 billion that could have gone in to providing genuine, immediate cost of living relief for the people who are actually going to feel the pain from flatlining wages, unemployment going up, the prospect of more interest rates, spiralling electricity and gas prices. We could have helped them out and done much more for them. But no, the Treasurer made a choice last night to look after the top end and walk away from those people. We could put in place a rent freeze so people's rents were more affordable. We could wipe student debt so that young people and people who finished their university degrees would actually have more money in their pockets. We could make dental and mental part of Medicare. We could make childcare free. 
These measures won't drive inflation, as the Treasurer would have you believe. They'll reduce inflation and they will improve people's lives. And I want to remind people improving people's lives is the whole point of government. It's why we're all here. And the Treasurer made a choice to not do that last night. And what his choice was. Is it a time when people are trying to work out whether they're going to pay their power bills or afford the groceries, when they're making huge sacrifices to keep their heads above water, at a time when inequality is at record highs? We have a Labor government giving the richest people in this country another $9,000 a year. So if you're someone who works in a pub or cleans in a school or hospital or looks after a shop or if you're one of the people who had to leave home and work during the pandemic, you're very unlikely to benefit from these tax cuts because, remember, there is nothing in the stage three tax cuts for somebody on a minimum wage. What sort of Labor Party abandons progressive taxation? The international environment didn't make the Labor Party do this. It wasn't the war in the Ukraine. The Liberal Party didn't make the Labor Party do this. It was a Labor choice to do this. Now, this budget also hands out billions in public subsidies, actually tens of billions in public subsidies, to the big fossil fuel corporations. Same. Now, this, these corporations are driving the climate crisis, which is turbocharging extreme weather, and it's wreaking havoc across this continent and across the world, and wreaking havoc with people's lives. And those corporations, in the main, send their profits offshore and they rip off Australian consumers. The unions understand it. The welfare sector understands it. Many economists in this country understand it. People in the pubs and the cafes picking up their kids after school, they understand that giving billions of dollars to people who don't need it, whether it's the top end of town or the big fossil fuel corporations, a handout during a cost of living crisis and a climate crisis is just dumb. It is dumb and it is counterproductive. Now, Labor used to be the party of working people. And yes, Labor's fiddled at the margins on cost of living relief in this budget. They're prepared to reduce the cost of childcare for some people in a while at the margins, bit here, bit there, build a few new affordable homes, and I might add it's not a million uh, new homes that this budget is delivering. It's actually 10,000 when you look at the detail. The headline's a million. The budget detail says 10,000 and cross your fingers and hope that the private sector builds the other 990,000. But what you can see in this budget is a Labor Party that's lost its appetite and lost its nerve for nation-building big reforms. One of the most disappointing things is that in this parliament we've actually got the numbers to change things for the better. If Labor would work with the Greens, we could scrap the stage three tax cuts. We could pass measures which dramatically reduce the cost of living, dental and mental, into Medicare, freeze rents, make childcare and education free, wipe student debt, expand Medicare. We could make the gas corporations and the fossil fuel corporations actually pay their fair share of tax. But Labor has lost its nerve. We've been robbed, swindled, scammed and stood over by some of the world's biggest, most powerful and most polluting corporations. They give donations, they get special treatment, they're stealing our gas and they're selling it overseas and they're funnelling their profits overseas. Yep. The government of Australia for far too long has been an entity that is owned lock, stock and smoking barrel by the resources industry. Shame. If Labor had the courage, we've got the numbers. If we work together, we could pass measures that would drive down the cost of living without increasing inflation. If we got past the neoliberal ideology, if we stood for the people and not the big corporations and the wealthy, we could make a huge difference. We stand ready to raise New Start to $88 a day so that people don't have to live 
in grinding daily poverty. But Labor has chosen not to do that. We stand ready to pass laws to outlaw insecure work and give working people more power so they can secure the pay rises they deserve. Together, we could give workers real rights and restore the power of unions and end wage theft. But Labor has lost its nerve. This budget shows that. Its words are hollow. They have rolled over at the first sign of pressure, even from a weak, divided, irrelevant opposition. Well, the Greens stand ready to work with Labor to genuinely build a million new homes. We stand ready to make the Prime Minister's story about growing up in public housing a reality that will be accessible to everyone. But instead of ending the public housing waiting list, under this government, the public will be languishing on the waiting list for years. We need more than a story from the Prime Minister. We need the foot to be taken off our neck. Now, I want to say something about inflation, because the Treasurer has missed a fantastic opportunity here. He's missed an opportunity because he's too busy blaming inflationary pressures on what's happening around the world. And of course, there are things happening around the world, conflict, climate change, supply chain issues. Of course they exist. But domestically, what we do know is it's not wages driving inflation. It is corporate profiteering yeah. that is driving inflation in this country, and what we need to address that is a corporate super profits tax. Yeah. So there's yeah. no need for the Treasurer to wring his hands and pretend that he's got no levers to pull to address inflation in this country. It's, there is no need for the Treasurer to stand back and watch as the Reserve Bank continues to pile interest rate rise on top of interest rate rise, condemning the less well-off in this country to yet more pain. He needs to pull the lever, introduce a corporate super profits tax and rein in the rampant price gouging of the big corporations. I flag my, uh, that I will be moving a second reading amendment, Thank you, uh, Madam McKim. Deputy President. Uh, do, it might assist the chamber if you actually move that now, Senator McKim. I do move that. Would you? Could you say the words? Ah, yes, I thought I just had, but I move my second reading amendment. Thank you very much, Senator McKim. Uh, I call Senator Rob, uh, Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Supply Bill uh, Number Three, 2022-23, and related bills. Uh, the Greens have circulated an amendment to this bill, and the amendment ensures that no public money is spent on the drilling program in the Beedaloo Basin. We are in a climate crisis, and that means that no new coal and gas should be funded. And continuing to give fossil fuel companies handouts when people are struggling to pay rent, buy their groceries and other necessities is absolutely insulting especially to the many people right across the country who have seen their homes and their communities devastated this year from unprecedented flooding events. This is actually insulting to them. These weather events will only get worse, and the government is directly contributing to this by funding the fossil fuel projects that they have outlined in this budget. Labor's first budget is introducing a new handout for the gas industry through the $1.9 billion to build a gas terminal and petrochemical hub in Darwin Harbour that would guarantee a customer for the Beedaloo Basin. A Beedaloo is a climate wrecking project that cannot continue and that absolutely cannot be funded through public money. The government has already given billions of dollars to this project and in this budget we saw $1.9 billion more. This is absolutely unacceptable. Fracking in the Beedaloo Basin will destroy our environment, wreck our climate and use up the precious groundwater in the Northern Territory. The sheer amount of water that fracking uses cannot be underestimated. It is estimated that in one pad alone it uses 11.2 uh, billion litres of water. That is almost a quarter of the entire surface water that is used in the Northern Territory in one year. And there are 27 of these pads that are proposed, uh, just, one of those, uh, just one of the approximate 20 properties that are impacted by this 
project in the Beedaloo. And despite what the gas-funded CSIRO um, fact sheets might say, methane and fracking definitely can contribute to climate change. And we heard about that yesterday during question time when I asked the Minister, uh, Minister Wong, about this fact sheet and, in fact, the misleading information that was included in there. So just on the gas field in the Beedaloo Basin, this could release up to 117 million tonnes of CO2. And we have been warned that there might be, not be enough carbon credits in order to offset the emissions from Beedaloo. In other words, we will blow any chance of Labor achieving their 43 per cent emission target, reduction target, at least without some dodgy accounting like what we saw from the previous government. In fact, as you would expect, if Beedaloo is allowed to continue, it will increase Australia's 2020 emission level by 13 per cent. And we can't, can't afford this increase. We don't have the time to see an increase in climate emissions. We don't have time for Labor to do the bidding with their mates in the gas industry. Because let's be real, this is exactly what's, what is happening. This is the act of a government that is too scared to stand up for these, to these companies who are destroying our planet. The resources minister herself has said that if the projects were not financially able to stand on their own two feet, there shouldn't be any government injection of cash into them. And yet, this is exactly what we are seeing in this budget. This amendment simply asks the government to stick to their word. Now, Origin has stepped away from this project. They saw the writing on the wall. Whilst this is a win, they have sold their interests to this project to Tamboran Resources. This is a company who refuses to appear before a Senate committee and only did so when they were about to be held in contempt of the parliament. A company who has no issue taking legal action when decisions don't go their way. A company who only cares about one thing, and that's about making money for their shareholders and their executives. In a recent hearing, we heard from Tambor and Resources who described the Beedaloo Basin as Australia's greatest emissions reduction opportunity. <laughs> Believe that. <laughs> what a joke. Our greatest emission reduction opportunity is to remove public funding from fossil fuel projects and invest that money into renewables and commit to no more new coal and gas projects in this country. Now, this project is directly linked to the Middle Arm Harbour project a toxic petrochemical plant that is only three kilometres away from Palmerston, in a pristine area of Darwin. Now, this plant proposes significant health risks due to its pollution. It could also increase air pollution in the area by over 500 per cent and increase the Northern Territory's emissions by 75 per cent. Now, this to me doesn't seem like climate action. What about you? Now, Tamboran have stated that they intend to use the gas from the Beedaloo in the Middle Arm Industry Hub, which also happened to get a nice little pile of cash in this, government, uh, in this budget. Now, the science is clear, and it's been clear for quite some time, and we know exactly what we need to do. Unfortunately, we are yet to see a government with the political will to do this, and this inaction will impact on, in fact, all of us. The last election was very clear. What we heard from the Australian public is they want change and they want climate action. And they are growing tired of the major parties and their inaction. And last night's budget is in fact proof of that. This money to prop up a dying industry flies in the face of that clear message. Traditional owners have also sent a clear message. They do not want fracking on their country. And you cannot silence the voices of traditional owners for corporate interests. You cannot ignore the traditional owners' sovereignty over their land and their sacred water to support climate-destroying gas projects in this country. And if this project contaminates the groundwater, it will destroy those communities surrounding that area, their connection to this country and their cultural heritage, their bush foods, the places they take their children, because that water is sacred to them. This government has claimed that it is committed to First Nations justice. In fact, they talk about the voice in this parliament. 
How about listening to the voices of traditional owners when they say they don't want these projects on their country? Mm -hmm. Listening and learning to our voices, our stories, but only when it doesn't conflict with them making money do they want to listen. This project has strong opposition from the traditional owners, the farmers, the environmentalists, the scientists and the general public and members of this crossbench. So when will this Labor government listen and catch up? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the senators who've contributed to the debate on the supply bill number three, uh, the supply bill number four and the supply parliamentary departments bill, each of which are 22-23. These additional supply bills seek authority from the parliament for the appropriation of money from the Consolidated Revenue Fund for broadly the last seven months of 2022-23. The total of the appropriations sought through these three additional supply bills is just under $59 billion. The bills must be passed in this sitting week to provide certainty of supply for the ongoing business of government for the remainder of 2022-23, thereby ensuring the continuity of program and service delivery. The appropriations proposed in these bills provide an estimated seven-twelfths of the 2022-23 annual appropriations, which are broadly based on the March 2022 budget estimates and adjusted for a small number of programs and entities that received more than five-twelfths of their annual appropriations in the 2022-23 Supply Acts. I wish to emphasise that these bills seek only to provide funding for the ongoing business of government for the remainder of the 2022-23 financial year. Therefore, no new decisions taken in the October 2022 budget are included in these bills. This arrangement enables conventional parliamentary processes, including Senate estimates hearings, to be followed prior to the enactment of the budget appropriation bills by the parliament. I note that the Greens have moved a second reading amendment. Labor will not support that amendment. Once again, I thank all senators for their contribution and commend these bills to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. An amendment has been circulated in the name of Senator McKim, um, and we will now proceed to Committee of the Whole. No. So the question is that the amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against, no. 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 The, the noes have it. Yeah. Is the division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Uh, the ayes move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 28. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? No? The ayes have, the ayes have it. Uh, Clark. Supply Bill No. 3, 2022-2023, Supply Bill No. 4, 2022-2023, Supply and Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 2022-2023. Um, I believe we will now move into committee.
Uh, thank you, Senators. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, the question is that the bill be now passed without requests. And Senator Cox, you're seeking the call. Oh. With the concurrence of the Senate, the statement of reasons accompanying the requests circulated for this bill will be incorporated into Hansard immediately after the requests to which they relate. Uh, there being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator Cox. Uh, I move an amendment on sheet 1689, standing in my name. Uh, Minister. Uh, the government will not be supporting the amendment circulated by and moved by Senator Cox. Uh, the $30 million appropriated for 2022-23 for the Beetaloo drilling program is money that was contractually committed by the previous government. The Albanese government has committed to not review the Beetaloo drilling program. Um, uh, Senator. Ruston. Um, this amendment would mean that no funding could be spent just, on. Just if sorry. you could hold on for a moment, Senator Ruston. I don't believe you have the microphone. Oh, do you want me to try this one? Is that better? So, Senator Ruston. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, this amendment would mean that no funding could be spent on the Beetaloo Basin drilling program, which provides entities incorporated in Australia with funding to accelerate exploration and appraisal of activities in the Beetaloo Basin. Sadly, this is typical um, of the Greens in a budget delivered by the ABA that shows that gas prices and energy prices will rise. They want to reduce the supply of gas. Uh, the Northern Territory Beetaloo Basin uh, is one of the largest undeveloped onshore gas resources in the world. The development of this resource has the potential to create 6,000 jobs by 2040, transform the Northern Territory's economy and supply gas into domestic markets for decades to come. It is disappointing that the Greens are so detached from reality that they continue to talk down a vital Australian industry that provides jobs and funds its services across the country and will assist Australia's energy supply into the future. <clears throat> Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Chair. We're very disappointed at the response from the Labor Party on this. Um, millions of Australians voted for change at this last election. That's why we have a progressive alliance in this parliament to actually act on the key challenges of our time, like climate change. While people around this country, including in my home state of Tasmania, are preparing for a, another flood event after more record rainfalls. What do we see in this budget? More public money for fossil fuel projects, for the Beetaloo Basin, for the Northern Territory Gas Hub. Over $40 billion across the budget for fossil fuel subsidies. This is not what Australians voted for. Australians voted for change. And it's clear from this budget last night that they're just going to have to wait a little bit longer before the Labor Party wakes up and realises that we are in a climate emergency and we need to do everything we can to reduce emissions. It is insanity in this day and age, in a climate crisis, to be giving more taxpayer money to fossil fuel projects. Absolutely that's what this amendment is there to do. It's to remove taxpayers' money to fund fossil fuel projects, to pour more petrol on the fire. So those communities around Australia that are looking at these temperature and weather records being broken every day. Just this week, Sydney recorded its highest annual rainfall on record. It's expected in the next few weeks for records to be broken across Victoria. And in Tasmania, two of our key rivers had record flood levels just last week. Australians have woken up to this. When is this government going to wake up to it as well? The question is that the request for an amendment be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that the request for amendment be agreed to. Those in favour? Will the, the eyes will move to the right uh, uh, of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim for the eyes and Senator O'Sullivan for the nose. One knows the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be agreed to without requests for amendments. Those in, of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Committee has considered supply bill number 3, 2022 to 2023, and agreed to it without amendments. Minister, my apologies. I move that the bill now be read a third time. Oh, my apologies. I move that the report be adopted. Acting Deputy President. I put, the, I put the question that the report be adopted. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. I put the question that the bill now be read a third time. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Supply bill number three, 2022-2023. Supply bill number four, 2022-2023. Supply Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 2022-2023. Government Business Orders of the Day No. 1, Fair Work Amendment, Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022, debate on second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Cash. Minister. 
to those who perpetrate family and domestic violence. It is the government's view that providing a universal national entitlement to this benefit would not be in line with community expectations. Deputy President, I am in continuation. This bill will, however, have a very significant impact. Over one million employees already have access to paid family and domestic violence leave through collective bargaining between workers and employers, and we know, we know the impact that this entitlement can have. But by embedding this entitlement into the national employment standards, this legislation will take this figure from just over one million employees to 11 million employees. This legislation will not end domestic violence. This is a much, much bigger task and there is so much more to do, but it is a very important step that will save lives. Because no worker should ever have to choose, ever, between their safety and their income. No worker should ever have to choose between income and medical treatment. Every worker, every worker in Australia has the right to be safe at work and safe at home. And I want to thank the survivors and their advocates. I want to thank experts and frontline workers who have advocated for so long for this reform. I see that Samantha Parker is up there with her comrades and colleagues from the ASU in the gallery. And I want to acknowledge the Australian Services Union who represent frontline workers who help women fleeing domestic violence every day. Samantha Parker and her colleagues were there at the beginning, advocating and arguing for this reform. And they have been joined by many, many others. I want to acknowledge all those stakeholders, those willing people who put their shoulders to it and built the case for this bill year after year, decade after decade. Preventing family violence is everyone's business. It is long overdue for the Australian government to show leadership in this way, and I am so proud to support this bill. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment for the Paid uh, Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022. I want to acknowledge every Australian woman who's ever left a violent relationship and add my voice to this important issue that affects so many, and too many, in fact, as we heard uh, by women even in this chamber yesterday. And thank you to Senator Green in particular for sharing her story. And it's also similar to mine and many other women and children who are exposed to violence in their homes and in their communities. This bill makes some changes that are, seem very simple. It increases family and domestic violence leave from five days unpaid to 10 days paid, and regardless if you're full-time, part-time or a casual worker, and extends the de definition of family and domestic violence. But make no mistake, these changes will have enormous impact on those who need it. Many people who are victim survivors of family and domestic violence may not be able to afford to take five days of unpaid leave. They might be in a relationship, be single parents, suffering from an abusive ex, family member or current partner. And in First Nations community, this also extends to our kinship groups. We don't consider ourselves in isolation, but as members of a wider kinship group or community, where violence can be experienced and the impact of that is far-reaching. The truth is there are many ways family and domestic violence can take place, and no instances are in fact the same. For First Nations women, um, we know that the statistics are vastly different, and we are 35 times more likely to experience domestic violence, and the cost of that is actually $2.2 billion per year. Before entering this parliament, I worked in the women's sector, and indeed after that I've heard from in numerous forums and in fact firsthand from women across the country who've told me about the barriers of escaping violence and the immediate impact to allow them to participate in the workforce. And they include accessing crisis services, accommodation services, legal services and health and medical services. The indirect impacts of the, that violence include the pain, fear and suffering incurred by women and children. And these can be framed as, in, in fact, the indirect social and psychological impacts of violence. And they include replacing damaged or lost household items, replacing school uniforms and equipment for their children to change schools, and the settlement of partners' bad debts, which in fact need not just take time but also carry a cost. The cost is not counted, and we should also extend that to the cost of lost of opportunity, 
loss of employment and promotion opportunities, and the quality of life due to being in or leaving a violent relationship. I'm a member of the Senate inquiry into missing and murdered First Nations women and children, and we've heard particularly that First Nations women just this week are up to 12 times more likely to be murdered, which is disproportionately overrepresented compared to other Australian women. Violence against First Nations women is significantly underreported and underpoliced, carrying a range of issues from participating in those legal processes, which also makes the evidentiary requirements for proof of violence um, occurring as one of the biggest barriers to accessing their leave entitlements. Whilst this bill will save lives by providing a circuit breaker in the system for women's safety, we know that on top of all the other challenges in reducing uh, gender-based violence, there are still racial uh, biases that must be dismantled and culturally appropriate measures to be taken before First Nations women will actually not be at a higher risk, but also to make workplaces safe to disclose. The Greens, amendments, uh, the Greens have moved several amendments to this bill and the first to broaden the definition of family and domestic violence for further clarity and to ensure that victim survivors get the support that they actually need. The second allows for up to four uh, days of unpaid leave to be taken on top of the 10 days of paid leave. And this acknowledges that 10 days might actually not be enough. And indeed, it is best practice of the minimum standard of 14 days, which my colleague Senator Waters has already outlined. And finally, there's an amendment to insert a new provision into the Fair Work Act that makes experiencing or having, or having experienced family and domestic violence is a protected attribute which will help prevent potential workplace discrimination against an employee who discloses their situation. In fact, all of these amendments have been called for by stakeholders, um, and I want to acknowledge the, the work of Senator Waters as our portfolio holder um, through the inquiry into this bill. We need to listen to the experts in this area about what's needed to end family and domestic violence. In my concluding remarks, I want to say that the paid, domestic, uh, paid family and domestic violence leave will help victim survivors to leave potentially violent and abusive situations, but we also need to address the causal factors of this as well. We need to address the intergenerational trauma that people are carrying with them as survivors of family and domestic violence. And as a mother of two daughters, these are important issues that require specific and targeted resources to help heal, prevent violence experienced by women, but also by the impact of their children. Now, our girls need an opportunity to thrive in the future. We need to address the underlying factors that lead to this abuse. We need to educate people what respectful relationships look like. We need to address poverty and access to basic necessities such as housing, which play a pivotal role in reducing violence in our communities. It is, in fact, our job in this place to ensure that we use our political will and our capital to make those life-altering changes to preserve, value and respect the lives of women. And in First Nations communities across this country, we continue to ask questions like, how many more? How many more of our women who are mothers and grandmothers must die before our efforts are clearly just not enough in this place? And until we show the courage and the bravery that we applaud of our victim survivors to address the underlying causes of gender-based violence, very little will change. All too often, under the current scheme, people are forced to choose between their job, their income and their safety, and this is not a choice that anyone should have to make. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you, Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill of 2022. And I'm proud to be part of a government that introduced this bill as one of its first bills to this parliament. In the years to come, it will be seen as one of the hopefully many great achievements of the Albanese Labor government. Make no mistake, this bill will save lives. I want my fellow senators to think about this fact as they listen to the debate today and consider how they will vote. Domestic violence is a shame to our nation. Family and domestic violence affects people from all walks of life, in every community, in every city and in every region across this country. The statistics are harrowing. Since the age of 15, approximately one in four women has experienced at least one incidence of violence by an intimate partner. 
About 2.2 million Australians have experienced sexual violence since the age of 15. Indigenous women are 35, 35 times as likely to be hospitalised due to family and domestic violence than non-Indigenous women. And horrifically, on average, one woman is killed by her current or former partner every 10 days in Australia. For many women, the most dangerous place in Australia is their own home, a place where they should, at an absolute minimum, be able to feel safe. In the 10 years from mid-2002 mid to mid-2012, 488 women in Australia were killed by an intimate partner representing 75 per cent of the total of 654 victims killed by an intimate partner. And sadly, the COVID-19 pandemic has seen an increase in the prevalence of family and domestic violence. Getting out of domestic violence situations is hard. I empathise with anyone in that situation and truly hope that this bill provides some support to make it easier to get out. Frontline workers have told us that there are two issues at the forefront of the minds of women seeking to escape from violent relationships. First, they're worried about the disruption to the lives of their children. Second, they're worried about the disruption to their income and employment. Many can't leave violent situations without risking joblessness, financial stress, homelessness and poverty. So it leaves workers with nowhere to go, having to choose between their safety and their livelihood. For those that don't believe that this is an issue for the workplace, you are very, very wrong. More than 68 per cent of people experiencing family and domestic violence are in paid work. Women experiencing family and domestic violence earn 35 per cent less than those who do not and disproportionately affects women who are more likely to be casual or part-time. The costs to the national economy are huge, with estimates ranging between $12.6 billion and $22 billion per year. So employers are bearing significant costs up to $2 billion a year in the form of reduced productivity caused by absenteeism, recruitment and retraining costs. Paid family and domestic violence leave will assist to reduce this cost. Our legislation extends the Fair Work Commission's recent preliminary view by introducing a right to 10 days paid leave for all eligible employees covered by the national employment standards, including rostered casuals at the employee's full rate of pay. Excluding casuals altogether have left 2.6 million employees—22.8 per cent of all employees—without this protection and provide further incentive for employers to, re to prefer casuals over permanent jobs. We have also extended the definition of family and domestic violence to include conduct of a member of an employee's household to recognise that Australians are living in more diverse and different arrangements. This new entitlement will take effect on 1 February 2023 for business other than small business with fewer than 15 employees and on 1 August 2023 for small business in recognition that they have limited human resource and payroll capabilities. The government will also be consulting on a package of implementation support measures for small business to assist with rolling out this entitlement. This bill is good policy, and those that work closely with the victims of domestic, uh, domestic violence are clear as to its need. Before I finish, I would like to take a quick moment to outline how to access support services for anyone in my home state of Tasmania. If you are listening in Tasmania and need support and counselling for domestic and family violence, you can contact the Family Violence Counselling Support Service on 1800 608 122. This service operates between 9am and midnight on weekdays and between 4pm and midnight on weekends and public holidays. In conclusion, I'll just say this. As a nation, we can and must do better. And this bill is one way that we can do better. So I encourage all my Senate colleagues to support this bill. Senator Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is a historic day as we debate this historic bill before us. It's historic because the fight for the measures contained within this bill has been raging for a long time, from frontline workers, from our union movement, 
gender equality advocates, civil society from women. And it's historic because it will make a real difference to the lives of some of those in our community whose voices have been silenced, have been unheard for far too long. The statistics of family violence are too familiar to us all. We know, on average, one woman every 10 days in Australia is killed by an intimate partner. Women aren't the only victims of family and domestic violence, of course not, but we know disproportionately they experience family violence so much more than men. Since the age of 15, approximately one in four women will have experienced at least one instance of violence by an intimate partner. These statistics are horrific, but of course they're not just statistics. I'm sure almost all of us in this chamber would know someone who's experienced family violence, would have experienced family violence themselves. These are people we know, people we love, people we care for. And while this bill doesn't stop or solve family violence, it will make a difference. It introduces 10, pay, 10 days of paid leave for employees to use to deal with the impacts of family and domestic violence. Critically, it's paid at the rate of pay you would actually earn, whether in full-time employment, part-time employment or casual. And this is critically important. It's a really important part of this bill because, to start with, women are more likely to be the victims of violence. They're also more likely to be those in casual work. And we don't ever want women in Australia to be in the situation where they have to choose between a day's pay, between their livelihood and between getting help and getting out of a dangerous situation. Fundamentally, that's what this bill is about supporting those in our community at a critical point in their life where this support could be at least life-changing but probably life-saving. I'm really proud of this bill and I'm really proud to be part of a government that prioritises women's safety and equality. Of course it doesn't do everything. The National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children was released last week. This outlines a clear blueprint for the next 10 years. This plan contains an ambitious target, as it should, to end gender-based violence in one generation. And it includes tangible actions, including addressing gender discrimination, implementing prevention strategies, embedding effective early intervention approaches, and building the frontline sector workforce to ensure women and children can access tailored, culturally safe support, no matter where they live. These are some real tangible measures to be rolled out alongside the bill before us. But make no mistake, just because this bill doesn't do everything doesn't mean it won't make a tremendous difference, doesn't mean it won't change lives and that it won't save lives. So I very much commend the bill to the Senate and I would hope this is something that we could all get behind and support. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Relief Bill 2022. In opposition, Labor promised to provide 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave to all employees. As one of our first legislative acts in government, we are doing exactly that. I would like to thank the Deputy Chair, Senator O'Sullivan, members of this, and the Secretariat of the Education and Employment Committee for their strong engagement on the inquiry into this bill. In that inquiry, not a single stakeholder that made a submission or appeared at a hearing said that this was a bad idea. Not a single one. Because everyone recognised just how important this is. The statistics are shocking. From the age of 15, one in four women and one in 13 men experience violence by an intimate partner. On average, one woman is killed by a current or former partner every 10 days in Australia. Paid leave enables those experiencing violence to assess support, access support services before it's too late. As Samantha Parker, a frontline women's service worker and Australian Services Union organiser, told the Senate Committee inquiry into this bill, and I quote, Paid domestic and violence leave allows women the opportunity to leave abusive relationships safely. These reforms will save lives. 
I want to commend the activists and survivors who have campaigned for paid family and domestic violence leave over many years. I also want to commend the community and trade union movement, which has fought tooth and nail against opposition from some in the employer lobby for this entitlement. I particularly want to acknowledge the Australian Services Union, which has been instrumental in this fight, including former ASU New South Wales Secretaries Sally McManus, Natalie Lang, current Secretary Angus McFarland and Deputy Secretary Judith Wright. Just like weekends, the 40-hour week, the minimum wage, annual leave, sick leave, parental leave, penalty rates, superannuation, workers' compensation, unfair dismissal laws and redundancy pay, none of these entitlements were gifted by employers or conservative governments. Every single one of these benefits were fought for and won by the community, trade unions and countless union members and organisers across the country. And today there is a new entitlement to add to that list, paid family and domestic violence leave. Of course, the usual suspects and employer lobby groups like the Australian Industry Group showed up at the inquiry into the bill and complained. They complained that businesses shouldn't have to pay for their employees to get paid leave to assess potentially life-saving support. Isn't it funny that the big businesses that fund these lobby groups never want to put their own names to the reprehensible policy positions they lobby for? We will see it again this week when the AI Group and Chamber of Commerce campaign against Labor's reforms to grow wages and improve job security. The large companies who fund these groups, such as Qantas, are too ashamed to run these campaigns in their own name. But the fact is that they leave, they, this leave entitlement will not only provide vital support to people experiencing violence, it will also deliver productivity benefits. The Curtin Economic Centre estimates this reform will actually deliver net savings for employers through increased productivity and reduced absenteeism. This is just the first of a number of reforms that will improve the lives of Australian workers, especially women workers, and help with cost of living pressures, job insecurity, particularly in uh, women feminised industries. The government has already introduced legislation to the House that will massively expand childcare subsidies for Australian families, enabling parents to get back into work sooner. Another government bill already introduced to the House will implement all the remaining legislative recommendations of the Respect at Work report. In, in uh, the budget just handed down last night, the Albanese government has extended paid parental leave from 16 weeks, 18 weeks to 26 weeks, another massive reform for working families. And later this week, the government will introduce a bill that makes four significant improvements to gender equity in the workplace. That includes banning pay secrecy clauses, a practice that employers use to prevent workers, particularly women workers, from learning what the, how they've been discriminated against. It includes making gender equity an explicit objective of the Fair Work Act. It includes establishing new expert panels at the Fair Work Commission to address pay equity and undervalued work in the care sector. And it includes giving the Commission greater power to order pay increases in low-paid, usually highly feminised industries, through equal remuneration principles. Together, these reforms represent the greatest strides towards gender equality at work in generations. The initial fight over equal pay was won in 1969 with a Meat Workers Union successful equal pay case at the Arbitration Commission. But over 50 years later, Equal pay for equal work has still never become a reality for Australian women. These reforms by the Albanese government mean gender equity at work can finally be realised. It is really disappointing that after nine years of sending workers' wages and rights backwards, the Liberal and Nationals opposition have already confirmed that they will be opposing many of those reforms. I think it's time that those opposite and their mates in the employer lobby cut out the old class war nonsense 
and get on board with Labor's pro-wages and pro-women agenda, an agenda that is also delivering critical support for women and men experiencing domestic and family violence. Senator. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. I thank all honourable senators for their contribution to, to debate on the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Bill 2022. Many of the contributions were not easy speeches for people to give. Where there have been different views on the best way forward, those views have been put very respectfully. I also thank honourable senators on the Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee for their, for their inquiry into the provisions of this bill. This bill is an important step towards making sure that no person is denied the opportunity to live a life free of family and domestic violence simply because they cannot afford to escape. This government believes in the fundamental right of all employees in this country to feel safe in their homes and in their workplaces. The choice between safety and their income is an impossible one that millions of workers in Australia still regularly face. This is unacceptable and it must change. This bill will provide employees with 10 days of paid leave each year to deal with the impacts of family and domestic violence. Family and domestic violence doesn't discriminate based on whether you're a permanent or casual worker. In fact, those experiencing family and domestic violence are more likely to be in casual work. This paid leave will therefore be available to full-time, part-time and casual employees. The 10 days leave will be provided up front, allowing immediate access to the full entitlement from the commencement of employment. This allows immediate access to the full entitlement from the commencement of employment so those experiencing family and domestic violence can deal immediately with the effects without compromising their income security. Rather than being paid at the base rate of pay, leave will be paid at the rate the employee would have received had they not taken leave. The principle behind this is simple. Getting out shouldn't mean losing pay. Normally, leave entitlements are calculated at the base rate of pay, but applying the principle that getting out shouldn't mean losing pay requires a different approach. To provide certainty to both employers and employees about the pay they should receive, casual employees will be paid for rostered shifts including where a shift has been offered and accepted. Casuals who, have not, who are not rostered on will still be entitled to leave without pay when they need to be unavailable for work to deal with the impacts of family and domestic violence. This means that they will always be protected from losing their jobs when they need to take, uh, to take leave and when they are rostered on, the paid leave entitlement will be there. The bill also reflects the changing nature of Australian society, where more people have diverse living situations. The bill amends the definition of family and domestic violence to ensure that violent or abusive behaviour in intimate relationships, regardless of whether partners are cohabiting, will be covered to allow employees to take paid leave to seek necessary assistance. The government will move two amendments in the Senate, making technical changes to the Fair Work Act. To enable the making of regulations that specifically prevent the listing of family and domestic violence leave on an employee's pay slip, and making technical updates to the Fair Work Commission's new dispute resolution mechanism in relation to existing enterprise agreements. The government listened to stakeholder concerns around pay slips, including concerns raised by small business, payroll providers and the National Women's Alliances. We recognise for those in situations of coercive control or where a perpetrator has access to their partner's financial records, the appearance of family and domestic violence leave on a pay slip 
could put the employee taking leave at risk. The other amendment responds to the Fair Work Commission's submission to the Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee's inquiry into the bill. This amendment is needed to ensure that the provisions operate as intended. Support for small business is essential. The intention of this bill is to make clear that family and domestic violence must be addressed in the workplace, not just left to the social and, com social and community or, or criminal justice sectors. As such, it is important to recognise that employers are partners in this process. This is particularly true for small businesses, which have had a uniquely close relationship with their employees but don't have the human, resources, exp human resource expertise and resources available to their la larger businesses. The entitlement has a phased commencement to assist business implement this entitlement. Most businesses will have around six months from the date of introduction and small businesses will have an additional six months to prepare. The Small Business Assistance Package announced in the budget provides $3.4 million over four years to deliver a range of holistic supports to help small businesses implement paid family and domestic violence leave, including updating and increasing resources for workplace relations, advice and education tools delivered by the Fair Work Ombudsman, funding to support peak bodies develop tailored workplace relations guidance and support, in addition, specialist family and domestic violence information, support and training through the existing 1800 Respect and DV Alert programs will also will be also available to small business so they can assist victim survivors access support services. Together, these measures will ensure small businesses can access the right advice at the right time to provide the best support to their employees experience family and domestic violence. Passing this bill is an important step, but the government recognises that we need to make sure that this leave entitlement is working for both employers and workers who are experiencing family and domestic violence. An important part of this will be looking at how this leave entitlement is supporting workers who experience family and domestic violence and whether the support and guidance the government will provide to, the business, to businesses is it adequate. The government is therefore committed to implementing the recommendation of the Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee to undertake an independent review of the provisions of this bill 18 months after its commencement. This important review has been expressly funded through the Budget Small Business Assistance Package. The review would assess the effectiveness and scope of the bill, along with assessing the adequacy of the support and guidance available to businesses to assist with the implementation of the bill. The government has already committed to a detailed, timely and ex extensive review of the provisions. Therefore, we do not support the opposition's amendment for an independent review, which is both unnecessary poorly and poorly designed, noting it does not refer to assessing the impact of the amendments on victim survivors, only put six months of operation for small business in scope, imposes a three-month reporting deadline, which is insufficient to undertake qualitative and quantitative research while applying a sensitive trauma-informed methodology. There are several issues that have been raised during debate on this bill and in the Senate inquiry that are important to address. There has been some concerns that the bill may also provide leave to perpetrators of family and domestic violence. Others have called for the leave to be expanded so perpetrators who are seeking professional help can access this leave. To be entirely clear, an employee will only be able to take this leave if they are experiencing family and domestic violence. An employee cannot take paid family and domestic violence leave provided by the bill for violence they, them, they themselves perpetrate. The government is aware that some jurisdictions and organisations offer leave for perpetrators in certain circumstances. That may assist some perpetrators who are seeking to change their abusive behaviour, but it is not the purpose of this bill, which is intended to aid those experiencing family and domestic violence seek help and leave. 
The entitlement does not provide a benefit to those who perpetrate family and domestic violence, and it is the government's view that providing a universal national entitlement to this benefit would not be in line with community expectations. I note suggestions from the opposition and the Australian Greens to ensure information, resources and supports are, are available for small business and victim su survivors for, for commencement of this entitlement. The government has been consulting on a small business assistance package. This will ensure clear and comprehensive guidance is available to employers to help understand their obligations and to refer their employees to appropriate supports. Honourable Senators have proposed other amendments, including further expanding the definition of family and domestic violence, providing additional upaid leave, unpaid leave on top of paid leave, combining family and domestic violence leave with compassionate leave to create a new form of emergency leave, expanding the definition of di discrimination under the Fair Work Act, expanding the examples in a, in a legislative note in 106B1, providing discretion for additional leave in, advancement by in advance by agreement, clarifying the reporting obligations for employees with respect to paid family and domestic leave. The government does not support these amendments. Some are unnecessary. Others would expand the scope of the legislation. It is important to get the balance right. The legislation in front of us is world-leading. We are taking a step that hasn't been taken by any other government around the world but we don't want to take the scope further than we have. Everything we've done so far has been based on that very simple test of making sure that workers are not choosing between safety and their pay. An independent review of the provisions of this bill will occur in 2024, which will look at the effectiveness and scope of the bill, along with assessing the adequacy of support and guidance available to business. Paid family and domestic violence leave joins with the range of tools available to address violence against women and children. This government acknowledges the resistance and resilience of victim survivors of family and domestic violence and is committed to providing the national leadership and investment needed to address family and domestic violence. This is demonstrated through the government's, government's October 2022-23 budget, which, which invested a total of one point. $7 billion over six years for women's safety because ending violence against women and children is a national priority. This investment will support the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022-2032, which will guide efforts and actions over the next decade towards the vision of ending gender-based violence in one generation. This bill will not solve the problem of family domestic violence by itself. There is much more work to be done. But it does mean that no employee in Australia will ever be forced to reckon with the choice between earning a wage and protecting the safety of themselves and their family. I thank all senators who have spoken in this debate for their support of this historic legislation and commend the bill to the Senate. Honourable Senators, there are two second reading amendments that have been circulated. The first is from Senator Cash, who has moved it, and then one from Senator Waters, who will move it subsequently. So it's my intention to put the second reading amendment as moved by Senator Cash. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. No, have it. Is division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
order. Dr Dawes. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Cash be agreed to. Uh, those of the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to the second reading amendment as signalled by Senator Waters and invite you to move that. Senator oh, Waters. Thanks very much, President. I move second reading amendment uh, number 1642, standing in my name, pertaining to funding for frontline services. So the question is that the motion is second reading a motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, believe the noes have it. Division required. So no division required. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an Act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 to provide for paid family and domestic violence leave and for related purposes. Uh, Minister. I think we're up to just the Okay. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, if possible, I'd like to move together amendments number RU110 and PF105. So I seek leave to move them together. 
Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister, you've sought leave, so now move. Thank you. Senator Cash. Yeah. Uh, in relation to the bill, I do understand uh, that there is a time imperative and we will hit a hard marker at 12.30 p.m. Uh, I therefore will endeavour at uh, 12.15 uh, to get as many questions uh, on the record, um, and I would seek to work with the minister in that respect. Uh, minister, you will be aware that in relation to the decision of the Fair Work Commission, there are three parts of this bill that do go beyond what the provisional decision was. The bill was examined in the committee, um, and at that committee process, there were a number of questions uh, that were asked on behalf of, in particular, small businesses around Australia, uh, that adequate information was not provided. So, in terms of the questions that I would like to put to you, I will just give you the heads up as to the topics uh, so that the department and your office uh, are able to provide you with the information. They will be in relation to the ability of perpetrators to access the leave, the reporting obligations of employers, the amendment that the government will be moving, which the opposition has indicated it will be supporting in relation to the pay slips. I have some questions in relation to the inclusion of casuals and in relation to the rate of pay and accrual. So, in relation to perpetrators, I will do them as a block of questions to enable you to respond in a timely fashion. At the committee hearing in relation to this matter, and I do note that uh, Senator Brown has made some further comments in her summing up speech, but the department itself at that time could not confirm with certainty on whether perpetrators will have access to paid family and domestic violence leave. Can I get the minister to outline the government's position, the reason being obviously people turn to Hansard to interpret um, decisions that are being made. So can the minister outline the government's position clearly? In other words, is it a guarantee? that perpetrators of domestic violence will not be able to access paid family and domestic violence leave under this legislation. If someone was to take paid family and domestic violence leave uh, and were then found out to be the perpetrator of the leave, what course of action does the employer then have in relation to this particular employee, but also are they able to recoup uh, the monies paid to them in accessing the leave. Can, can, are you able to take us through the safeguards the government has put in place in the legislation uh, to ensure that it is not accessed uh, by perpetrators? <coughs> and the other question that's being asked by business and small businesses in particular, but I also know it was raised by the Australian Greens, does the government agree with the suggestion that perpetrators should be able to access paid family and domestic violence leave to attend counselling on how not to commit domestic violence. So that is the block of questions. Um, if I could get your response to them for Hansard. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. I do have some answers to some of the questions that you've posed, and I might uh, just get some further advice on a couple of the other more specific aspects. Uh, what I'm advised is that to access the leave entitlement under the Fair Work Act, an employee may take family and domestic violence leave only if they are experiencing family and domestic violence. Uh, the government is aware that some jurisdictions and organisations offer leave for perpetrators in certain circumstances. This is not the purpose of this bill, which is intended to aid those experiencing family and domestic violence to seek help and leave. Uh, the entitlement does not provide a benefit to those who perpetrate family and domestic violence, and it is the government's view that providing a universal national entitlement to this benefit would not be in line with community expectations. Um, I know there were a couple of 
additional questions. Um, I'll see if I've got any further advice for you on those. Uh, what I'm advised in terms of the ability to recoup for employers to recoup uh, leave that is, if you like, incorrectly paid to a perpetrator. Um, there are existing provisions under the legislation to uh, recoup payments and take other uh, action for fraudulent claims, uh, and those powers would exist in these circumstances as well. Does that cover off each of the questions? No, and, and, and I'll accept those answers because I think it does properly now articulate the position that employers can then look to. Could I put another block of questions to you? It is in relation to reporting obligations and, again, in particular for small and family businesses who don't have the huge HR departments, and it will be mum and dad who are, who are reviewing the Fair Work Act and wondering where to go. Uh, th this is one that has been consistently raised, um, even despite the Senate committee looking into the matter itself. So again, for the benefit of the Hansard record, when an employee accesses family and domestic violence leave, what reporting obligations does an employer have to inform authorities? What small and family business in particular have requested is, can you guarantee that no employer will be liable should their employee access family and domestic violence leave and then the employer fails to report it uh, to authorities. What safeguards are in place in the legislation to ensure that employers cannot be held liable when an employee accesses family and domestic violence leave and they do or do not report it and there was the opposite obligation this I'm now going to turn to people who work from home. If an employee works from home for all or part of their employment and then accesses paid family and domestic violence leave, what obligations does this put on the employer in terms of providing a safe workplace? Changing topic slightly here. If an employee is under 18, and accesses family and domestic violence leave, does this fact change the reporting obligations for the employer? If an employer reports to the police that their employee has accessed family and domestic violence leave against the wishes of the employee, will the employer be subject to penalties for going against the wishes of the employee? And what guidance has or will the department provide to employers um, in relation to their reporting obligations? Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the bill does not place any reporting obligations on employers. Uh, any reporting obligations arising under state or territory laws are not prohibited by the bill. Um, state or territory laws, such as those that apply to some workers mandating reporting of suspected abuse of children would not be affected. However, uh, the current section 106C uh, of the Act provides an exemption to the confidentiality ob obligation where the disclosure is required by an Australian law or is necessary to protect the life, health or safety of the employee or another person. So there is a degree of protection in there for employers. Uh, in addition to information available on state and territory websites, you'd be aware Senator Cash's 1800 Respect and the Australian Institute of Family Studies also provide information on mandatory reporting on their websites, and I'd encourage employers to take that up. Um, I'm looking at the departmental officials now, but uh, based on that information, I would assume um, that the same rules apply in relation to work from home employees or employees under the age of 18 as exists more generally. So everything that I've said already applies to those employees as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
as, as I've sort of implied, obviously children uh, or, or employees under the age of 18, there may be particular obligations in relation to mandatory reporting of suspected abuse of those children, but the same uh, exemption for confidentiality uh, obligation uh, and other things that I've already said apply in that situation too. Senator Cash. Thank you. Turning now to another topic, prescribing the pay slips, and it's in relation to the amendment uh, or one of the amendments that the government uh, has, moving, uh, has moved. Just in terms of the pay slips, how will this actually work through the um, businesses' payroll services? How do you see it actually working? Um, did you have any consultation with employers prior to uh, drafting the amendment? More importantly, though, will businesses be penalised, and in particular small and family businesses who don't necessarily have again that capacity, they don't have the HR department? Um, they're doing it all themselves, probably at Sunday at midnight, wondering if their doors are going to open tomorrow. The point being, if they accidentally include on a pay slip information that shows that the employee has accessed or taken paid family and domestic violence leave, what are the penalties the businesses will face? Um, will the government be producing guidance materials for small businesses to ensure that they are adequately informed on these issues, would the businesses have a chance to rectify pay slips that do show this information, or would they immediately face penalties? And with small businesses, any businesses, but often small businesses, they'll actually outsource their payroll, for example, to an external accountant. Who would then be responsible, the small business or the external accountant, in the event that, on the pay slip? It states family and domestic violence leave. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. There's obviously a few questions in there, but I'll do my best to answer them. The, 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 if I've understood your questions correctly, um, they relate to the amendment the government has moved around pay slips. Um, now, this amendment makes technical changes to the Fair Work Act, which provides legislative support to amend the Fair Work regulations to prevent the listing of family and domestic violence leave on, em on an employee's pay slip. And that obviously, uh, in fact, these issues, this, this, this amendment arises from issues that were raised in the consultation process. Um, and why this matters, I guess, is that for those, situation, for those in a situation of coercive control or where a perpetrator has access to a victim's financial records, the appearance of family and domestic leave on a pay slip could put the employee taking leave at significant risk. Um, currently, the Fair Work Act does not allow items to be prohibited from appearing on a pay slip. It only prescribes what must be included. So this amendment is needed to ensure a prohibition on showing an employee's family and domestic leave, violence leave balance on a pay slip can be added to the Fair Work regulations. So that power will exist uh, under the regulations. The, you raised the point about consultation. Uh, as part of consultation on the bill, the government consulted with payroll providers and the Council of Small Business Organisations Australia, COSBOA, who raised this issue as a concern. Uh, submissions to the Senate inquiry, such as that from the National Women's Safety Alliance, also flagged pay slips as a point of concern. Uh, and I acknowledge this has been a particular issue of interest to Senator Lambie, uh, and hence uh, that's what's led to us making this amendment. Hopefully, I've mostly at least answered your questions. Yeah. Cash. I, I just want to explore one other part. Again, it, it's been raised by businesses. In the first instance, will they have a chance to rectify the pay slip, um, or will they face an immediate penalty? Also, in relation to the outsourcing, would it be the small business or the outsourced company that are responsible for the mistake? But also, in relation to if a worker has taken paid family and domestic violence leave and works at home occasionally, would this then create an issue under work health and safety laws for the employer? Uh, 
Senator Walters. Thanks very much, Chair. While the minister is seeking advice, I'll just chime in because otherwise I fear I might miss my opportunity entirely, given Never. that we hit the hard marker at 12.15. Um, so can I just point out that the Greens will be supporting both of the amendments that the government's just moved. Uh, one is a technical fix that um, relates to the national employment standards. Um, the other is an important change about payslips, which the opposition is now asking about. And we think that nicely treads the line between respecting the safety and the privacy of workers who are experiencing family and domestic violence, but still maintaining the need to call this family and domestic violence leave, which will help to destigmatise the fact that this is actually rampant in society, and we need to change that. So, um, for the record, that's why we won't be supporting um, Senator Lambie, uh, Jackie Lambie Network's amendments, because we don't agree that we should call this something that it's not. This is not emergency leave. This is family and domestic violence leave. Now, I'm just at the very minute um, being handed a fresh amendment, which I've not yet had the chance to uh, digest, but I'm told that the government is talking with um, the Jackie Lambie Network about this amendment, so I look forward to the opportunity to actually read that amendment and form a view on whether or not it's a useful um, uh, change uh, in relation to protecting women and ensuring that women don't have to choose between their job or their safety. Um, and while I'm on my feet, I might just briefly outline the fact that I'll be moving our amendments on block. We had hoped to get this bill done um, in the last set of parliamentary sittings and did our level best to deliver that, but um, it looks like now we won't get the chance um, until perhaps later tonight when maybe there won't be opportunities for speaking. So very, in very brief form, um, we're moving some uh, minor amendments which relate to the fact that the leave should be available to not just people who are experiencing violence but to people who have experienced family and domestic violence. We know it can take years um, to get the court processes to, um, to uh, complete, um, often in an unsatisfactory manner, I might add. Um, and we need to make sure also that it's clear that an employee can access leave to undertake activities that are not just inconvenient for them to do on work time, as the current bill proposes, but that are also unsafe for them to do other than on work time. So that's another of our um, amendments. We've also expanded out the list of things in the note that employees specifically can ask for leave for in order to do uh, to stay safe. Um, we're moving an important amendment that relates to having additional four days of unpaid leave on top of the 10 days of paid leave, acknowledging that it can take a long time uh, to do the things you need to do. Uh, and Assuming you have the resources to do them, which is why this bill is important and also why funding for frontline services is very important. Um, so we'll be moving that amendment as well. It gets us closer to best practice. On that resourcing issue, my second reading amendment went to the fact that this will increase demand on frontline services. And we were hoping last night in the budget that there would be an increase in funding for frontline services. Now there was a partial indexation. That is not a funding increase. There is already unmet demand for frontline services uh, and prevention work and healing work. There is already an unmet need, and this bill, which is crucial, will increase that need. We needed to see money in the budget last night for frontline services to keep women safe and to stop the incredible amount of deaths that are happening. Um, but in the interest of time, we didn't move that one to a vote, uh, mistakenly thinking that we might be able to pass this bill in a timely fashion. Um, my final amendment, uh, which I'll move uh, when my turn comes, relates to making sure that there can be no discrimination or unfair dismissal as a result of an employee seeking uh, to access family and domestic violence leave. So when the time comes, probably at about 11 o'clock tonight, uh, with no chance to speak, I will be commending those amendments, and I would urge all parties in this parliament to deal with this bill promptly so that small business has the time to change whatever operations they need to change to undertake their obligations. And I note with pleasure that the, uh, there was an amount allocated last night in the budget to enable support for small businesses to adopt this new practice. Thank you. Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Just before I address Senator Cash's questions, um, I'd like to table two supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to government, the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Thanks. Um, now, in terms of the questions that uh, Senator Cash asked and Senator Waters, I was trying to keep an ear on what you were saying while getting the answers to these questions. I don't think there were any questions you posed in that contribution, though. Um, so, the Senator Cash, uh, what I'm advised is that 
strictly speaking, um, a failure by a business or uh, payroll provider to comply with this obligation uh, would amount to a breach of the Act. But in practice, should the employer or pay payroll provider take speedy action um, to rectify the situation, that would be taken into account by the Commission. So, um, you know, it, it certainly is not the intention to go around fining employers or payroll providers who may inadvertently fail to comply. Um, the, uh, and on that, you asked about this earlier as well, it's certainly the department's intention to provide substantial information to small businesses to, to assist them to comply. You know, we want this to work. We want people to understand the obligations. Um, you raised workplace health and safety laws. I don't know if this is exactly addressing your query, but um, the bill does not create any additional workplace health and safety obligations. Uh, it doesn't alter the existing interactions between the Fair Work Act and, work and health place, workplace health and safety laws. Uh, employers, of course, have duty under workplace health and safety laws to ensure the health and safety of workers so far as is reasonably practicable while they are at work. Uh, and this includes actively managing the risk of family and domestic violence happening at the workplace. Senator Cash. Look, we are going to hit the hard marker shortly. So the next series of questions would have been in relation to, in particular, the inclusion of casuals. Uh, it is incredibly confusing for business given this does go further than what the Fair Work Commission themselves has said. It does actually change the way the leave operates within the Fair Work um, Act itself. There were a number of questions that I had, and I don't know if we can return to them tonight. But in particular, the questions that business are asking are under Clause 19 of the bill. If a casual employee gets a call asking what days they are available for the next week, and then subsequently is unable to come in but have not been provided with the times, would they be entitled to payment under this bill? Under Clause 19, if a casual employee gets a call asking what days they're available for the next week but then is subsequently unable to come in due to family and domestic violence leave but were not actually provided with the times, how would you actually calculate uh, their rate of payment under this bill? And um, if we do return to this bill, it would assist perhaps if some answers could be provided. Thank you. Pursuant to order, uh, it's 12.15, so pursuant to order, I now call Senator's statements. Senator Billick. Thank you so much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last night's budget delivers the plan the Australian people voted for. This budget is right for the times and ready for the future. Our budget will do three things. Provide responsible cost of living relief that doesn't add to inflation invest in the capabilities of our people and the capacity of our economy and begin the very hard task of long-term budget repair. It's a responsible budget that starts to clean up that awful mess the Liberals left behind and begins to build the better future that the Australian people deserve. I'd like to speak today on the second point, how Labor will invest in the capabilities of our people and the capacity of our economy. So Australia is facing an unprecedented skills shortage caused by the inaction and incompetence of the nine years of the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government. Having skilled workers is vital for growing the economy and creating secure, high-paying jobs that are good for workers and their families. Particularly during this time of emerging new industries and technologies, it's vital that Australian workers have the skills to meet the challenges of the future and position Australia to grasp the opportunities. We need to provide a path for workers to seize those opportunities with transferable skills. Working in a globalised market, we must be aware of how we and industries can maximise support for growing our domestic talent and how we can attract a skilled workforce. According to the OECD, Australia is experiencing the second most severe labour shortages in the developed world. Labor understands this. Labor is acting. And that's why last night's budget invests in the capabilities of our people and the capacity of our economy to boost productivity, grow the economy and get wages moving again. Together with the states and territories, 
we are making a $1 billion investment in fee-free TAFE and vocational education places. We are providing 180,000 places next year, the first stage in our plan for nearly half a million fee-free TAFE places for Australians, learning skills for jobs in priority areas like the care sectors and the digital economy. This budget also invests more than $770 million for better schools, happy and healthier students and more qualified teachers. And we will invest $485 million to create 20,000 new university places over the next two years for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. As the Treasurer said, no Australian should be denied by poverty, by postcode or by lack of privilege their chance at a, better, at a better future. These budget announcements came after the Albanese government moved quickly to hold the recent Jobs and Skills Summit. And the Jobs and Skills Summit brought together Australians, including unions, employers, civil society and governments, to address our shared economic challenges. As a result of the consensus reached at the summit, immediate actions will be taken to build a bigger, better trained and more productive workforce to help deliver secure jobs with growing wages, boost incomes and living standards and create more opportunities for more Australians. The summit has also laid out priorities for further work and further action. In addition to the announcements in the budget, the Australian government will legislate Jobs and Skills Australia as a priority based on tripartite governance, establish the Jobs and Skills Australia work plan in consultation with all jurisdictions and stakeholders to address work for sh work, walk, sorry, workforce shortages and build long-term capacity in priority sectors. We'll task Jobs and Skills Australia, once established, to com commission a workforce capacity study on the clean energy workforce. The Australian government and the states and territories will also kick-start skill sector reform and restart discussions for a five-year national skills agreement based on guiding principles agreed by the National Cabinet and skills ministers. Develop a comprehensive blueprint with key stakeholders to support and grow a quality vet workforce. The Australian government, in partnership with states, territories and stakeholders, will also reinvigorate foundation skills programs to support workers and vulnerable Australians to gain secure employment choices. Explore more options to improve the apprenticeship support system and drive up completions. Include specific sub-targets for women in the Australian Skills Guarantee and ensure the guarantee includes a focus on the need for digital skills. Work together to reform the framework for VET qualifications and micro-credentials to ensure they are most relevant to labour market needs. In the lead-up to the Jobs and Skills Summit in Canberra, over 100 Jobs and Skills forums were held across Australia, including three in Tasmania. And I attended the Hobart Forum with my Labor colleagues, the Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury, Mr Lee, the Member for Lions, Mr Brian Mitchell, and my, good, my colleague, the good Senator Carol Brown. It was a wonderful opportunity to hear firsthand from a wide variety of voices from businesses, civil society organisations, professional associations, employment service providers and unions. Everybody in the room together, everyone working together, not trying to you know, kill off certain sectors uh, like the previous government did in regard to tr trying to kill off the unions. We've heard that we have a vital need to provide skills and training, especially for our young Tasmanians. Career education must include skill-based occupations such as trades, transport and logistics and care-based um, occupations. Further, training targeting occupations which ensure the next generation are ready for a key focus for those children, those students up in the, in the gallery to make sure that their job ready um, was a key focus. One concern is that Tasmania has a shortage of education professionals, which is impacting the education of Tasmania's young people right now. And we had a lot of great ideas that were generated about how to tackle the skills crisis, make jobs secure and get wages moving. So I do just quickly want to thank all those uh, people that were present for their ideas and suggestions and for p participating in that um, activity. 
Our current skills crisis has, of course, been exacerbated by COVID, but we saw signs of the looming shortage even before the pandemic hit. Whether it's in nursing, aged care, hospita hospitality, construction, teaching or tech, there are skill shortages wherever we look across the economy. My old area of early childhood education, skill shortages um, and, a, and a lack of people um, taking on, on the roles. The skills priority list released recently by the National Skills Commission includes 286 occupations in national shortage up from 153 in 2021. So action should have been taken by the previous government on the shortages and the emerging shortages, but of course they dropped the ball in this area as in a range of other areas. Um, but now we've got a government that are willing to work with employers, education and training providers and the unions to find solutions. According to the OECD, a staggering three million adults in Australia lack the fundamental skills required to participate in training and secure work. These are skills such as basic literacy, digital literacy and numeracy, which are required to participate in our economy and, frankly, in our society. The Albanese government will explore options to address this critical issue to make sure that no one is held back and no one is left behind. As anyone who has listened to parliamentary de debates for a while knows, I'm deeply passionate about TAFE. I come out of TAFE. A strong TAFE sector is crucial to a strong economy and achieving a fair society. We will restore TAFE to its rightful prominence in the training landscape. And it's crucial that we reinvigorate Australia's apprenticeship system and provide support for secure careers in trades and occupations that are in demand. We are engaging the sector to shift the focus to improving retention and completion rates and ensuring apprentices and trainees get the support they need. The Australian Skills Guarantee will ensure one in ten workers on major federally funded government projects are an apprentice, trainee or paid cadet, with a particular focus on supporting women through specific targets. The new energy sector is one such area of focus, and we're providing for 10,000 new energy apprenticeships. We must secure a more productive economy and help Australians get well-paid and secure jobs, providing them with greater opportunities. This requires leadership, planning, collaboration and working towards a shared goal if we are to be successful. At a time of low unemployment and labour shortage, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to ensure that the people who face intergenerational barriers to employment can gain transferable skills and secure jobs. Labor is more than ready to grasp this opportunity. Thank you, Senator. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Diversity, inclusion and blind acceptance are subjects that are regularly preached by the woke left. Unfortunately, their awakening has led them into a place of hypocrisy. They are some of the most intolerant and least accepting members of our society. The Australian Football League is now a place where a person can be vilified and all but forced out of a job. It has become a bloated, multi-billion dollar goliath regularly moralising to Australians on social issues while addicted to gambling, advertising and, and has let us all down. In less than 24 hours, Mr Andrew Thorburn was hired and resigned from his position as CEO of the Essendon Bombers Football Club. Now, let's make this crystal clear. Mr Thorburn was admonished and publicly attacked not for his personal beliefs but for the thoughts of someone else who delivered a sermon at his church a decade ago. He did not attend, nor was he aware of it until the woke mob called for his blood. Now, I had the opportunity to work alongside the NAB while Mr Thorburn was the CEO of the bank. I headed up the Indigenous Training and Employment Organisation, Generation One, when NAB signed up as one of our partners. Now, unlike some other corporates that merely talk the talk, maybe put up some artwork or other things, the NAB really stepped up and embraced this program to create real and meaningful employment opportunities for Indigenous Australians. And it was clear to me, given the way that they embraced this program, 
that the support came from the very top of the organisation. So it saddens me to see Mr Thorburn reduced by his faith and by this measure found unfit to take on the role at the Essendon Football Club. Essendon Football Club claimed that this is not about vilifying anyone for their personal religious beliefs, but about a clear conflict of interest with an organisation whose views do not align at all with our values as a safe, inclusive, diverse and welcoming club. Now, this is just hypocrisy at its finest. Safe, inclusive, diverse and welcoming, unless, of course, your personal beliefs differ from the reigning diversity culture. Now, I accept that things have moved on in our society, that there are many different views on issues of social uh, matters. But this is a very, very alarming situation that we have here. Welcome to the new Australia, where people can be censored and publicly punished by their mere association. We are no longer the country of a fair go, and this fact should be a wake-up call for all Australians. It affirms what Janet Albertson said recently in her article in The Australian. It said, rights such as freedom of expression, freedom of conscience and freedom of religion, so central to living in a free and liberal society, have been emasculated by social engineers who know exactly what they're doing and facilitated by naives who should know better. Now, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews, Mr Andrews, uh, rush to attack uh, Andrew Thorburn's association was only highlights a further degree of hypocrisy. The Archbishop of Melbourne, Peter Comensoli, said, the Premier's own words about his beliefs and how they play out for the sake of others have tended toward the harmful because they have sought to uphold the good of one by undermining the good of another. Referring to Andrew Thorburn's church and the bombers' decision to sack him, the Premier used words like intolerant, bigotry, absolutely appalling and no sympathy. Such language pitches some members of the community against others and contributes to an unhelpful spirit of division, he said. It leaves ordinary people of faith questioning if they can publicly hold their committed beliefs or even be able to exercise leadership and service in the community. Then he went on to say that we cannot claim to be inclusive if we stir up polarisation between sectors of the community, because in our nation, and I hope our state, every person and every community matters. This issue is precisely why the coalition pushed so hard when we were in government to pass the Religious Discrimination Act while we were in government. Opponents that stood in the way of the Religious Discrimination Bill said that the bill was a solution looking for a problem. Well, if Thorburn's case doesn't reveal the dire problem, then nothing will. As far as we know, Mr Thorburn was not seeking to use his platform as CEO of the football club to enforce his pastor's views on social issues upon the football club. He was not measured by his own history and record, but he was measured by his association and was asked to make a choice that no Australian should ever be forced to make, and that was a choice between his faith and his job. And the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, has hidden from this issue. He's shown no leadership. Labor went to the election claiming that they will unite Australians, but when it comes to defending freedom of religion, they're nowhere to be seen. In an interview with the ABC Radio in Perth, when asked if Mr Thorburn had been discriminated against by Essendon, all that the Prime Minister had to say was that that's not his focus at all. He's not been focused on that. Well, from time to time, you need your leaders to stand up and defend those that need defending. And I call on the Prime Minister to step up and do more in this space. Faith leaders and religious communities are calling for religious protections, and after Labor voted against the coalition's bill, they then made an election promise, and I welcome that, and I'd like to see that forthcoming. Now, I've been a strong supporter of, of religious protections, except that there's a massive diversity of views. 
and of course lots of different positions. And we must protect those, the freedom of individuals to be able to hold those positions. Because Australians are concerned that their freedom of worship is slipping away. And Mr Thorburn is proof of it, and he's not the only one. Jason Tay, a wedding photographer, was sued by a same-sex couple because he told them that he did not share the same values because he's a Christian. Now, he didn't decline to photograph their wedding, but nonetheless received a letter from the West Australian Equal Opportunity Commission to, advise a formal discrimination, to be advised of a formal discrimination complaint was lodged. Now, on the other hand, Muslim AFLW player Hanin Zakria, and my apologies if I've got the pronunciation wrong, was celebrated for refusing to wear the Pride Guernsey and skip the Pride Round. Then we've seen the Manly Sea Eagles implode because seven players made the same decision as Hanin Zakria. She was applauded, applauded, but Manly was attacked into submission. There is, there's just no consistency, and I raise those points to point uh, examples to point out that there's just no consistency. It's just another display of the left-wing hypocrisy. Now, this is a clarion call to Australians of courage. It's time for Australians who aren't on board with woke extremism to stand up and to fight back. It's time for an Australia where you aren't punished for holding fast to your beliefs no matter how much the woke mob might buy for your blood. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, just yesterday, uh, the new Labor government handed down its first budget, and this budget had some very welcoming measures, such as the measures around natural disaster relief and changes to paid parental leave. But there was also $40 million in fossil fuel subsidies and $1.5 billion for a toxic petrochemical plant in Middle Arm in the Darwin Harbour and $2 billion for new gas projects. In their first budget, the Labor government has shown that they are no better than the previous government for their love of dirty fossil fuel projects. And believe it or not, we are in a climate crisis. Now, this year alone, we've seen floods in Queensland, Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia, with the ACT and the Northern Territory on high alert. This is, in fact, the whole country that is being affected by the climate emergency. And these have been some of the worst recorded floods we've seen in our history, with some of the areas like, um, on the East Coast, like Lismore, that have been flooded multiple times. Researchers have confirmed that climate change is making this worse. This is what climate change looks like, and with the Labor government continue to put money into fossil fuel projects and opening up new land and waters for exploration, approving new projects or allowing for any more expansion to these, it's only going to get worse. You can't put the fire out while you're pouring more fuel onto it. And this government is moving away from coal ever so slowly, which is a welcome move, but it needs to happen faster. More importantly, it cannot be replaced with a reliance on gas. The previous government very misleadingly marketed their gas-led recovery during COVID as climate action. And gas is a fossil fuel. Gas is just as dirty as coal. So moving away from coal to gas is in fact not climate action. Recently, the parliament passed Labor's climate change bill to legislate their 43 per cent emissions reduction target. And the opening or expansion of one fossil fuel project will actually blow this target. We know that carbon capture and storage has not yet been proven to work at the scale that's needed to justify opening up these new projects, despite fossil fuel companies continually claiming that they will be able to offset their emissions, in fact, with these pro projects. So at some point we need to say, enough, no more new coal and gas. The Greens believe it's time, as do the United Nations, the International Energy Agency, our brothers and sisters in the Pacific Islands and thousands of people who consistently protested against the opening of new fossil fuel projects and the lack of substantive climate action. At what point will the major parties finally join the rest of us? Will it be once the fossil fuel corporations have destroyed our whole country? 
drawn out every drop of oil, every gram of coal, or until they don't have any more money left to donate to the major parties. Because let's be honest, since 2012, both the major parties have accepted over 8.2 million from coal, gas and oil companies. And in return, they get grants, they get exemptions and they get approvals. The major parties are too scared to take the real climate actions that's needed because they might lose some precious money. So they do the bidding of these fossil fuel companies and then roll out parliament and into high paid jobs with, in fact, the same companies. This is state capture. The major parties, therefore, and therefore the government is captured by these fossil fuel companies and their interests, not those of the public. We simply cannot let the market dictate when it's time to move on from fossil fuels. These companies will do whatever they can to line their pockets. And we've heard Minister Husick talk about Team Greed or Team Australia, in fact, a minister from, from the National Cabinet of the current government. Because what he knows and what we know is they don't care about us. They don't care about our planet. They don't care about the traditional owners, land and sea country they are destroying. They don't care about the farmers' lands that they are inhabiting, and all they care about is their profit. So right now there are 114 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline, and if these are allowed to continue, we will see more flooding, more fires, more droughts and more storms. The weather will become increasingly unpredictable and unruly. This will impact on our food supply chains. Our crops will get too much water or not enough. Generational farmers who have worked so hard to bring us the products we know and love will, yield, will see yields decrease. Small farming communities will be devastated. Areas will become unlivable because they're either too hot or, in fact, they are underwater. Right across Australia and, indeed, the world, life as we know it will become impossible. The Beedley project alone will increase Australia's 2020 emissions by 13 per cent. The Barossa gas field used some of the most dirtiest gas in the world. Scarborough's annual emissions will be the equivalent of 15 coal power stations. They're all climate bombs that the government can't justify setting off because it's just one of the 114 of those projects that's currently in the pipeline. One of these projects alone is enough to blow the government's 43 per cent emissions reduction target and our commitments under the Paris Agreement. If all of these projects go ahead, our emissions will rise by, in fact, a third. Beyond the destruction that Labor's position will continue opening up new coal and gas will cause to our climate, it will also destroy the environment. And these projects will put unique species that are found nowhere else in the world at risk, and they will threaten birds, animals, mammals, big and small, reptiles and other animals that call Australia home. Offshore projects that put, will also put our pristine coastlines, our reefs, our marine parks, our giant kelp forests at risk, both directly through the risk of spills and the disruption from noise and lights, but also indirectly from the rising acidity of the ocean that we are seeing as the climate changes. These changes are disrupting migration patterns, breeding cycles and the delicate balance of nature as it's given rise to the immense diversity we see on this planet. That is all at risk and, indeed, much of it's already gone. Further, every single coal, gas and oil project, either currently opening, operating or in the pipeline, is on unceded lands. Many, like the vast majority of these projects, don't have free, prior and informed consent. And you've heard me talk about this many times here in this chamber. And the, the relevant traditional owners will tell you that they don't provide that consent or that it's manufactured. And we saw this in the recent Tiwi case. Some of these companies don't even consider consulting with traditional owners as being necessary because they're not seen as relevant people. And since colonisation, Cultural, uh, First Nations cultural heritage has been under threat. We've lost sacred sites that hold hundreds of generations of knowledge and spirit. My heart breaks every time I have to see the footage of the Jukun Caves. And even worse, it doesn't even seem like we've learned from these disasters as more cultural sites are under threat. Take, for example, the Murujuga rock art 
It's the oldest in the world and is currently under threat. Now, what I want you mob to understand is that you seriously need to consider whether you're willing to throw away this history and cultural heritage that we as a nation should be proud of. We should be, in fact, rushing to protect it instead of placing it under threat just to appease a mining company. And we know this is happening right across this country. First Nations people are having their cultural heritage stolen, sold off, destroyed by these mining companies. Now, I want you to ask yourself, is this really the legacy that you want to leave here in the parliament? You could send a clear message to First Nations people across the country that you respect our voices, our cultural heritage, by refusing any of these projects to continue. And you could do that today, and you can do that, in fact, without a referendum. Approving these 114 projects has so many implications, and it's the social licence for these companies which is rapidly dwindling. The government needs to listen to the people that are supposed, they're supposed to be representing and not a handful of fossil fuel companies, that they will do everything in their power to make sure that they can keep destroying our climate, our environment, our First Nations cultural heritage and our way of life in this country. This government and previous governments' failures to listen to the science—in fact, we saw no investment in science in this budget will impact on each and every one of us, and we will continue to remind them that we will not stand by and allow this to happen without a fight. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Tomorrow, the Albanese government will introduce a bill to address the greatest challenge Australia faces, the decade of systematic wage decline that the Liberal national governments have inflicted upon Australian workers. The real wages of Australian workers are lower today than they were when the coalition took government in 2013. It is an unprecedented in Australian history that any government has overseen such a sustained period of wage decline. It means that the Australian middle class is shrinking. It means that we are in danger of leaving less to our children than was left to us by our parents. The worst part of it is that it wasn't by accident or even incompetence. The decade of wage decline was intentional. Former Finance Minister Matthias Cormann said it himself when he went on television and said that low wage growth is a deliberate feature of the Liberals' economic strategy. And the Liberals and Nationals haven't changed. Earlier this year, they opposed a $1 an hour pay rise for the lowest paid workers in Australia, a pay rise that Labor and the trade union movement fought for and won. And as we speak, the Liberal and National opposition have announced they will oppose the bill that will be introduced tomorrow. They are opposing Labor's bill to grow wages and boost job security before they have even seen it. The mere notion that Labor wants to grow wages is enough for Mr Dutton to say he can't support it. Opposing wages, opposing job security, opposing workers' rights is in their blood. There are many members and senators from the Liberal and National parties who are from a different background to the vast majority of Australians. I won't say everyone on the benches opposite falls into that category, but there is a lot that do. Too many come from the background and life experience of privilege and have no idea about the real pressures working people face. They don't know what it's like to be living paycheck to paycheck. They don't know what it's, what it's like to know, not know when your next shift will come. They don't know what it's like to be bullied by your boss, to be told you can't join your union, to be told that if you agitate for a pay rise that you'll lose your job. That's why they're so comfortable opposing any reforms that will grow wages. That's why they are so comfortable having a deliberate low-wage agenda that inflicts so much pain and hardship on working families, because they don't value the importance of secure work or the value of decent and consistent wage. That is what the government bill is about addressing. That the bill that will be introduced tomorrow is about raising wages. 
It's about ending the decade of decline in living standards. It's about ensuring people live and work with dignity and be treated with respect. And it's about making real improvements to gender equity in Australia. It's about ending the thuggish and bullying intimidation of union officials by politicising discredited regulators. Now, it's true that the government cannot just snap its fingers and give everyone a pay rise and a secure job. But what we can do is give people the power to bargain fairly for those basic rights. Our bargaining system is broken. It isn't designed to fail. It's designed to fail. You don't need to make, take my word for it, of course. The decade of wage decline speaks for itself. The rapid rise of insecure work speaks for itself. For too long, Australian workers have been powerless to stand up for their own rights. For too long, our laws have divided workers and prevented them from having a collective say over their wages and conditions. And Australia is an outlier among developed nations in that workers with a shared interest cannot bargain together if they are split across different employers. In many comparable countries, workers can bargain together through multi-employer bargaining. In Germany and France, Switzerland and Belgium, Sweden, the Netherlands, Denmark and Finland, Norway and Austria, just to name a few just to give a few examples. In those countries, multi-employer bargaining has helped their workers avoid the sustained declines that Australian workers have suffered. Indeed, for many years in Australia, multi-employer bargaining ensured decent wage increases and an ever-increasing standard of living for Australian workers and their families. Under our highly restrictive and current bargaining laws, we are going backwards. By banning multi-employer bargaining, we are in the company of countries like China, Russia and Iran, countries that do not respect the basic right of workers to have a collective voice at work. To continue on with the status quo would be to continue on the previous government's policy of deliberate low wages growth. We cannot continue on as we have done for the last decade. Australian workers are at a breaking point. I heard it time and time again during the job security inquiry just last year. Workers across every corner of the Australian economy came forward to share their stories, stories that were representative of millions of Australian workers. We heard from Cherie, an aged care worker who said she couldn't accompany her mother to her cancer appointments because she had to be constantly on call for her next shift. We heard from Nicholas, an academic stuck working as a casual for 20 years despite working the same shifts week in and week out. We heard from Rob, a mine worker who was told he would be transferred from his employer to a labour hire company with a 50 per cent pay cut while still doing the exact same job. We heard from Peter, a Qantas worker of 31 years, who was illegally sacked while he was on sick leave receiving chemotherapy for stage 5 prostate cancer. The Australian government has a duty. We all here have a duty to give Cherie, Nicholas, Rob and Peter the power to stand up for themselves and their mates at work. And that's why what this legislation will do. Now, over the coming weeks, we're going to face a full-funded and highly coordinated scare campaign against these reforms. The interests of a small few, the richest and most powerful in our society, will be promoted ad nauseum in the media and in the chamber by those opposite. Because these people have never once in their lives supported reforms that will improve the paying conditions of working Australians, whether it was the introduction of Medicare, superannuation, or the 40-hour week, or paid leave entitlements. Conservatives and some, of the and some in the employer groups have always told Australian workers that these reforms will somehow make their lives worse. They have always said it will cost jobs, it will kill innovation, it will hurt productivity. They have always said that it can't afford to pay workers a decent wage. And even now, when the share of income going to profits hits a record high and the share going to wages is a record low, these sham arguments have never stood up to scrutiny. 
Now, in the last few days alone, we've seen Alan Joyce, the highest paid CEO in Australia, who is best known for illegally sacking 2,000 people, in the media telling people they should be scared of multi-employer bargaining. Ironic when he has dozens upon dozens of his own companies that bargain for lower wages. So why would anyone listen to him on workers' rights? After a decade of wage decline and job security decline, Australia voted for a government that will stand up for their rights at work, a government that will stand up for secure jobs and fair pay, a government that will ensure that no one is left behind. These reforms can deliver on those commitments. The Australian people deserve better than an opposition that opposes them before they've even seen them. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. It's always good to be able to stand in this place and provide some good news to the chamber. And today I rise to do exactly that on a significant uh, milestone in the global fight against orphanage trafficking. Uh, earlier this month, I was honoured to represent the Australian Parliament at the 145th Interparliamentary Unions Conference hosted in Kigali, Rwanda. And this conference was first and foremost an, op an important opportunity for democratic parliaments to stand together in support of peace, democracy and the rule of law. But also at the conference, I took the opportunity to raise the issue of orphanage trafficking uh, with parliamentary colleagues from over 100 countries. And I did so because I believe this form of child trafficking and modern slavery is one that, to, by working together, we can reduce and, in fact, we can eradicate. Uh, the response of parliamentary colleagues from around the globe was immediate and it was positive. And I'm very proud to advise the Senate that the IPU Standing Committee on Democracy and Human Rights accepted my proposal for global parliaments to work together to stop the scourge of orphanage trafficking. And now, as the proposal's co-rapporteur, I will work to take this proposal through the IPU over the next 12 months. So the next step is for the Australian proposal to be put as a formal resolution to the committee's uh, next meeting uh, in Bahrain in March 2023. And if adopted in Bahrain, it will be debated in the committee for adoption at the next assembly in October uh, next year. And can I thank all of my parliamentary colleagues, both in this and in the other place, for their amazing support for this proposal. And in particular, uh, well, she's not here, but I warmly thank Senator Payman for submitting the proposal on my behalf and for her great passion and her persuasiveness uh, with this proposal. And of course, I must also thank our wonderful Senate staff who accompanied us on the trip. Uh, first of all, to the clerk assistant, who I note is here in the chamber at the moment, Ms Tony Machulik, and also Jane Thompson. Uh, not only did they provide terrific support to the delegation itself, but uh, the clerk assistant also provided uh, above and beyond support to shepherd this proposal through the uh, myriads of bureaucracy. And, and so I thank you very much uh, for that. So, colleagues, uh, for those of you who don't know what orphanage trafficking is, let me explain to you what it is. Uh, orphanage trafficking is a uniquely 21st century form of slavery, and it is also the perfect 21st century multi-billion dollar scam. Orphanage tourism is where well-meaning Australians and people from many other nations visit or volunteer in so-called orphanages. And by doing that, it is a key risk indicator for orphanage trafficking and a key vulnerability. Uh, it is now, sadly, one of the most effective and common means of profiting from the institutionalisation of children and is often and, in fact, most frequently associated with you know, many forms of child exploitation. Now, of course, not all children uh, in institutional care are trafficked, uh, nor are they exploited. But how is donors, but how are our volunteers and donors today to know the difference? In short, they cannot. And even so, even uh, if it is one of the few genuine uh, facilities, we know the damage that institutionalisation and orphanages do to our own children, which is why we have stopped doing that. But for some reason, we still rush to support the institutionalisation of other people's children. 
At its most basic, orphanage trafficking is really an issue of supply and demand. The demand for orphaned children has been created by hundreds and thousands of volunteers and donors from donor source countries like Australia, who have both the desire and also the funds to support so-called orphaned children in what we call donor recipient countries. So our demand is met by the supply through the removal of millions of children from vulnerable families, and over, well over 80 per cent of these children are not orphans, but they are from vulnerable and poor families. Many of these children are sourced by recruiters uh, through false pretenses and also by deceiving the children's parents, sometimes by the offer of money, but often by a very powerful but simple promise to parents that they will give their children a better life than the parents can themselves. The tragedy then proceeds because many of these children are then what's called paper orphaned. So this is they're provided with new identity papers, hence paper orphans, and they're given a new orphan identity. They are placed in a so-called orphanage, often very far from home so their parents can't find them. They're not visible to the state authorities, either as the institution themselves or the children. Uh, they are invisible to a child protection uh, and any other state uh, oversight. And sadly, most of them never ever see their families again. Typically in these facilities, they live in substandard conditions. They receive little education and are deliberately poorly fed. This is because the combination of that is designed to elicit our sympathy and uh, much larger donations from volunteers and also donors. These kids are often subject to the most appalling forms of child labour, of sexual exploitation and domestic servitude, because ultimately these children are commodities for profit. So it is really the perfect scam, I think, for three compelling but three equally shocking reasons. Firstly, because millions of people find the narrative of assisting poor orphans, they find it so compelling that they are ready to open their wallets and their hearts. But unfortunately, so often we do that without undertaking due diligence on either the home we're looking to support or the individual children themselves. And volunteers and donors all too often just assume somebody else has done that checking for them. Secondly, it's a perfect scam because people in donor source countries, i.e. Australia, seem unaware of the dissonance between having in Australia phased out orphanages and these group homes, i.e. congregate care for children. So we've done that for our own children because we understand the damage it does to our own children. Yet the dissonance is that we are in record numbers flocking to support the institutionalisation of other people's children simply because they are poor. And um, thirdly, it is a perfect scam because nobody, nobody wants to believe that instead of helping orphan children, which is what they thought they were doing, they have actually paid for the trafficking and the exploitation of those very children they believed they were helping. And not only that, they and their children, who they often send uh, to these facilities, have it, you know, these photos of these kids they do not know all over their Instagram accounts, you know, saying, isn't this fabulous? I've been there and I've helped poor orphans. Now, I first learnt about this uh, trade in children in Cambodia on a parliamentary trip in 2016. And needless to say, it caused me a great deal of dissonance and concern. Uh, and I've been passionately pursuing this issue since then to get global and domestic recognition. Since then, I'm very proud that Australia has taken the lead in this. Uh, the orphanage, tourism, orphanage tourism was first recognised as a risk for modern slavery in the Glo Global Slavery Index in 2016. And uh, since 2017, it's been recognised by the US State Department in the Trafficking the Tip report. Uh, in 2018, I was incredibly proud then as the Assistant Minister for Home Affairs to take the first modern slavery legislation through this place, uh, which was be we became the first parliament globally to recognise orphanage trafficking as a form of modern slavery. 
So, in conclusion, how as parliamentarians can we help to assist stop this trade? Firstly, those of us in donor countries who have caused this form of modern slavery and the trafficking of these children, we must stop the demand. We do that by highlighting this issue and changing the behaviours of donors and volunteers. Don't just blindly go and support uh, these facilities. Look for programs that support children in their own homes or in another home in their own communities so they can be raised by their family or another family in their local communities. And secondly, in the donor recipient nations, we have to seek ways for donors to support programs that, again, um, support their families staying together. Uh, the good news is we already have a lot of tools at our disposal, and I look forward to keeping this chamber updated on our progress. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Brighton's getting a walk-in health clinic. We pushed so hard for this through the election campaign. So a huge shout out to my buddy Troy Fitzner, who ran with us for Lions. He was out there pushing to get better health care for his hometown way before the campaign started. The member for Lyons might have only picked it up a few weeks before polling day, but hey, we're happy to run the country for Labor. No problem. Our volleys and our candidates were out there for months, calling for better health care for everyone in Brighton and the Derwent Valley. You guys feel Tasmania's doctor shortages as bad as anyone. We've seen medical centres in New Norfolk close their books to new patients. Doctors are quitting and moving away. You can't get in to see a GP if you come down with a fever on a weekend. Too bad if you've got a temperature on a Saturday night. You're on your own. We only look after sick people during business hours. That's why we came out with the idea for walking clinics in TAS last year. Here's a little secret for you. We got the idea from Canberra. There are walking clinics up here in the ACT. They've been around for years. Canberrans can walk into an urgent care clinic here and get help for cuts, burns and broken bones. You don't have to wait for hours. You don't have to pay a cent. You get the help you need, and Canberra's hospitals and doctors' offices have one less person to see. We saw that. We knew it was what Tassie needed. We need to find a middle ground between going to a GP or going to the hospital. And I'll pay credit to the government where it's due. They saw it too. I'm glad they're getting started. I only hope we go a bit further than what Labor's bookmarked so far. The budget sets aside $1.6 million to set up the Brighton Centre, but there's nothing after that. It always makes me nervous when governments hand over money for one year and one year only. This thing will need staying power. We'll need to give support to the doctors and nurses who work there. We want them to choose to stay and make Brighton their home. Right now, GPs and nurses aren't choosing to stay. We can't get people to move out of the city and come to the country. Areas that are crying out for health care. This thing cannot work if we don't fix that. It's no good having a nice building if you can't fill it with people to do the work. I'm also worried that Labor says this thing is only going to be open for extended business hours, running until 6 or 7 p.m. at night. It won't be good enough. I want it to go late into the night. You don't get to control when your kid gets sick. You can't help it if you wake up with chest pains and need help right away. You shouldn't have to wait to go in and see someone. Extended business hours isn't enough. The last thing I want to see is for Labor to follow through on its promise to bring three urgent care clinics to our state. This walking clinic in Brighton would be a good spot for the first. I want to see the other two set up by the end of next year. And here's two spots for consideration. One, Launceston. The Launceston General Hospital has the worst wait times in the country. In 2020, there were 9,000 patients in Lonnie Hospital who waited for longer than it's safe to wait. In one case, a grandfather with pneumonia sat in a plastic chair for nine hours because there were no free beds for him to lie down. A free urgent care centre in Lonnie would give people somewhere else to go. It would take pressure off the A&E and give people help when they need help. The other place we need an urgent care centre on the northwest coast, well, it's on the northwest coast, sorry. You cannot get in to see a doctor in Burnie right now. The books are packed. If you can't afford to pay out of your own pocket, you'll be waiting even longer to get an appointment. We need free options for people. Right now, people are putting off treatment and it's only making things worse. 
Senator Lambie and I will make sure Tasmania gets its due when it comes to our health care. We have the lowest number of doctors per capita, and our hospitals are falling to pieces. Let's hope we can all turn a new leaf um, in the health care industry, starting with the announcement yesterday. Thanks. Senator Still. Yeah, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Look, it gives me great uh, privilege to rise today to talk about something very passionate to me. And uh, it is heavy vehicle rest areas or truck bays. Now, a lot of people in, in suburban Australia would have no idea what I'm even talking about. But these are, oh, they can take all shapes and sizes, but they're normally uh, parking bays on the side of the road. You'll see a blue sign. Some of them may have a bit of bitumen, some may have a bit of lighting. If you're really lucky in Western Australia, some of them you might even get a rubbish bin. If you're really lucky, if you're in the Kimberley, don't hold your breath on it. But I have to say that these are such an important part of our national infrastructure. This is where our heroes, our heroes of the pandemic, and we had many heroes from the shop assistants, the nurses and the medical staff, but our trucking heroes who kept this nation going. And I have to tell you, if I, if I sat down and told you the way our truckies were treated, in the early days of the pandemic, you wouldn't believe that this would happen in 2022 in Australia. It got to the stage where they were treated like lepers. Our truckies that are delivering the food, the fuel, the building materials, the medicines, everything you consume, everything you wear, everything you touch and everything you see has been on the back of a truck at one stage, at least once twice, three, sometimes eight or nine, ten times. Look at the cardigan you might be wearing or the Ugg boots you've got on. Imagine how many trips those Uggies have taken. From the first start of off where there was food going to the farm, there was the sheep being shorn. Do I have to keep going? You understand where I'm going on this? Once it's gone through the manufacturing system, once it's gone through the retail system, we are indebted to our truck drivers. They are heroes, not just in the pandemic, but our truckies are true life Aussie heroes, and they should be absolutely supported at every turn. Sadly, over the years they haven't, and sadly over the years, and I've seen a terrible decline in the availability of truck bays and rest areas for our truckies. It's got to the stage where we have bureaucrats and we have state governments building truck bays in places where they think the truck drivers get tired where they think the truck drivers might pull over. We haven't even had the absurdity of going back in the days when I was on the road, if you were delivering in Melbourne or delivering in Sydney and you got in there late at night, you'd park somewhere in the industrial area where you were going to unload. Well, now our truckies can't even do that because the Gestapos in the councils now kick them off, waking up, banging on their doors. Now they'll have eyes that felt like they'd been stabbed by hot prongs. And these people are banging on their doors, telling them, move, get out of here. They want the freight. I can't wait to get the freight and they're treating our truckies terribly. But I've got to tell you, there's a good side of this, there's a really happy side. During the election, I know that I committed with, Minister, with Shadow Minister King at the time $80 million to build new truck bays. Well, the Australian government, I'm very happy to say in this place, is providing, there's two tranches, $65 million per year through the Heavy Vehicle Safety and Productivity Program, which provides funding to infrastructure projects that improve productivity and safety outcomes of heavy vehicle operations across Australia, including rest areas for truck drivers. More than 90 per cent of projects delivered through this program will be in regional areas. It gets better. I'm very happy to report that the government is also delivering on our election commitment of the $80 million top up, on top of it, dedicated to funding heavy vehicle rest areas. This funding is in addition to the $60 million I've already announced uh, to be set aside for the uh, uh, fund rest areas and supplements the existing HVSPP program. So that means all up the Australian government, the Albanese government, is delivering no less and committed, and will do it, over $140 million towards rest areas for our truckies. $140 million. And it gets even better. Not only did we promise it, not only are we going to deliver it, but part of the election promise was that our government said it would do something that no other government in this nation has ever done. We're going to actually sit down with the truckies. We're going to sit down with the men and women who have their hands on the steering wheel day in and day out, those dedicated heroes that deliver everything we rely on, from the farm to the paddock to the stores to the ports 
to the shopping centres six, seven, eight, nine times. The truckies are going to sit with us and the truckies are going to tell us where they get tired, where they need these rest areas. And God help us, we're going to start talking about fit for purpose. I am so wrapped as an ex truckie I'm still a truckie. I'm so wrapped for someone who still does half a dozen triple road trains between Perth and Kananara and Broome every year. Senator I'm looking still, forward to this I, one. Uh, I'm reluctant to interrupt your passion, but your time has expired. Senator Smith, you have the call. I rise to speak on the sad passing and also the very significant life contributions of a great Australian. Sir David Smith. Sir David died in August at the age of 89. For many, both here in Australia and around the world, he will most often be remembered as the man on the steps at Old Parliament House on Remembrance Day in 1975. He was there in his role as the official secretary to the Governor-General. On that occasion, many people's image of the Whitlam dismissal are now part of Australian folklore. Sir David read the Governor-General's proclamation dissolving Parliament. He was immediately followed by Gough Whitlam, who delivered the famous line, well may we say God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor-General. While the events of 1975 would immortalise Malcolm Fraser, Sir John Kerr and Gough Whitlam, each in very different ways, Sir David Smith would go on to outlast them all. He was born in Melbourne in 1933 and educated at Princes Hill State School and Scotch College. He later attended Melbourne University and the Australian National University. He began his career as a public servant in 1953, becoming private secretary to the Minister for Interior and Works in 1958 and remaining until 1963. Sir David was then appointed secretary to the Federal Executive Council and sub subsequently secretary to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet serving between 1971 and 1973. It was in this year that he was made official secretary to the then Governor-General, His Excellency, His Excellency Sir Paul Hasluck, who hailed from my home state of Western Australia. What is remarkable is that Sir David continued in the role until 1990. In that time, he served five Governors-General of Australia, being Sir Paul Hasluck, Sir John Kerr, Sir Zelman Cowan, Sir Ninian Stephen and Bill Hayden. It was an outstanding record and one of consummate, discreet and unfailing service. Sir David went on living here in Canberra where, in a voluntary capacity, he often led guided tours at Old Parliament House. This symbolised his deep appreciation and respect for Australia's institutions. He was later appointed a visiting fellow in the Faculty of Law at the Australian National University for 1998 and 1999 and was a member of the 1998 Constitutional Convention. An avered monarchist and constitutionalist, Sir David never entertained any doubt about the actions taken in 1975. Significantly, he also refused to be defined by those events, despite the personal abuse he sometimes endured following them. According to the ABC, in his diary entry regarding the dis dismissal, it simply read, Fuel. What a day. But he never wavered from his beliefs. He argued the Governor-General was Australia's de facto head of state and was not required to involve the Queen in his decisions, but merely inform her. This view would be vindicated. The smoking gun long sought by Republicans, that of Governor-General Sir John Kerr and the late Queen, allegedly colluding to sack Gough Whitlam, failed to materialise when the National Archives handed over correspondence between them. Sir David became a leading voice for the constitutional monarchist cause during the Republic debates of the 1990s. Many of his intellectual arguments for monarchy have still not received any serious response from those that advocate a republic. I was greatly honoured to have attended the memorial service for Sir David and all that he represented last month. Also there were many other great Australians, among them former Prime Minister John Howard. Simple and profound is a fitting tribute to someone who meant a great deal to me personally and to the causes I hold dearly. Sir David is survived by Lady Smith and their three sons, Richard, Michael and Philip, to whom I again pay my respects and sympathy. A remarkably great man, a man whose contributions 
will last for a very long time yet. Senator Alman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak today about the crisis in funding in our public schools. Private schools' funding across the forward estimates will now be $1.7 billion more than the amount Scott Morrison committed in his final budget. Would a senator just remind you to use the correct title from members in the other place? Uh -huh. Thank you. As a proportion of total funding, private school funding is growing and public funding, or funding for public schools is shrinking. The government's budget has moved Australia even further away from reaching 100 per cent of the minimum schooling resource standard for our public schools. And a greater proportion of federal funding for schools is now going to private schools worse than the previous government. Over $70 billion for private schools over the next four years compared to only $45 billion for public schools. Labor has clearly given up on fighting for a fair education system and it's completely disgraceful. At a time when our public schools are in dire need of adequate resourcing and upgrades, this additional funding simply cannot be justified. Public money should be for public schools. It is not justifiable that private schools are receiving ever-increasing funds when public schools are consistently under-resourced and struggling to get the money that they need to make basic improvements to school amenities. Now, Some people will rightly point out that there are small Catholic schools that are hard done by and could use more funding, but let me be clear. Poor and struggling non-government schools are the result of funding decisions made by the private sector in how they distribute funds. We provide huge sums to each state's block grant authority, which are run by Catholic or independent education, effectively outsourcing and privatising the accountability function. This has led to a massive inequity between the large, well-resourced and extremely expensive private schools and the poor, low-fee Catholic schools that service some low-income communities. Yet, despite the huge amount of money that governments are providing to private schools, both in general funding and as Capital Works grants, the average independent school has raised their fees by over 50 per cent in the last decade, and some have raised them by as much as 80 per cent. So much for the idea that funding private schools relieves fee pressure on paying parents. I understand the value of the work that public school teachers do, and I recognise the complexity of their work. I have been a teacher for almost 30 years, and prior to joining the Senate, I was a high school teacher at Gladstone State High School. I have seen firsthand how the current system is failing our public school students and their teachers. I have seen firsthand the ever-increasing pressures placed on teachers and the lack of funding that they are given to meet the challenges of more and more work with less and less. I have experienced the continual frustration in not being able to fund the programs for the students at my public school while the private school down the road got more public money per student than mine did. How can that be right? No other country in the developed world pumps as much money into their private school system as Australia does. We are an outlier. And it's costing us our kids' future, and the inequality gap is getting wider and wider. This is the last chance for public schooling in Australia. It's 10 years since Gonski. If we don't reverse this trend, we are giving up on equity in Australian education. I won't give up on our public school teachers, their students and their families. They deserve nothing less than a world-class public education system, and it's time the Labor government started fighting for that too. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Nine years 
under the LNP government have set a very low bar. So Labour's budget is better than we've had for a long time. But there is so much more that could have and should have been done to support people and provide the services that they so desperately need, especially in the backdrop of the cost of living crisis. This budget is not the change people were hoping for or waiting for since they voted for a different parliament at the May election. It is shocking and shameful that in a wealthy country like Australia, millions of people are suffering and struggling under poverty. These are not just numbers. They are real people living in our communities, in our cities, in our towns, in our suburbs, in our streets. These are our neighbours, they are our friends. Yet, this budget does nothing to support them. What is even more offensive and obscene is that this budget, Labour's first budget, locks in $254 billion of Stage 3 tax cuts for billionaires, for politicians and for the wealthiest. Labour did not find it difficult to deliver these billions on a platter to those who least need it. But they very easily chose not to raise job seeker above the poverty line. They chose not to put dental and mental health into Medicare. They chose not to make early learning universal and free and improve wages and conditions for educators. They chose not to support university workers who are striking across the country because they are undervalued and they are disrespected. This budget fails young people and women across the country who are disproportionately impacted by the cost of living crisis, the housing crisis and the climate crisis. We had hoped that Labour had pinched our policy of one million affordable public and community homes. But theirs is a house of cards that funds 10,000 dwellings in reality, with the rest left up to the whims of the developers. They pinched the slogan, but sadly, not the substance. The consequences of Labour's choices is that now, everyday people are left to make the really heartbreaking choices that's where the difficulty in choices lies, not the choices that Labour had. That was a pretty easy decision. And now everyday people are left to make these really difficult choices between paying the power bill or putting food on the table, going to the dentist or paying the rent, turning on heating in winter or cooling in summer or buying school uniforms for their children. Budgets are there. They should be there to improve the well-being of people. They should be providing cost of living relief and increased support. But those on the lowest incomes are the hardest hit with this budget, while those at the top end of town get massive tax cuts and corporations are allowed to keep on profiteering with no holds barred. Labour has made the choice to continue at least $40 billion in fossil fuel subsidies including $1.9 billion to expand the gas industry. They have chosen to exacerbate and accelerate the climate crisis. This is unconscionable at a time when climate change is biting here and across the globe. Record rainfalls and dangerous floods are wreaking havoc yet again on our communities. <clears throat> our communities who have recently borne the brunt of such disasters already. Sure, there are some good measures in the budget, but they are just small tweaks here and there, not the transformational reform that we need at this time. This is not the budget for the times we are in. This is not a budget that people expected, and it's definitely not the budget that our environment needs. Labour still has the choice of working with the Greens to axe the tax cut for the wealthy, to end new coal and gas mines, to freeze rents, to put dental and mental health into Medicare, to scrap student debt, and to raise the rate of job seeker. That's not a difficult decision.
but it sure is a moral and a responsible one. By agreement of the Whip, Senator Ciccone will take us through to 1.30. You have the call. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, last night we heard uh, the Federal Government Treasurer, uh, Jim Chalmers, deliver his first budget and delivered a solid and sensible budget, uh, one that delivers for the Australian people where the Australian people had voted for the Labor government. Uh, our plan will help not just tackle the cost of living, but also deliver real important local community infrastructure. And uh, this is why I'll take the opportunity while I have here in the Senate for the next two minutes to talk about uh, the critical infrastructure programs that have been funded by the Albanese Labor government in the electorate of Deakin. Um, of course, I'm not going to attempt to go through all the details of the budget uh, in the two minutes that I have, uh, Senator Canavan, but I did uh, want to touch on a couple of budget commitments that are important to the communities uh, in the electorate of Deakin and want to also acknowledge on the record the, the hard work, the dedication, the, the champion of these projects by uh, our candidates in the last election. Unfortunately, wasn't successful, but uh, Matt Gregg, an outstanding individual, who was not just passionate, but really committed and, and lives in the electorate, thrives in the electorate, and is one that really has a connection and I think deserves recognition for the hard work uh, that he did in the lead up to the last election. Uh, the budget that was delivered last night delivers on our election commitment for a $5 million wellbeing precinct in Croydon. This precinct will deliver safe, modern spaces for community groups to meet and connect existing services in Croydon. Our budget also delivers $500,000 for new sports field lighting at Croydon Park Oval. Clubs include Croydon Football Club, Croydon Cricket Club and the Croydon Netball Club have done a fantastic job uh, in increasing participation in community sport, particularly amongst juniors and women. This lighting is essential to ensuring that they can accommodate increased participation. The government has also allocated $1 million to redevelop the Forest Hill Reserve, where there is also demand for facilities to allow more junior and women's sports. Labor is also making a, a $3.5 million investment in an undercover basketball court at the local Croydon Primary School. This will obviously be of great utility to the school, but importantly to be shared with the wider community. There is huge demand for basketball facilities in Victoria, particularly in the eastern suburbs, and these are great examples of how Labor is delivering for our community. Thank you. The Senate will now move to two-minute statements. I call Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Later today, a billboard will go live in Rockhampton with the words, Start the projects. Stop ALP politics. Rockhampton needs the ring road to proceed. This has been organised by local Rockhampton businesses who are furious with the Prime Minister about his broken promise on the Rockhampton ring road. In 2019, Anthony Albanese issued a press release titled, Rockhampton ring road, a certainty under Labor. And Mr Albanese also came to Rockhampton, sprouting the fact that he had made an $800 million commitment for the ring road. Earlier this year, the state government went out to tender on the road, and many local businesses started gearing up to be involved in the biggest road project in regional Queensland. Those businesses have spent thousands of dollars on the expectation that they could believe the Prime Minister's word. Last night, they found out that the only certainty is that the Prime Minister will break his promises. The Rockhampton Ring Road would have been a game changer for our nation. The Bruce Highway goes straight through Rockhampton, so all trucks going north and south get held up in the local traffic. You can easily be held up for 30 minutes or more at the wrong time of day. The Ring Road would have cut living costs for all because it would cut the cost of getting beef, pineapples, uh, bananas and other great Queensland produce to our shops. Now the government blames cost increases for their broken promise on the Ring Road. But how is it that only projects in regional areas of our country face the chop? This government is giving billions of dollars of more to help Dan Andrews get re-elected, but they do not seem to care about the increasing traffic and delays in our growing country towns. It is especially galling for the people of central Queensland when it is the wealth of our beef and our coal that props up this budget, and we don't even get a basic thank you from the Prime Minister. 
This morning, Anthony Albanese claimed that I want to restore faith in our political system. Well, Prime Minister, you do not restore faith by breaking faith with people. You do not restore faith by deluding them into thinking they could believe your words. Do what you promised and make the Rockhampton Ring Road a certainty. Senator Ciccone. No, no we're, going we're going to the next one. Uh, that will be Senator Stilljohn. Uh, ADHD significantly impacts the lives of around uh, one in 20 Australians, and yet it remains fundamentally misunderstood. The medical profession fails to recognise it properly, and last night's budget particularly totally failed uh, to recognise it properly. All month, my office has been running a survey asking people uh, with ADHD to share their experiences um, with a diagnosis and with care in our healthcare system. With more than 10,000 responses and still counting, I'd like to share uh, with you some of the outcomes of that, of that work and particularly some of its more distressing figures. More than 63% of respondents who suspect that they have ADHD said that cost is the reason that they haven't been formally diagnosed. More than half uh, worry that medical professionals won't take their ADHD concerns seriously, and over 82 per cent of respondents identify as women, non-binary or gender-fluid people. Now, this tells us that cost and the lack of training are the biggest barriers to ADHD diagnosis, and that these barriers impact women and LGBTIQA plus folks the most. We know how to address this because 92 per cent of respondents told us how. Add ADHD diagnosis and support to Medicare. Such insights are why direct community engagement is so important, and I want to sincerely thank everyone who completed the survey. The ADHD community deserves better. The Greens hear this call loud and clear, and we are here to demand thank you. better thank you, Senator alongside them. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you. Acting Deputy President, the Tamer Valley in Tasmania's north is home to a successful wine growing area and a multitude of agribusinesses. <laughs> But this fertile region is also where the Tamer Valley Writers' Festival is based. Promoted as an event to inspire the Tamer Valley Writers' Festival recently hosted on the 14th to the 17th of October, authors, poets, playwrights, journalists, comedians, songwriters, filmmakers, editors and storytellers from Tasmania and across Australia. A carefully curated program of conversations, panels, tours, workshops and performances were assembled around the theme, The Good Life. Some in the chamber may remember a BBC series called The Good Life and featuring Felicity Kendall and Richard Breers about a couple embracing self-sufficiency, while others might be more familiar with social researcher Hugh McKay's book, where he challenges readers to consider what makes life worth living. However, the Tamer Valley Writers' Festival theme is somewhere in between. Attendees were encouraged to look beyond the multitude of cancelled events that punctuated the COVID-19 pandemic and embrace hope for a community built around a love of words, stories and ideas. The festival was produced by a team of dedicated volunteers sharing their passion for reading, writing and thinking with like-minded people. This event started as the Festival of Golden Words in 2014 in Beaconsfield, referencing the town's gold mine. Now the festival has evolved, spanning multiple locations on both sides of the Tamer, challenging people to think about exciting, difficult and provocative topics while also encouraging emerging writers and thinkers via its short stay competition, story competition and a collaborative one-day workshop program with the University of Tasmania. The Tamer Valley Writers' Festival was another opportunity for Northern Tasmania to show just how amazing this part of our state is. This event provided a welcome taste of the good life and showed a strong appetite for community events post-pandemic. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The death of Masa Amini has shocked the world, but it probably hasn't surprised it, because we know that women in Iran live daily in a regime that clearly does not see or value them as equal. The reports we are hearing out of Iran speak of actions that are horrific and indefensible. 
The Australian government has repeatedly called on Iran to cease its brutal oppression of peaceful protests. Today I rise in this chamber to express my solidarity with women living in Iran. With Masa Amini, or Gina Amini, if we use the name that reflects her proud heritage and culture. I rise in support of their struggle for equality and empowerment. I rise in support of their fight for their human rights. I rise in support of their enduring bravery and courage. I rise in support of their right to peaceful protest. These women and girls have the right to be heard and they have the right to be safe. Far away here in Australia, we hear you and support you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Later today, I will be moving an attendance motion. This motion will call on Senator Thorpe to attend this chamber and give a full explanation why she, as a voting member of the Law Enforcement Committee, didn't disclose a personal relationship she had at the time with the former president of an outdoor bikie gang while the committee was providing members with sensitive information about outlaw bikie gangs. Senator Thorpe admitted she and Mr Martin communicated via the encrypted communications app Signal and deleted messages to each other once a week. Her staff strongly advised her to inform the committee and to inform Greens leader Adam Band, but she ignored their advice and concealed the relationship. Her staff took it upon themselves to inform Mr Band's office. I acknowledge and accept the decision of this chamber to refer Senator Thorpe to the Privileges Committee. However, don't the people of Australia have the right to a full explanation on the floor of Parliament? Don't the Australian people deserve that Senator Thorpe be held accountable for the obvious and naked contempt that she has for this parliament and most of you sitting in it? Call me cynical or a sceptic or just plain logical, but I am concerned the Privileges Committee will keep this matter behind closed doors and that Labor senators who need the Greens' support for their agenda will protect Senator Thorpe. If you're not willing for her to give a full explanation here, then you are not only failing the Australian people, you are sending out a message the Senate is a protection racket and you will further undermine public trust and confidence in this parliament. I'm sure many Greens cringe when Senator Thorpe opens her mouth and they all have greater political acumen than she does, so it makes me wonder if her appointment as a Senate deputy leader was pure tokenism. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Davey. Thank you. I rise to note the passing of a stalwart of the Nationals. A self-described 10-pound pom, his decades-long contribution to our party began when he left the ABC to join the staff of then Transport Minister Peter Nixon in 1978. He continued till his passing just last week. From 1978 to 2000, he held a range of senior roles within the New South Wales and Federal Nationals, including being our longest serving federal director. He directly worked with five of our party leaders, from Doug Anthony to John Anderson. From 2000, he dedicated his time to chronicling the history of our party through writing eight books, including 90 Not Out, The Nationals from 1920 to 2010, and the Country Party Prime Minister's Trials and Tribulations, as well as writing regular columns in party publications. Importantly, in 2020, to celebrate our centenary, he published Milestones and Century of Achievement. In 2002, he was made a life member of the New South Wales Nationals. And this year, he was awarded the highest award in the Nationals, the Sir Earl Page Meritorious Service Award. His contribution was also externally recognised, and in 2019 he was appointed as a member of the Order of Australia for his service to politics, parliament and the nationals. Farewell, Paul Davey. Dad, rest in peace. Thank you very much, Senator, Pr uh, Senator Davey. Senator Pratt. At the beginning of the week, Monday, October 24, we had World Holio Day, an occasion aimed at drawing global attention to the importance of continued international commitment to polio eradication. I'm delighted that in our government budget there is a, four, sorry, a 
$43.5 million commitment to public-private partnership through the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, which has been going since uh, 1988, to eradicate polio worldwide. I want to acknowledge the work, tire, uh, the tireless work of people right around the globe uh, to this program, in particular the key role that Rotary Australia and Rotary globally has played in the eradication of polio viruses. Since the initiative began in 1988, cases have been reduced from some 350,000 a year to just six officially diagnosed last year. But often we think we are on the cusp of its eradication when more cases pop up with devastating impacts to those uh, um, affected. International organisations such as Global Citizen and Rotary have spearheaded the highly effective campaign to tackle this issue globally. I want to give a shout out to the legacy and history of this issue uh, back when local uh, activist Michael Cheldrick, who's gone on to work for Global Citizen, lobbied Prime Minister Gillard at Chogham uh, back in 2011. That turned into a $50 million pledge to the polio eradication effort back then. And today uh, I'm very Thank pleased you, and proud Senator Pratt. to acknowledge your, our current Your time has expired. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise for a 15-year-old First Nations child, Cassius Turvey. Cassius Turvey, a loved member of the Noongar community who ran his own lawn mowing business and would let community members decide how much they could pay him. On 13 October, Cassius was returning home from school when he was allegedly viciously beaten with a pole, passing away eight days later. When a First Nations child is born, they inherit and learn cultural wisdom, knowledge and strength. Our families gather and wrap our arms around our babies, knowing that they're our dreaming children. Their bloodline is their birthright. This is our children's land, their country, and they're guided by our ancestors. If only it were a reality that our children could live out their birthright in this country, that they would live a journey of peace, culturally and spiritually safe. No Aboriginal child should be robbed of their birthright in so-called Australia. Our dreaming child, Cassius, fell victim to a monster, a monster far greater than those that racially targeted and killed Cassius. The monster is the unresolved violent legacy of white Australia. To Cassius's family, friends and community, I'm sorry. To black Australia, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we are here again with yet another justice hashtag for the loss of another black life. No black child should fear walking home from school and no black mother should wonder if their child re should re will return home. We all must fight for a country where First Nations children, like Cassius, can live out their birthright. Cassius, may you rest as we rise and continue the fight. Senator Babette. Thank you. Now, when your foreign policy is being praised by terrorists, you might want to rethink it. And that's exactly what the Albanese government should do regarding their snap decision to no longer recognise West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The decision, announced by Foreign Minister Penny Wong, was, raised, was praised by Hamas, if you can believe it. Now, when a designated terror organisation says you've taken a step in the right direction, quote, it is a pretty indication that you've in fact gone in exactly the wrong direction. Now, the way in which this decision was made was shambolic. In fact, the Israeli Prime Minister described it as hasty. Now, now announcing this decision without any prior consultation with Israel was ill-considered at best. Now, every nation has the right to determine its own capital, and making an exception of Israel is discriminatory. 
Imagine if another, if another nation came here to Australia and refused to acknowledge Canberra as our nation's capital. Now, now the fact is that West Jerusalem has been recognised by Israel as its official capital for decades. It is the seat of its president, its parliament and its supreme court. It is the home of national monuments, including Israel's Yad Vashem, which is, a, which is a memorial to the Holocaust. Jerusalem has been the spiritual centre of Judaism for thousands of years, revered in the Old Testament and a holy city to Christians, Muslims, um, and Israel protects these sacred sites for all of us. Now, there was no need for the Albanese government to reverse Australia's recognition of West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Foreign policy cannot be determined on the fly. They've upset a long-standing ally, all while exciting terrorist groups. Let's reverse this reversal. Senator Bragg. Well, um, having looked through the budget documents last night, and if you look through budget paper two and the glossies, it's very strange that uh, the missing piece here is a plan to promote private investment and a plan to promote employment. Because, of course, we want to see policies where large and small businesses can look to employ more Australians, uh, and that that is missing and that that is not the centrepiece of the budget, I think speaks volumes of this government's distorted priorities uh, in our, uh, our government for vested interests that we have now in Australia. Of course, one of the great uh, contradictions here is the centrepiece, one of the centrepieces of the budget, which is this uh, housing compact or housing accord, uh, where effectively uh, we want to see, or this is the government speaking, the government want to see the big super funds own the houses uh, using people's super, but we don't want to see individuals using their own super to have a house. So it's a very distorted and twisted way of looking at the world, but uh, when you are run by vested interests and you conduct most of the business of the government in favour of vested interests, class action law firms, unions and super funds, I guess it's no surprise. So uh, a very regrettable outcome here. And to be honest, there's not much detail about how this money will be spent. If you go through budget paper two, uh, I'm sure many people will do that. Uh, you can't find where the 70 or uh, 140 million dollars will be going, other than to be sent off to the NIFIC. Uh, I imagine it's to fund some sort of uh, study or uh, some kind of examination about how the money, uh, more money, could be extracted, perhaps for uh, tax benefit purposes. And so ultimately, we need to keep a very close eye on this government and whether it will, in fact, provide more tax incentives for major super funds uh, to use the people's money for housing. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's been a really difficult few weeks for Tassie. Hundreds of homes and businesses have been hit hard by the floods. To everyone affected, my heart goes out to you, and Tammy, I'm here to help you with whatever you need, and we'll do whatever we can to help. Please don't be feel afraid to call. It's not going to be an easy road to recovery, and we also know you're just coming out of COVID, especially for small businesses, and that you're already feeling the bunt. Places like Wings Wildlife Park took a lot of damage. There were concrete slabs lifted by the water, crashing animal enclosures into each other. Echidnas clung to their wire walls until rescue could come. Their wildlife hospital is completely gone, and the main visitor centre and cafe has been badly damaged. Their repairs will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. The damage to wings has made, was made worse by a lack of action from past weather events. In June, hundreds of trees came down in storms and ended up in the creeks, and they weren't removed. When the floodwaters came down last week, those trees were lifted and carried further downstream. When the trees got to wings, they formed a dam and all hell broke loose, I can assure you. If those trees had been cleaned up after the storms, wings may have been OK. It certainly wouldn't have got the battering that it received in the last few weeks. The flood still would have hit them, but the impact, might, might, like I said, wouldn't have been as bad. This is why we are talking about a National Guard or some kind of disaster relief team. They wouldn't just go in and help clean up after weather events would have happened. They would also help things from getting really bad in the first place. A National Guard could, help, could have cleaned up those trees back in June and hopefully have saved Wings, Wings Wildlife Park from the pain it has just recently gone through. It's clearer than ever that we need to put our skates on and get moving on a National Guard for domestic use. These weather events are, weather events are happening more often and are becoming more severe. 
The futures of businesses like Wings Wildlife Park, I can assure you, depend on it. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I want to speak to both the federal government but also the Victorian government's decision to open up vast amounts of sacred whale sea country near the Twelve Apostles for exploration drilling. This is simply unacceptable and flies in the face of both the federal and the Victorian governments who are making claims to be taking the climate crisis seriously. Myself and my fellow Greens colleagues have said this over and over again in this place. You cannot take the climate crisis seriously whilst opening up new gas. You simply can't. And there's no way to reconcile this. If we want to have a chance to limit uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees and to avoid further disasters like the devastating floods we've seen on the East Coast, not one new single coal or gas or oil project can be approved or expanded. Absolutely not one. Drilling in this area, like many others across the country, is opposed by traditional owner groups and locals, and this is a prime example of why having a treaty with both the Victorian and federal governments is so important. The Twelve Apostles and any projects that may result from this exploration is on the unceded lands of the Girawanga people of the Kulin Nation. Not only does this site hold cultural significance as a songline for the traditional owners, the Twelve Apostles is also an iconic tourist attraction for the region, as travellers tra drive along the Great Ocean Road. The pristine coastline that surrounds these giant rock formations would be immediately ruined by any drilling in state and federal waters. As a proud First Nations woman and the Green spokesperson for resources and also tourism, I want to speak in solidarity with the traditional owners and recognise their fight for sea country to be protected and even when the media cycle has moved on, acknowledge the work of my Greens colleagues in Victoria on this issue and call on the Victorian and federal governments not to allow any more exploration on this or any of our pristine coastlines. Thank you. Senator Number Jibber Price. Thank you. <clears throat> I recently had the honour of hosting Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Peter Dutton in the Northern Territory. I aim to show him firsthand the challenges we face which I'm grateful for, unlike the Prime Minister, who showed no interest in the Northern Territory so far. What the opposition leader learned was how true traditional owners are silenced by unrelated interstate activists who pay other Aboriginal people to pose as traditional owners to push their activist agendas. We listened to 86-year-old senior traditional owner Pompey Raymond and his daughter Rosemary, who have despite the lies of the Greens pedal, been part of the years of groundwork and consultation for established agreements in the Beedaloo. Labor and the Greens say they respect First Nations, yet hypocritically ignore traditional owners who don't share their values. These voices are not their priority. Before organisations such as GetUp even began their campaign in the Beedaloo, Pompey had already signed off on agreements for nine of the ten leases for gas extraction in the Beedaloo. Since GetUp have been involved, Pompey and Rosemary are regularly threatened by activists and fake traditional owners. They shouldn't have to be looking over their shoulders in fear because they want better outcomes for their lot. They shouldn't have to fight for jobs, opportunity and a future for their children and families. They shouldn't have to fight for what people in this chamber take for granted. They want to contribute to lowering the cost of living through supporting Australian energy, but Labor's budget raiser gang have slashed these opportunities for ideological priorities, making the future of marginalised Aboriginal Territory children even bleaker, not to mention increasing the cost of living for all Australians. Labor, you must be so proud of yourselves. Senator Billy. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. The Australian government has a strong commitment to Antarctic science, and the budget handed down last night included over $900 million in funding over the forward estimates for Australia's Antarctic program. Australia's Antarctic presence enjoys broad support across this parliament, and many members and senators have joined the Parliamentary Antarctic Alliance, which I co-chair with Senator Dunham. When it comes to the impacts of climate change, Antarctica is the canary in the coal mine. Our understanding of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean is vital to our understanding of how we continue to sustain life on our planet. This understanding was reinforced at the recent launch of the Australian Centre for Excellence in Antarctic Science, or ACES, at which I represented the government. 
ACES is a joint initiative of the Australian Research Council and eight Australian universities, led by UTAS through the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies, or IMAS. ACES will be at the forefront of research into the climate risks emerging from Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. For example, at the launch, we heard about research examining how ocean sediment can provide clues as to how the inundation of warm water may affect Antarctic ice. We also heard about a new model for predicting krill distribution and how krill is such a critical component of ecosystems throughout Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, including Southern Ocean fisheries. The work of ACES is supported by Australia's Antarctic Program and by the Australian Science Foundation, and I would like to thank their CEO, Andrew Kelly, for meeting with me last week to discuss the Foundation's work. As a proud Tasmanian, I'm pleased to see Hobart maintain its role as the gateway to Antarctica. I'm also pleased to see government, universities and the private sector working together to deliver a strong Antarctic research effort. Uh, Senator Grogan. Thank you. Yesterday we saw the Treasurer deliver a solid and responsible budget that draws the line under the drift, decline and decay of a decade of the coalition in government. Thank you. Of particular note for South Australia is the Albanese government delivering on its Water for Australia plan to future-proof Australia's water resources. National investments in critical water infrastructure projects are a key feature of this budget. Back home, the Murray-Darling Basin is considered the lifeblood of the state, and it is so important <clears throat> for all South Australians. It is of significant environmental, cultural and economic value to South Australia. Our Labor government will see the Murray-Darling Basin plan delivered in full and spending is urgently needed to get this plan back on track after nine years of neglect by those opposite. This budget sees funds allocated to improving and updating the science of the Murray-Darling Basin. $22 million to update the science to ensure the impacts of climate change are accounted for in manage managing the Murray-Darling Basin water resources, something that the advocates and the scientists and the people living along the river have been calling for for so long. And a further $29 million to improve the trust and transparency in the Murray-Darling Basin, which has been missing for so long. This will include metering and monitoring of water use. The former government never, was never going to achieve the 450 gigalitres being returned to the Murray-Darling Basin River system. That will now be a reality under this government. We will deliver a strong, secure and sensible national water plan for Thank the future. Thank you, Senator Grogan. The time for this debate has expired. Move to question time, Senator Hume. Thank you, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Before the election, the Minister for Employment said people will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. <laughs> Last night's budget confirms that inflation will be higher, electricity prices will be higher, gas prices will be higher. Real wage growth will be lower, and under a conservative analysis, the average Australian family will be at least $2,000 worse off by Christmas. Minister, is this Order. what Labor mean Order. when they say Australians will be seeing what a change of government means in their bank account? Order. Order. Before I call the minister, I'm going to warn the Senate. I do appreciate order, Senator Ayres. I do appreciate that people are very keen to make a contribution about the budget, for better or for worse. But I am going to ask people to do it respectfully and to do it quietly. I will not put up with a lot of interjections because I could barely hear the tail end of Senator Hume's question then, and we've just started. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator Hume for the question. Well, I think Australians expect their government to deliver a responsible budget, That's right. an honest budget, yep. a budget that deals with the economic circumstances That's of the right. time, 
a budget that deals and delivers on the election uh, commitments and that deals and fixes the mess that we inherited from the former government. Exactly. The mess in skills, the mess in energy, the debt and the deficit that you inflation. left us. Rising inflation, rising interest rates, a crisis in the energy markets in this country, an energy increase that you hid before the election. Australians expect honest, responsible Order. budgeting, and that is what they got last night. That is what they got last night. Delivering on our election commitments, not adding to the inflation problem that we are currently dealing with, which I'm not sure any of those opposite actually acknowledge is happening, not contributing to inflation, delivering on our commitments and dealing with the waste and the rorts and the mess that was left to us by you when you were in government for a wasted decade. A wasted decade that we, in five months, have started taking action on. We're taking action in skills, in childcare, in gender equality, in infrastructure, in health, in aged care, in PPL. All of these areas that you couldn't have given a hoot about. That's what we're doing. We're fixing the problems that were left with us to us. We are delivering on our election commitments, and that is what the people of Australia expect. They also expect some honesty from their government about the true state of the finances of this country. Things, again, that you hear, the dodgy, dodgy budgeting that was done in deals with the National Party. We are fixing all of it up. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hume, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, at the budget lunch in the Great Hall today, the Treasurer was asked, should Australians still expect that $275 off their power bills, particularly off pre-election pre pre prices? The Treasurer responded, the Treasurer Order. responded, Order. You don't, the Treasurer responded, yes, yep, it's in the budget. Oh. Minister, where in the budget is that $275? Oh, thank you, Senator Hume. Your time has expired. I'm waiting, Senators, I'm waiting for silence before I call the minister. I'm still waiting, Senator Birmingham. Minister Gallagher. The policy we took to the election in terms of powering Australia, which, that, which the modelling underpin, is in the budget. And perhaps you got, haven't got to that, that book. Perhaps you, haven't, perhaps you haven't moved past the headlines. Perhaps you haven't looked. But I can tell you, not only are we delivering on the policies that we put in place uh, in the election, we have done more because we've inherited a crisis in the energy market, in gas and electricity, and we're fixing oh, that. Sorry, uh, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And with all due respect to the minister, this is a point of order in relation to relevance. Uh, Senator Hume's question was very, very clear. It referred to a quote in relation to the $275 promise being in the budget. Which page is it in? I would thank ask you. that you direct the minister to the question. Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, I believe were you seeking. On the point, point of order, order. Uh, I understand the senator has now finished, uh, but I would say to you, um, President, that you have previous rule, have ruled, as have previous presidents, that you know, putting a lot of rhetoric and words into a point of order and repeating the question is not appropriate. I was pulled up many times, as you might recall. As you might recall, Senator Brockman is smiling at me. He's smiling at me because he remembers that I, he pulled me up. So I would ask Thank that you, you do the same Thank you, to Senator the deputy Wong. leader who continues to do that, continues to do that, Thank uh, you, rather Senator than Wong. ask her own Please questions. Please resume your seat. Uh, Thank you. I do believe the minister is being relevant, Senator Cash, and I'll continue to um, listen carefully. Please uh, continue, President. And uh, the Powering Australia plan is. Um, Powering Australia. Well, we Senator know. Henderson. Look, we we know those opposite don't believe in the energy transformation that is currently happening around the world, and for which you're going to put your head in the sand on. Order. But it is happening. It Minister, is happening. Please resume your seat. Thank you. Please continue, Minister Gallagher. 
So, I mean, this is partly why you got booted out, because you don't believe in climate change, right? Because you don't believe in it. You don't believe in the transformation. The Powering Australia plan is in the budget. I'm happy to go through the separate measures that are in, Thank included you, in that. The time has expired. Uh, Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. At the Government's Jobs and Skills Summit, the Treasurer said our goals are just as clear. An economy where every Australian who wants a good, secure, well-paid job can find one. But this budget confirms that 144,000 Australians will lose their jobs and that wages will be lower for longer. So is the budget correct? Has the Treasurer broken his promise to the Australian people, just uh, like the Senator Minister for White. Energy, just like the Minister for Employment and just like the Prime Minister? Uh, thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, well, on wages, the policy that you oversaw, which is keeping wages down as a deliberate design feature of your economic architecture, is gone. And if you look in the budget, you will see that wages um, Minister are Minister Gallagher, increased. please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Um, Madam President, just to remind the minister to address her comments through the what chair. Is it that Thank you're you. Seeking Senator Henderson. What were you? S Order. Order. Uh, Senator Watt. Senator Henderson, I can only assume you were seeking a point of order. You need to stand and say point of order. But would you like me to do it again? Thank um, you. No, thank you. I don't want you to do it again. Thank you. Resume your seat. Um, the minister is being relevant, and I'll continue to listen closely. Thank you. Thank you. We are a government that wants to see wages move. I don't know if those opposite have noticed, but we are dealing with a tiny bit of an inflation challenge at the moment. There is, there is an issue here, which, which, it, which the government is responsibly uh, responding to, and that is impacting on wages. Now, we have supported. The minimum wage case. We are backing in a pay rise for aged care workers. We have in this budget indexed community organisations so that they too can get a pay rise, something that this, you guys, when you were in government, never did. We are determined to get wages moving. We are determined to get wages moving and to ensure that nobody is left behind. But these are challenging economic circumstances, and we will continue you, to work in the interest of Australian expired. people. Order. Uh, Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the government's budget and, in particular, how it is delivering cost of living relief for Australians? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, for the question. Last night, the Treasurer delivered a responsible budget that is right for the times and readies us for the future. The budget confronts challenges that have been ignored for too long and seizes the opportunities that won't wait any longer. It delivers on our commitments that the Australian people endorsed at the last election, affirming their faith in a new government. Yeah, yeah. Australians know a complex combination of challenges at home and abroad is pushing up the cost of living. They know the government can't make inflation disappear overnight. But our budget delivers on cost of living relief that is responsible, reasonable and targeted, and which delivers a long-term economic dividend. Our five-point plan for cost of living relief includes delivering cheaper childcare for 1.26 million families, with 96 per cent of families with children in care better off and no family worse off, expanding paid parental leave to 26 weeks for working parents, the biggest reform President, since Labor introduced it in 2011, making housing more affordable and helping more Australians to buy a home with 30,000 affordable and social homes delivered via the Housing Australia Future Fund returns and an additional 20,000 affordable homes delivered under the National Housing Accord, cutting the cost of medicines on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, saving around 1.6 million Australians more than $190 in out-of-pocket costs each year supporting wage increases for our lowest paid workers, boosting job security and employee entitlements and getting wages moving again. I know it hurts your ears, but getting wages moving again. The $7.5 billion package helps put some money back into people's pockets, boosts productivity and grows the economy, but it's carefully targeted and careful careful for the times so that it avoids you, placing Minister. additional pressure Senator on Mariel inflation. Smith, first supplementary. 
Can the minister provide further detail on how the government's budget is building a stronger, more resilient and more modern economy? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. Thank Senator Smith for the supplementary. Under the former government, our economy wasn't delivering for Australians like it needed to. The Jobs and Skills Summit brought Australians together to address the challenges and opportunities facing the labour market and the economy and help reverse the trends we've been seeing after a decade of wasted opportunity. Our budget delivers quality investments in the capacity of the Australian economy, capabilities of the Australian people, including fee-free fee -free TAFE and more university places, delivering our Powering Australia plan, building a future with cleaner and cheaper energy. Understand that? That's what we need to do. A future made in Australia, investing in priority industries to grow our industrial base, diversify our economy and boost and support regional development and small business. We're also building disaster resilience and preparedness and investing in a value for money pipeline of national nation building investments through our infrastructure program. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith, uh, second supplementary. Can the minister provide further detail on how the government is repairing the budget to pay for what is important? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you, Senator Smith, and yes, I can. Our budget begins the hard task of budget repair, fixing the budget. Let's just remember what um, we minister inherited. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. I'm going to wait for quiet until I ask the minister to continue her answer. Minister, minister Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you, President. So we're repairing the budget that was left in, uh, with deficits, as far as I could see, debt increasing. Remember that? Doubled the debt before the pandemic. We are the first government in a long time to take the issue of budget repair seriously. We have found $22 billion in savings and redirected spending. We're still managing against Senator that backdrop Hume, to Senator invest McGrath. in hospitals, in aged care, in childcare, to support our, our uh, progress Henderson. towards gender equality, investing more in the NDIS and deepening relations in the Pacific and making sure that they uh, are equipping defence to respond to some of the challenges that they are facing. We are managing to do all of this while finding $22 billion in savings to start to repair the budget that you Thank left you, in tatters. Your time has expired. Uh, when you're finished, Senator Hume uh, and Senator Henderson, you've got a member of your own side on her feet. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, President. And my question is also to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer the minister to her answer to Senator Hume's question, where, in responding to the Treasurer's statement that Labor's promised $275 cut to power bills is in the budget. The minister said that the Treasurer was referring to the Powering Australia measures. Will these measures reduce power bills by $275, as Labor promised? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, a couple of things to kick off with there. One, renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. That is number one. Number two, there's a war in Europe, right? Right? And number three, we're uh, fixing order, a decade uh, minister, of. Please resume your seat. Order. Order, Senator Wong. When there's quiet, I'll ask the minister to continue. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Our Powering Australia policy, which was modelled before the election. Senator Wong and Senator Cash. Please continue. Thank you. Our policy, which was modelled before the election, clearly outlined the policies that we need to implement in order to put downward pressure on household and business energy bills, and that is what we are doing. Well, if I can respond to the interjection, what about the little sneaky 20 per cent increase that you guys hid before the election? Remember that? Remember that? The Treasurer. Oh, let's take this rather unusual step of not allowing uh, that minister, to happen. Minister, please resume your seat. Order. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. The 20 per cent increase that was known to the former government before the election—let's put that out. Then you hid it, and you hid it because you were dishonest. 
because that Order. is part another reason why you were kicked out of office. Because people didn't Senator trust McGrath. you, and they didn't think you were doing the right thing. So let's just. Um, Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. President, on a point of order, I would again ask you to direct the minister to make a comments through the chair, saying people don't trust you uh, is very derogatory of you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. The, the minister is uh, largely addressing the chair. Uh, order, minister. Thank you. So we are implementing our Powering Australia plan, and you can see it through the budget. I'm happy to go through measures of it. We've got our rewiring the nation. Remember that, because the energy grid isn't fit for purpose. I wonder why. Ten years of a government that didn't do anything, that didn't do its job. So yes, that's in the budget. We've got money for dispatchable storage technology. We've got money for community um, batteries. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, you seem to be desperate to ask questions. But you don't ask them order. You don't ask them by constantly interjecting across the chamber. Please continue, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I will. We've got community batteries for household solars. We've got community um, solar Minister banks. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, and uh, President. The point of order is in relation to relevance. With all due respect, again to the minister. Uh, you are answering a lot of questions, what's potentially, your point of order? yes, but not the question well, sorry, that the I asked order? in relation to will the Powering Australia measures reduce electricity prices by $275 as um, promised? Senator Cash, that was Senator the Cash, question. I, uh, you've been in the chamber all of this week, and almost every day I've asked people when they're making a point of order to simply state the point of order. You've repeated the question. Um, you just need to stand and make a short statement. If it's about relevance, then make that statement. I do believe that the minister is canvassing a whole range of options around power bills, such as you, was in the preamble to your question. And I'll listen to the last 18 sec uh, seconds of the minister's answer. And if she's not being relevant, I will direct her to your question. Minister. Thank you, President. Well, I was asked about the Powering Australia plan, which is exactly what I'm going to in my answer. So we've got the community solar banks, we've got energy efficiency grants, which my colleague uh, Senator McAllister has, been, has been, got carriage of. We've got other programs in the, uh, in the budget which delivers on the Powering Australia plan, and we know that delivering that will Minister, lower power has prices. Expired. Uh, Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you. And despite Labor telling Australians that if you were elected, you would reduce their power prices by $275 a year, and despite the Treasurer's misleading statement at the luncheon today, your own budget papers confirm your broken promise. What do you therefore say to Australians who won't be able to afford to keep the lights on and will suffer through the sweltering heat this summer? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. What I say to, to Australians. Order. Order. What I say to Australians who are rightly concerned about increasing power prices, who absolutely is that they have a government that is a hundred percent focused on responding to this in every way we can who will work with states and territories who also have responsibilities here to do what we can. No, well, Order. sorry, President, I know I shouldn't respond to interjections, but I know working with states and territories is a foreign concept to those when they were in government for 10 years. That was part of the problem. So, yes, Please we— Please resume your seat, Minister. Senator McAllister. Order across the chamber. Minister, please continue. A foreign concept where the Federation actually works together in the interests of the Australian people. I know that is foreign. I know that is foreign, but that is what we will do. We are committed to it. From the highest levels of government, we will be dealing with this, and that is what we say to the Australian people about it. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Cash, second Thank you. supplementary. Prior to the election, Mr Albanese promised Australians that, if elected, his government would help Australians deal with the cost of living pressures. As Senator Hume has mentioned, though, your budget last night confirms that by Christmas the average Australian family will be at least $2,000 worse off. Is a $2,000 hit to the bank accounts of all Australian families Mr Albanese's way of helping with the cost of living? 
Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. There is a $7.5 billion cost of living package in this budget, but we also accept that these are really, really difficult circumstances. Really, really difficult circumstances for households, for families, and for businesses. We have, and we inherited, a high inflation environment. We've got in high inflation. Well, you can pretend that the inflation problem isn't there, Senator Cash, but we don't have the luxury of doing that. We have to deal with the inflation challenge. We can't add. We can't add to inflation, and that's why we. Are we are working alongside. We don't want to work, make the Reserve Bank's job any harder. We don't want to fuel inflation. We know that inflation hits households on low income or fixed incomes harder than anyone. So we need to make sure that what we do is responsible, aligns with monetary policy, delivers on our commitments and doesn't add to inflation in the short term. That is what this government will deliver and that is frankly you, what Minister. we must deliver. The time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to Minister Wong, representing the Minister for Climate Change. The Australian people voted for an end to public handouts to the coal and gas industry, but Labor's very first budget is adding $1.9 billion of new funding on top of keeping the $40 billion of existing subsidies for coal, oil and gas. Why are you too poor to give cost of living relief to families, but not too poor to give away $42 billion of subsidies to the fossil fuel sector and $254 billion in stage three tax cuts to the rich? Thank you, uh, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Uh, well, President, I, I'm going to, I think the Order. first part of the question, the second part was a general political um, point. First part of the question, goes to uh, a matter not in the portfolio I'm representing, I believe goes to the Minister for Resources. So I'd ask you to direct subsequently a question to uh, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Senator Wong. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Wow, that's pretty unprecedented. You don't want to talk about fossil fuel subsidies. Right on. Well, you Order. shouldn't have put them in your budget then if you Senator didn't want Waters. to talk about them. Senator Waters, Order. Senator McGrath. Order. I would ask all senators in this place, Senator Cash, to listen respectfully to the question that Senator Waters wishes to make. I want to see silence on all parts of the chamber. Senator Waters, please continue. Thanks, President. If anyone in the government would like to answer this, they're welcome to. Minister Bowen was reported in The Guardian Senator saying Farrell, there would be no say? new public funding for coal and gas. Why is your first budget giving billions to frack for gas in the carbon bomb that is the Beedaloo Basin and to fund an export terminal in Darwin Harbour for that gas, all without First Nations consent? Uh, Senator Birmingham. Point, point of order, President. Uh, pre President, uh, point of order. I just Senator want to make Wong, clear to the chamber: the seat. opposition will give Senator leave Wong. for any government minister who wants to answer a question to do Senator, so. Senator Birmingham, that's not a political point. They're not a point of order. Order. Uh, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. I assume I'm calling Senator Wong to answer the first supplementary, or am I calling? Uh, I'm, interest, I'm interested in the coalition's newfound uh, uh, cooperation with the Greens, and I invite Senator Birmingham to go and explain that to Mr. Dutton in the upper pla other place. Senator, uh, Senator uh, Waters, we are very pleased to answer questions, and I have answered multiple questions in this chamber that have been directed to the wrong minister. You say it is unprecedented. All we are asking you to do is what question time is pe people are required to do in question time, which is to address the question to the correct minister and the portfolio. If you wish for assistance in that, Order. we can provide you Senator with that. Scar. But a shame that the Westminster tradition ought be upheld, Senator Thorpe. Yeah. Perhaps you're not the person to be interjecting on that this week. <laughs> So, uh, if you wish to seek leave, 
Uh, I'm happy for the matter to be redirected, if that's what you want, to Senator Farrell for his, in his portfolio. But the first question you asked was in relation to the resources portfolio. It is not unreasonable for us to indicate to you that the relevant minister is not the minister to whom you addressed the question. If you wish to do it, I'm uh, happy to, time to see. Expired, I'm happy. Senator Wong. Senator I Wong, please resume your seat. I'm Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Waters, second supplementary. Yes, thank you, President. I did, in fact, invite any minister who wished to speak and about fossil fuel subsidies Senator to Waters, answer that, the question. That is so not I'm actually appropriate. genuinely need... unclear on what I meant to do uh, here. Senator, Senator Waters, order, order, order. I would remind the opposition in this place, Senator Henderson that you get most of the questions. It is not unreasonable for Senator Waters to expect silence when she stands to ask her question. Senator Waters, you need to direct your question to a minister. Well, I don't care who answers it. I just want an answer. Minister Wong, Minister Farrell, whoever. I find it ridiculous that the climate change minister can't answer a question about fossil fuel subsidies, but my final question goes to a windfall profits tax on coal and gas. Why aren't you proposing that, given that the whole crossbench supports it, rather than giving them handouts? Uh, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Waters, I can only assume I'm to call Senator Wong. Uh, I'm not sure which question. Order. Order. I'm not sure which question uh, Senator Waters is referring to. It sounded more like a speech, if I may say, than a question. But uh, oh, now, now Senator Cash is backing you. That's interesting. Um, oh, well, I have I have said to you, Senator Waters, on your first question, which goes to. Uh, taxation measures and other measures in the resources portfolio. If you seek leave that they be directed to the separate, uh, the correct minister, I would grant uh, the Labor Party will grant leave. You sought not to take that. You've now asked a second question about future tax policy, which I'm happy to respond to and, and say to you that the government's tax measures are as those set out in the budget. What about uh, Senator Green. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Senator Waters. I didn't see you. Resume your seat, Senator Green. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. With your indulgence, I seek leave for all parts of my question to be taken on notice by whomever wishes to respond to me. Please. Sure. Thank you, Senator Waters. They, uh, Senator Wong has indicated they'll be taken on notice. Uh, Senator Green. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, and Local Government, Senator Watt. How does the budget invest in infrastructure, including in our regions, to deliver the best outcome for the Australian people now and into the future? Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Green. I was very much hoping that I would be asked a question about our infrastructure budget and how it benefits regional Australia. And funnily enough, you asked the question. Good infrastructure is critical to building the nation and the regions we all want and deserve, creating jobs and building better connections within and between communities. And that's why I'm pleased to say that last night's budget delivered a $123 billion infrastructure pipeline over the next 10 years. That is a bigger pipeline than the Liberals and Nationals ever promised, Senator even McGrath. after we stripped out the waste and the rorts and the smoke and the mirrors of projects that were announced and never delivered. It's an infrastructure pipeline that will deliver in every corner of Australia, in Queensland, Senator Gr Green's home state. Uh, Over Watt. half a billion dollars will be Senator provided. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie, seriously. Senator Mackenzie, I've called you to order. That's what I expect to happen. It's not a contest between you and me. I'm the president. I've asked you to be quiet. I've constantly had to draw your side of the parliament to order. 
Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. As I was saying, in Queensland, our budget contains over half a billion dollars for the Bruce Highway through Brisbane's outer north and between Gladstone and Rocky, as well as locking in over a billion dollars for the Coomera Connector Stage 1 on the Gold Coast. In Senator far north McGrath. Queensland, where Senator Green lives, the Albanese government is investing over $200 million on the Coranda Range Road upgrade between Smithfield and Coranda. In New South Wales, our budget includes a new $300 million uh, commitment for the Western Sydney Roads package, upgrades to Brindabella and Mandalong Roads, and even $38.6 million for Coulsons Creek Road in the Hunter, a project that the member for New England claimed to have secured funding for when he had done no such thing. I could go on through every state. In Victoria, there's the suburban rail route as well as money for the Gippsland Rail line upgrade. Tasmanians will get safer, faster travel through upgrades to the Bass Highway, Tasman Highway, East and West Tamar Highways, and unlike the last government, we'll actually deliver Senator the Bridgewater McGrath. Bridge. In South Australia, we've maintained almost $5 billion for the North-South Corridor, many other commitments as well, Western Australia money for the Bunbury out of Ring Road, uh, as well as the Metronet, and of course, the Northern Territory and the ACT are getting great infrastructure investment as well. Thank you, we Senator are delivering. Your time you just has made it up. Expired. Senator Green, uh, wait for the call. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how does the budget end oh, the waste sorry. and rorts and deliver an infrastructure pipeline that Australians can trust? Uh, before I call the minister, thank you. I have Senator Wong on her feet. Senator Wong. Uh, I couldn't hear the second half of the question. I'd ask that the, the senator be allowed to permit sure. to repeat it, Thank please. Thank you, uh, Senator Green. If you would um, repeat the second half of your question, I did not hear it either. Thank you. <laughs> Just the second half. It's a, it's a very short question. Uh, how does the budget end the waste and rorts and deliver an infrastructure pipeline that Australians can trust? Um, before I call the minister, I'm going to remind senators. Order, Senator Canavan. Seriously, Senator Watt has a loud voice, and I, yet I can hear a range of interjections above his microphone voice. Order, order. It is not your point to argue back, Senator McKenzie. Um, Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Green. The very best thing about last night's infrastructure budget is that, is that it is full of projects that Australians can actually believe in. The years of rorts, waste and Barnaby and Bridget funny money and colour-coded spreadsheets are over. Remember the rorting of regional funds? Remember the regional funds that were rewarded to provide swimming pools in North Sydney? Very regional over there in Lavender Bay and Kirribilli, isn't it? Yes, very regional. Remember the $30 million commuter car park that the coalition announced, even though there was nowhere to build it? Or the absolute debacle of the Leppington Triangle, 10 times the market value? What a bargain! And that's before we get to the inland rail, all those coal-fired power stations Canavan used to promote and never actually got to build. They promised 100 dams and built two. They spent 10 years lying to the Australian public with funny money and colour-coded spreadsheets, and it has stopped. Finally, Australians have a, a government they can believe in that will actually Senator deliver McKenzie. and stop the rorts and stop the waste. Thank you, Senator Watt. I'm waiting again. Senator McKenzie. Senate and Senator Watt. And Senator Watt, I remind you when you are referring to people in this place and the other place to use their correct titles. Uh, Senator Green, second uh, se Senator, you've, your time's expired. I'm going to Senator Green for her second supplementary. <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, how has eliminating the waste and rorts in the infrastructure budget enabled new investment in infrastructure and our regions? Thank you, Senator Green. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Green. We make absolutely no apologies for getting rid of the false promises and funny money that littered year after year of Liberal and National Party budgets. The Australian people have had a gutful of colour-coded spreadsheets, bad value for money and the shambles that this lot employed when it came to infrastructure. I've already given examples, but the list goes on. 
to end the waste and rorts, we are closing down the egregious urban congestion fund, rorted beyond belief by the former government, and we're cancelling a number of their most egregious commuter car park projects as well. The Liberals and Nationals wanted to build car parks on land allocated to affordable housing or at train stations that were being closed down. We want to invest in infrastructure that actually matters. I've got news for the National Party and the Liberal Party. That big slushy machine that you ran for years, that is closed. We are going to be delivering real infrastructure that delivers real economic benefits to our regions and our cities, employs real jobs, and you know what? We'll actually deliver. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Watt. The contract the European Health Agency signed with Pfizer for the purchase of COVID vaccine is now in the public domain. Although its bona fide has not been officially recognised, that contract indicates that, yes, Pfizer was given a financial indemnity against damage claims resulting from harm their COVID vaccine caused. Minister, does our contract that the Morrison-Joyce government signed with Pfizer include a clause that indemnifies Pfizer from any claim for damages resulting from harm to Australians injected with Pfizer's community uh, substance? Um, Senator uh, Roberts, just before I go to that, I believe you directed the question to Senator Watt, but I'm advised that it should go to Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher? Uh, if, she, if she's representing the yes, Minister for is. Health. Thank yep. you. Um, Minister Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Roberts for the question. Um, obviously, this predates um, this government, the arrangements that were entered into on. Um, just give me a chance, Jared. Jeez. Um, I, I am getting to it. My understanding is there is an indemnity in place, but if I am wrong, I will come and ch uh, change the record. I understand it was put in place for a number of the new vaccines uh, because they were new uh, and so there were um, sort of particular COVID related uh, arrangements uh, put in place uh, to ensure that we could essentially uh, support the rollout of a widespread national vaccination program uh, which was so important to ensuring that we protected Australians from the worst of the COVID outbreaks that, and that was essentially a secret the getting the vaccine program rolled out, protecting people um, in the fastest possible way was a key strategy of managing uh, the pandemic. If I have anything else to add to that, um, I will come back, and, and, and particularly if I have to correct the record. But I recall from my chair of the COVID committee um, arrangements that there were indemnity arrangements put in place for vaccine contracts. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Roberts, first supplementary. The contract between the European Health Agency and Pfizer included a provision that product indemnity was voided should Pfizer have committed fraud, such as in their vaccine approval process. Minister, does our contract with Pfizer include a similar get-out-of-jail-free clause for Australian taxpayers that allows the indemnity to be removed in the case of Pfizer misconduct or for any other reason? If not, on what basis, Minister, was the decision taken to absolve Pfizer of responsibility for any harm their substance caused? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I think it's probably best that I take that question on notice because it does. Uh, I wasn't a member of the government that entered into the arrangement. I'm not trying to um, not take responsibility, but I think it's probably best that I uh, get a, uh, an answer to you um, uh, following taking some advice about that. I know there were elements of the contract that weren't public, um, and I don't know if there are some um, commercial in confidence arrangements in place, uh, but I will seek to update uh, the Senate with what information I can find to, in an attempt to answer your question, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Minister. <coughs> Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you. That would be appreciated, Minister. The TGA database <laughs> of adverse events notifications lists 136,000 adverse vaccine events the majority from Pfizer. Doctors have reported almost 1,000 deaths, thought to grossly underreport actual deaths, and the Australian Bureau of Statistics recently reported 15 deaths. <laughs> Apparently, Australian taxpayers will carry that entire liability. Minister, have you personally read the contract, and will you release the Pfizer contract so that we can all see what the government agreed to? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, my uh, my answer is probably 
uh, for this question is similar to um, my last question. I haven't uh, personally read the contract um, from, with Pfizer, um, and I do understand that there might be elements of that that aren't in the public domain in commercial in, nor standard commercial and confidence arrangements. I do know that the TGA does report, as Senator um, uh, Roberts pointed out, about adverse events, and I should say that um, you know, there are a range of events within that, just any reaction to the vaccine, including the most severe reactions. Um, but I would also say there's uh, been um, you know, millions and millions of doses of, uh, provided through the vaccination program to protect Australians uh, from COVID. So it has been overall a very, very successful uh, vaccination program in protecting Australians from the worst effect of, um, of COVID-19. If there is anything further I can provide uh, to the Senate, I will. Thank, Thank you. you, Minister. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The Budget has forecast that gas prices are set to rise by 40 per cent over the next two years. How does cutting millions of dollars of support for developing gas supply, including in the Cooper and Ada Vale basins, while also in increasing funding to activists who oppose the development of gas supplies, curb rising gas prices? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. So this is the Senate in action, uh, criticised for uh, investments in middle arm and then criticised uh, for other project uh, decisions. Um, this government does acknowledge that uh, the gas and other fossil fuels um, will continue to be required to support Australia's energy system, and I think that's important to, to say to the chamber. Uh, and I think you see. You see the results of that in the budget in terms of projects we support, but you also see that we do want to be part of the transformation and the move to a renewable energy future. And so you also see decisions like that in the budget. And that is what any responsible government should be doing at this point in time, making sensible investments where they stack up in relation to middle arm. It's investing in those, um, you know, the, the general use facilities that, that um, support that infrastructure, uh, but also making sensible investments in renewable energy. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that is the approach the government's taken. We do acknowledge that gas prices have increased and are going to continue to increase. The government has taken a number, has had a number of responses to that, led by um, Minister King, which has delivered um, successfully in the short term on the supply issues. But there is more work to be done um, through the heads of agreement and uh, looking at the codes of conduct uh, and looking at where we can um, ensure that people are able to afford their energy bills and businesses are able to continue to operate um, in an environment Gallagher, like please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Macdonald. Point of order on relevance, please. Uh, the minister is being directly relevant, uh, Senator Macdonald. Um, Minister Gallagher, did you wish to continue? <laughs> Senator Macdonald, um, first supplementary. The minister has completed her question. Uh, so it is clear that the government has no real plan to address rising gas and energy prices or supply. Considering South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales are all set to experience energy shortages over the next three years and gas makes up 22 per cent of Australia's energy consumption, why has the government cut support for developing gas supply in the Cooper and Adavale basins? Won't this slowing of new supplies drive energy bills up rather than to help bring them down by, say, $275? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we're trying to do a few things um, in this budget, and it's as I outlined in the first question, which is um, actually being an active participant in the transformation that's occurring in our energy system, um, dealing with the mess that we were left. We walked into government into a gas crisis. I mean, I know you try and rub that out, but essentially, I remember. Minister Bowen and Minister King leaving the swearing-in ceremony to go and deal with what was happening in the gas markets. That is what was happening. Okay? So we have taken a number of steps to deal with that. In fact, the, the focus of the first tranche of work was over dealing with the supply shortages that were being identified through the work of the ACCC. So we have actually dealt with that. We are investing in projects where it makes sense. We're not just giving money for subsidies. We're in Middle Arm, for example, we're supporting common use infrastructure and we are supporting the shift to renewable energy at the same time. 
Thank you, our Minister. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Minister, can you cite a budget measure that will specifically help to lower gas bills for Australian households and businesses? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Our Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, there was a range of um, uh, initiatives in the budget, including extra funding to the regulators to deal with the mess that we have inherited from you. So, uh, there, there is one. Well, you asked me the question. You said name one. There is funding for the regulators to make sure we we are getting. Yeah. Order. Well, exactly. Order. Well, you might not find that information useful, but the ACCC's report into the uh, supply shortage informs government decision making. I will just wait until it's quiet again before I call the minister. Minister. Have you completed? Oh, do you wish to complete your answer, or have you completed? I called um, you again because yeah. I sat you down. Yeah. Sorry, President. Well, I was asked to name one, and those opposite are laughing at it. But they are that that it's not a joke. It's not a joke because the regulators and the experts are the ones that identified the shortfall that you guys had your head in a sand over, and we dealt with. So don't say it's a joke. Running out of gas is pretty serious. Running out of gas is pretty serious, and that's what you Senator left, McGrath. and we've fixed Senator it. McGrath. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Women. Minister, a budget sets out the values of a government. With every dollar it spends, it sends up a flare about what it stands for. Last night's budget was a chance to help Australians deal with very real cost of living pressures by redirecting stage three tax cuts. These cuts, a quarter of a trillion dollars, flow to very wealthy Australians, mostly men, mostly older people. That will widen income and gender inequality instead of helping those most in need. Why has your government stuck with a $9,000 annual tax cut for the wealthy, striking a real blow against Australia's progressive income tax system, while leaving low-income families struggling to pay for food, power and rent? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. The government hasn't changed its position on stage three. Uh, our focus in this budget as we had said from the outset, was to deliver on our election commitments uh, to sensibly uh, take pressure off cost of living uh, for uh, Australians and businesses where we could do so without impacting on inflation and dealing with the waste and rorts of the previous government. They were the, the objectives of the October budget. The tax, uh, the tax um, cuts that come in don't come in for another two years. Uh, I think what this budget does uh, and there is substantial investment, uh, both in, on the payment side—$33 billion increase um, in the indexation arrangements for payments to help deal with um, some of the cost of living pressures that fixed and low-income households are under. There's also half a billion dollars going to the community sector to deal with their indexation challenge that's been ignored for the last 10 years. Uh, to deal with some of the cost of living pre um, you know, um, pressures that those organisations are under. And there's the first step in a pretty serious package for women um, as well. So I don't think it's an either or. Um, what this budget does is it sets out the challenges ahead. The Treasurer and I have made no secret about the spending pressures that are coming our way. Um, and you can see that if you look at the medium term projections and acknowledge that those five big spending programs. Uh, are not going to change. We're going to see defence, aged care, hospitals, NDIS and the cost of servicing a trillion dollars of debt are going to continue to place pressure on the budget. And we want a pretty upfront discussion about how we meet well, how we value those services, how we provide those services and how we meet the cost of them into the future. And that's a part of I think this is the first step in that discussion, and I think the Australian people are up for that discussion and they've got a responsible government that's prepared to have it with them. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, in my state, South Australia, I recently met with a group of people living on JobSeeker. They often cannot afford food or medicine. Their kids don't make it to school excursions. Their teeth give them pain every day. They're living on a JobSeeker rate of $48 a day, well below the poverty line, in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. Why has your government refused to raise the poverty level of JobSeeker? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Um, well, there are, as I said, there is a significant increase in the job seeker uh, 
indexation arrangement, $33 billion that will flow through to partly assist to partly assist with some of those increases in cost of living pressure. Um, but we don't pretend that there aren't uh, you know, continuing work to do in how we provide support and services to people on low income. Uh, but this budget is not the answer to everything. It is a, is a point in time. It is, the first, it is the first opportunity to do what we said we would do, which is have a budget which delivers on our election commitments, which, do, which um, makes sensible investments, which ease cost of living without impacting on the short-term inflation problem that we have in the economy, and deals with the waste and rorts that we inherited from those opposite. That was the objective of this budget. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Minister, there is no economic evidence that giving tax cuts to wealthy men will boost their work rate or their productivity or make any difference to GDP. However, there is buckets of evidence that supporting working carers and women will do all of these things. Why have you backed in a tax measure that mostly benefits wealthy men while offering women no superannuation on their paid parental leave, no lifting of the rate of paid parental leave to their normal pay rate, and, and making Senator them wait Pocock, four years to get to just 26 weeks? Uh, thank you. Um, well, the tax cuts that uh, the senator refers to are in the budget and the, uh, are factored into the budget, and the government hasn't changed its view on that. In terms of um, the other supports, this is an ongoing uh, piece of work before the government. I mean, we will every budget we have said we will look at what we can do to support people, particularly those who rely on government uh, to who rely on government support. We will assess that. You have seen that in this budget as the first step in a number of budgets where these issues will continue to be um, looked at across the ERC table. In terms of the investments in women uh, or services for women, support policies well, uh, for, to progress gender equality, I think, compared to what we've had in the last few years, this women's budget statement is a serious start in terms of looking at the issues, providing some analysis and starting with the policies uh, that you, aim Minister. to fix it. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Can the minister please inform the Senate how the Albanese government's social services commitments are supporting families and promoting the safety of women and gender equality? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and can I thank Senator Sheldon for his uh, very important question and his interest in this uh, important part of uh, the federal government's policy. And of course, the uh, Albanese government is putting families and gender equality at the centre of policy making. This is not a new commitment; it's been at the centre of our decision-making processes. And we saw last night through the uh, Treasurer's uh, budget speech. Um, that uh, we've dealt with this uh, issue. In the lead-up to the 2022-2023 uh, budget, we announced that uh, we uh, deliver the biggest boost to Australia's paid parental leave since it was created, yeah, yeah. giving every family with a new baby uh, more choice, greater sec security and better support. The extension of paid parental leave is the first time the scheme has been modernised since the Labor government introduced right. the scheme in 2011, and it's the, corner, it's the cornerstone of our commitment to address gender equality issues in this country. We're also deeply committed to ending violence against women and children in Australia, and we're taking action. To this end, end the, uh, the very fine Minister for Social Services uh, released the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022-2032. We've also introduced legislation for 10 days paid family leave and domestic violence leave per year to ensure that uh, no one should have to choose between a job and seeking uh, support to deal with uh, domestic uh, violence. Uh, we are conducting an open, competitive process to appoint a domestic family and uh, sexual violence commissioner to act as an advocate for, uh, for victims 
uh, and uh, survivors to oversee the implementation of the national plan, including uh, the monitoring and evaluation. In addition, uh, the budget released uh, last night, we confirm our $1.7 billion you, commitment Senator Farrell, to— Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, second, first supplementary. Uh, can the minister further please inform the Senate how the national plan to end violence against women and children in 2022-2032, launched last week, will be implemented? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Sheldon for his uh, supplementary question. And on the 17th of October uh, 2022, uh, that very fine minister, Minister Rishworth, <coughs> launched the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022-2032, along with my colleague in the Senate, uh, the Minister for Women, the very fine Senator Gallagher, and state and territory ministers for women's uh, safety. <coughs> in the plan, the government has set uh, ourselves an ambitious goal to end violence against women and children in one generation. To support the plan, the Albanese government has committed $1.7 billion for women's safety initiatives. The plan includes example indicators for success that can track our progress in implementing this national plan. The national plan will also support uh, by an outcomes framework that will increase our ability to track, monitor and report change over the life of the uh, national plan. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister please inform the Senate how the Albanese government is supporting families and gender equality by boosting paid parental leave? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, uh, Senator Sheldon for his uh, second supplementary question. Increasing uh, paid parental leave was one of the uh, most frequent proposals raised at the successful Jobs and Skills Summit in September. The Albanese government has listened, has continued to consult and will now act to deliver the biggest expansion of uh, the paid parental leave scheme since it was first introduced by Labor in 2011. The budget invests $531.6 million over four years and $619.3 million annually after that to progressively uh, scale up the scheme to 26 weeks or six months by 2026. Our changes will benefit more than 180,000 families nationally. We know that many dads want to take more time off following the birth or adoption of a child. We see that increasing uh, take up of parental leave Thank you, by Minister, dads your in the. Time has expired, oh. Senator Rustin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Uh, can the minister please advise whether the government believes that demand for state and territory hospital services will increase or decrease over the next four years? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Thank you. Um, I think I know where this might be going. Uh, we expect that hospital activity um, and demand for hospital activity uh, will increase. There has been a decrease in activity because of the pandemic. Um, and that, that has been reflected in adjustments through the activity-based funding arrangement. But we are expecting that demand for hospital uh, services will continue to grow uh, as we normalise back into a post-COVID world. I would also say that those adjustments in the budget don't take into account the uh, COVID extra funding that went through the COVID payments. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam uh, President. Um, could the minister please explain uh, why, um, if the, she believes and states the government believes that there will be an increase in demand for hospital services, uh, that there has been a $2.4 billion cut to hospital services Ooh. that are being provided to the uh -oh. states and territories uh -oh. over the next uh -oh. four years, which uh, they say is as a, re a reflection of the reduction in the volume of hospital services that are demanded? Ooh. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I, I would have thought, considering that um, you've you've recently been in government, that you would understand how uh, the funding flows through uh, in these. They are largely parameter adjustments that are based on the activity, they, they were on the activity um, that was uh, advised through the activity-based funding. Well, that's the reality. That, that is the system that you have order, operated on, order. no forecast activity an activity through the pandemic based on the data that the states and territories provide to the Commonwealth uh, is reconciled through the budget process. 
It doesn't take into account the extra funding that has and will continue to be provided through the special payments under the COVID arrangements. And as people would know, through the very successful National Cabinet, we continue to work with the states and territories over pressures more broadly in the health system, including a broken primary thank care you, system, Minister, which you guys oversaw. Senator Rustin, second, second supplementary. Um, thank you very much, um, President. Uh, well, in confirming that there is a $2.4 billion cut to hospital funding, can the minister please explain why the government has decided that Victoria is to pay $2 billion of that $2.4 billion cut to hospital funding? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. I'm not sure I understand um, what, what two things you're linking there. Um, no, well, I'm happy, I'm happy to take it on notice and come back to you, um, but there is an adjustment through forecast activity reconciled based on the, the work the hospitals have done. And the reality is, during the COVID-19 pandemic, they did less of their activity, less of their normal activity that gets funded through this mechanism. That has been reconciled. There, will, uh, there are, is additional funding going into health, I think in the order of $6 billion. Uh, so we continue to work with the states and territories. They've got a government that wants to talk to them, that wants to talk to them about how hospitals work, how the primary health care system works with that and how aged care works with that. You've got to see it on the continuum and you'll see that in the budget. More funding for aged care, more funding for health and working with the states and territories on a national health system. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I'm on my feet Senator still. Birmingham. I'm still uh, on my feet. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I am, in relation to question time yesterday, can I indicate I undertook to provide further information in response to questions asked of me by Senators Cox and David Pocock in my capacities as Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water, Minister representing the Minister for Finance relating to CSIRO and security of payments. I have written to both senators to provide additional information and I table my letters for the information of all senators. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, President. Uh, President, uh, I rise with a point of order. Uh, consistent with Standing Order 191, uh, I invite Senator Gallagher to uh, provide an explanation to the Senate in relation to the answers she gave to Senators Hume and Cash. Senator Gallagher gallantly sought to explain the statement by the Treasurer that the $275 cut in power bills is in the budget. But despite Senator Gallagher's gallantry, Mr Chalmers has told the other place where he has confessed that he misheard the question. That he misheard the question. Would Senator Gallagher like to correct the record? Uh, the, I'm advised, Senator Birmingham, that the standing order doesn't operate in that way, so I'm not asking the minister to do anything. Uh, Senator Watt. Um, thanks, President. In question time yesterday, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Patterson uh, to me on notice. I've written to Senator Patterson to provide a complete answer, and I now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you, Senator Watt. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. And I rise to take note of all the questions asked by coalition senators to the government. Well, it's only in Labor's illogical, bizarre world could we get a federal budget that's propped up by resources, but which also cuts support to them while giving extra ammunition to the sort of lawfare that we're going to see from the EDO. The Resources Minister is telling industry and media one thing, saying we're encouraging more gas supply to come to market. She knows that that's what's going to reduce energy prices and provide uh, better gas prices to the domestic market, but her Cabinet colleagues are giving a nod and a wink to the Greens and every other extreme Green movement. So the Environmental Defenders Office have received an extra $9.6 million to conduct lawfare against the very industry that is the only solution we have to provide affordable gas to both the domestic market for manufacturing uh, but also, also for our export market. And it is this year alone 
that the gas industry is expected to provide $13 billion in royalties, company taxes and PAYG payments from the incredibly well-paid jobs that there are in the gas industry. And it is extraordinary to me that when I go to towns like Gladstone, like Rockhampton, like Mount Isa in Townsville, when the journalists ask me, what do you think this budget means for our people, our workers? And I have to say, well, it's not much good news, I'm afraid, because in this budget we have seen massive cuts, massive cuts to incredibly important budget commitments that we had for the development of Northern Australia, whether it be the billions of dollars to water funding, to Hellsgate Dam, to well, where is? I'll take that, Senator Canavan. Uh, I will have to provide a map similar to the one provided by uh, Senator Watt when he was uh, before he was a minister. He would bring a map to our rat where he'd carefully coloured in Northern Australia. I think just to remind him of, of where it is. And using that map, he would be able to see that the water uh, investments, the road investments, the half a billion dollars that's been cut from the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, the cuts to the Northern Australia Development Grants, the cuts to roads and significant investments, that this makes this a Robin Hood budget in reverse. Because what it does is it steals jobs from the North but I'm not sure where they're giving them to. It's the kind of worst kind of theft because nobody benefits and everybody loses. Because it is the royalties and the company taxes of gas, of coal, of critical minerals that have allowed this country to be the first world country that we have. We've continued to hear about this budget, the sort of labour lies, the unravelling of budget commitments that I'm seeing now uh, uh, people right across the Australian landscape are saying, well, we don't believe this budget. We don't rate it because you promised us, you promised us the Rockhampton Ring Road, the Prime Minister to be put out a media release, committing to it something that is now deleted. Shame. They committed to a $275 electricity uh, cost uh, reduction. But now all we're seeing is electricity prices skyrocket. We, can, we know that Australian households are going to be, it will cost them another $2,000 a year by this Christmas. That's the impact of this budget and this government that doesn't know how to manage money, doesn't know how to manage the budget. This is the biggest spending budget. Another $50 billion in receipts because of commodity prices. And yet, what have they done with it? Well, they've spent the lot. They've spent the lot. So they have cut money to the places that make money, and they're pouring it into uh, the Premier of Victoria's re-election campaign, a circular rail project that is going to assist a couple of people where they need to hold government, but the places that mine the resources that grow the agricultural products, that secure the nation's future for generations to come, cut, dead, gone, because that's what regional Australia means to Labor. Absolutely nothing. Senator Polly. The comments from the good senator in relation to our budget last night, this is from the co coalition opposition when they were in government, they left Australia with a trillion dollar debt. That's what they did. Had 10 years in office, in office to deliver on energy prices, to actually deliver an energy policy. I think there was 22 different energy policies, but that's when they actually had policies, I might add, because now, according to their front bench, they don't have policies because they're in opposition. Can I just say, in terms of the, the budget that was delivered by Dr Chalmers yesterday, was a budget that is looking to change the way the federal government operates going forward. And that is a government that is run by adults, a government that is going to be open and transparent, 
a government that will deliver on its election commitments and it will govern with integrity. That's the big change. When I had the good fortune to make all the calls I did this morning to businesses in Tasmania in terms of the investment that we've made through our budget to jobs, to giving opportunities to young Tasmanians, that has been so well received. The comment from one of the hydrogen companies was it's not just a breath of fresh air to have this new government, but it goes beyond that. It goes about the way that we have operated since we've come into government, the dignity, integrity that our leader, Anthony Albanese, has restored. People see this as a government that is prepared to work with the community, to work with the business community, to listen to the concerns of everyday Australians. That's the difference. This opposition wants to come in here and lecture us about election commitments. Come on. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. Making announcements when you're in government does not equate to delivering on those commitments. You can re, as they did, re-announce re -announce various projects but never delivered on them at all. And our very own member uh, of the opposition in the seat of Bass, where I live, is already trying to take credit for our budget, trying to take credit for the things that we committed during the election campaign and we are delivering on. Now, when we talk about energy prices, Marinus, that has just been announced by this government, that was able to draw together a deal between, yes, the Victorian Labor government, but guess what? The Tasmanian Liberal government signed up with the federal government because they recognised there was such a change of attitude by the new government. Now, Turnbull government, couldn't deliver mariners for Tasmania and for uh, the benefit of the entire country, neither could Scott Morrison, after the years of his failings, was unable to deliver that. That's just one example. And we all know in this chamber, because I've spoken about it many, many times, renewable energy, the home for that is in fact in my home state of Tasmania. We know what, how important renewable energy is to this country. We know how important it is to our state, but we want to be part of the future to deliver better outcomes when it comes to energy. We on this side of the chamber have always argued for more money, more resources and a commitment to climate change and addressing the needs of our country in relation to climate change. But we've delivered not only in terms of cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, more paid parental leave, expanding that opportunity for both mums and dads, more affordable housing. We're actually restoring opportunities for people in regional Australia to go to TAFE. We want affordable housing for all Australians to be able to access. But what we have done and what we will continue to do, and that is to find the waste and mismanagement under the former Morrison government. But what we are doing is we're not using colour coding to allocate grants. They will be done on the needs basis, on business cases that are put to us that can demonstrate it's of benefit to that community. That's how a government should act how we should govern, and that's how the Albanese Labor government will continue to govern this Senator country. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Look, the people of Australia uh, are not all that concerned about the cross-chamber rhetoric that occurs in here. They're actually concerned about outcomes and the things that make a difference to their daily lives. And what they're seeing at the moment is headlines in the Adelaide Advertiser that was saying that power prices will increase by some 35 per cent. Uh, over next year, and now in the context of this budget period, uh, estimates of power prices will increase, in fact, by around 50 per cent. And for many families uh, in Australia, uh, that is crippling in terms of their ability to pay their power bills as well as the other aspects. So the question for them is, if this is the forecast, if this is happening, does the government have a plan? to actually address the cost of living? Does the have government have a plan that will help families? 
And the minister, in answering the question that was put to her, talked about two things. One is the Powering Australia plan and the importance of the transition which is occurring, which the claim was that the government is all across and is following the transition that's occurring overseas. Well, I'd just like to point to overseas. Media reports this week in the UK are highlighting that more than half of UK adults are struggling to pay their power bills. And in Germany, some 4.2 million Germany, Germans are seeing electricity bills this year rise by over 63 per cent. Now, a lot of people have said, well, that's because of the war in Ukraine. But if you go back through the media from energy organisations in Germany, in fact, 2021, which was before the war in Ukraine, Germany saw the highest increase in their power costs on record. Now, Germany is often held up as a leader in this so-called transition of power. And if Powering Australia's plan is following Germany's lead, then it's not a good outlook for Australian people. South Australia is also sometimes held up as an example in terms of the penetration of variable renewable power. But when I speak to industry figures in South Australia, they highlight that one of the ways that the market operator manages power supply there is by managing demand. And the impact on industry in terms of forced shutdowns and lost productivity is measured in the tens of millions of dollars. And so there is a cost to that kind of management when you have a high penetration of variable renewable energies. And that cost to industry also means then there is a risk to jobs and job security, which is another factor that families are concerned about. The key point that Australians need to understand is that the science of climate change and the narrative and the rhetoric that has led to the commitment towards net zero and the Powering Australia plan is not actually representing the latest science. The OECD NEA report that was issued in April this year highlights and this is on the basis of work they've done with the International Energy Agency and others, so world leading engineers and economists, they have highlighted that wind and solar will not get us to net zero and will likely send us broke if we try. And as they work through all the system's costs, they say, come to the same conclusion that the IPCC and others have come to in all of the various scenarios that they model, that if the world wants to get to net zero, then as you start constraining emissions, you reach an inflection point where the cost of firming starts to go exponential. And that's what we're seeing in Europe. That's what we are starting to see in Australia. And the answer that the IPCC and the OECD and the IEA have come to is to point to the fact that as they look around the IEA member nations, the lowest cost of power considering not only levelised costs but systems cost is long-run nuclear power. And even for new build nuclear power, when you look at systems costs, it is the cheapest form of power. So there is an answer to getting to net zero while still having affordable, reliable power. But what it requires is for people to say, wind and solar have a place, but it is not the answer. There is a need for firming with a clean, reliable source, and the best engineering and economists in the world tell us that the cheapest and most affordable way to achieve that is to remove the prohibition we have on nuclear power and to invest in Australia's future. Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, pretty pleased actually with this taking note today. It's good to have an opportunity to come in and talk about the budget. I'm really proud to talk about our budget and I'm really proud to be part of a government which after only a few months is already delivering for Australians. And it must really suck to be part of a government for a decade and deliver so little for Australians. Um, this is, this is a, a good position to be in. Look, Dr Chalmers handed down a budget last night which delivers responsible cost of living relief really important. Targeted investments to build a stronger and more resilient economy and budget repair. Budget repair 
which looks to address the waste and the rorts of the last decade, sensible, reasonable initiatives to get the budget under control, whilst also making sure that we provide that support for Australians in need. And let's talk about some of these cost of living measures. Uh, one of my favourite, favourite topics, let's talk about early learning. Because in this budget, we deliver on our commitment to make early learning more affordable for 1.26 million families. 1.26 million, Senator Chacon, I'll take that interjection gladly, 1.26 million Australian families. Really, really significant. Because you know what, Senator Hughes, you know what, it's really significant. The first five years, that's when 90 per cent of the brain development happens. If you don't form those connections early, if you don't form those connections early in early childhood education, children don't have the opportunity for those connections to form. The disadvantage. Uh, sorry, Senator Hughes, yes. I think order, I have the call. Order. Through I think me, I have the Senator call. Smith. Sorry, through you, Chair. I think I have the call. Yes. Um, early childhood education, incredibly important. 1.26 million more. Uh, through you, Chair, I think I have the call. You do have the call. Do Order. I have the call, Senator Hughes? I have the call. Thanks. No, yeah, I'm not giving. I'm not giving Senator Hughes the call. I'm just ordering her right. to order. Okay. Sh shall I continue? Please, please proceed. It's, it's my, my opportunity, not not Senator Hughes. I'll go. I'll go back. Early childhood education. 1.26 million more families will have access to more affordable early learning. A huge difference to children's lives, a huge difference to parents' lives. And of course, it's not just about those critical brain connections, which will happen because more kids get to go to an early learning setting. It's also about ensuring that more Australian families can get back to work, and particularly for women who we know shoulder the burden of care far more disproportionately than their partners. It's about getting back to work. Really significant. When we come to health, I know we had some questions on health today. Well, we're slashing the PPS maximum general co-payment to $30 a script. Again, after a decade of failure on health care, of undermining Medicare, of undermining our public health care system, Labor is putting money behind our commitment to bring back Medicare to the prominence and the significance it deserves. A fund fundamental feature of our society is being able to access affordable health care, free health care indeed, when you need that assistance. It's been undermined by those opposite for a decade. We're making serious investments in our public health care system, investments I am deeply proud of. We've got more, 480,000 fee-free TAFE places, 20,000 university places for disadvantaged Australians. And yes, our Powering Australia plan, investing in cheaper, cleaner energy after a decade of no policy from those opposite. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Sorry, 20 policies, I think. Was it 20? Was it 20? None? I can't remember. I can't remember. Definitely no strategic policy direction, possibly 20 policies which never managed to see the light of day. So, serious investment and stability when it comes to climate policy, which we know is what the private sector has been calling out for for a decade to guide investment, to guide those decisions. Getting on with the job of that too. More affordable housing, of course. Very, very important. And our housing accord. Parental leave, haven't got to that yet. Six months paid parental leave by 2026, another measure which will make a significant difference in terms of continuing that connection, continuing that connection between women and the workforce and encouraging partners, both partners, to take time in those critical six months to spend more time with their children. And these are just some of the big announcements, right? These are some of the big announcements when it comes to cost of living. In my home state of South Australia, we've made more commitments, which we have funded responsibly, but for really, really important things. Things like rebuilding the Yardo Health Clinic in Sejuna. Things like community batteries, another really significant project. This budget is taking responsible efforts to combat cost of living crisis before us. I'm really proud of it, proud to be a part of a government that works and turns up and does something. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I mean, look, before I go into what I was originally going to speak about, I might point out to uh, Senator Smith that there's this, this budget is going to spend $4.5 billion in childcare to not create one new spot. Not one new spot. Now, one new spot of childcare 
not being created under $4.5 billion worth of spending. And for those of you know, I understand Senator Smith's children are very young, so she may not have gone through this process. Mine are a bit older. There's not, nothing for me in the budget for older children, by the way. It's only good if your kids are really little uh, and you want to send them to childcare. But what's going to happen, and I think we're going to see this next year, is that families that are currently in childcare will probably go from three days to four because most childcare centres have their books closed. So there are no new spots being created, no new centres, nothing. $4.5 billion to allow families to go maybe from two days to four or three days to four. And it'll be really interesting when we have a look at this in the next 12 or so months and see how many new childcare spots were created because it's a big fat zero. $4.5 billion for the families already in childcare, not creating one more new spot, nothing for the parents and the families that want to stay at home with their children. There's six extra weeks they've added to pay a parental leave scheme, six weeks, nothing for those parents that want to stay at home with their children for those five years where those brains are so busy developing, as Senator Smith pointed out, it's only to go into those childcare centres. Perhaps that's where they think the indoctrination can start. But what we saw last night was a budget that offers nothing for families. It offers nothing towards the pressures of cost of living. And in fact, it gives each and every family a bill of $2,000 for Christmas. We warned you it wasn't going to be easy under Albanese, and we're seeing that every day. Inflation. Inflation's up at 7.1 per cent now. 7.1 per cent. Not a lot of wriggle room. You're going to, let me read your mind. You're going to say that uh, the Prime Minister should be referred by his correct title. You're very good, uh, Deputy President. But yes, Senator Hughes, please order. refer to the <laughs> Prime Minister. I was going to remind you at the, at the, at the end of your contribution. Tony, for pointing that out. Uh, in fact, maybe you can point out to some of your colleagues that sit in front of you that they Senator should Hughes, refer to me, senators on this side me. of the chamber. Senator Hughes, through me, it's not a debate. Restrain yourself. It would uh, be nice to see those standards applied across the board. Senator Ciccone, but I know you are one of the few with integrity that sit on the other side. Now, what we do know is that 97 no. times we were all promised $275 off our power bill. But those of whose who understand the energy market, we know that there's more renewables in the market than ever before. More renewables than ever before. But what's happening to the power bills? Up they go, and up they go, and up they go. We're going to see an increase to power bills. We're probably going to start to see calls again. Don't put your dishwasher on after 6 p.m. So for all those families that have now got the extra six weeks paid parental leave, don't go washing those nappies or the bibs after 6 p.m. because the power is not on because you can't afford the power. Can't afford the power for all that extra time at home developing those brains. And we know that those brains needing to be developed in our young children don't count if they're in the regions. Millions of dollars pulled from autism centres in regional New South in regional Queensland because families with autism don't count to those opposite. We only like to support the 32 per cent of Australians that actually voted for those opposite, punishing the other 68 per cent of Australians. But when we talk about renewable energy and we talk about this cheaper energy that was planned and how it was all going to come through with an 82 per cent renewable target by 2030. 82 per cent. Now, what I thought I'd just point out, and even for those on my far left, because I don't think they understand what the actual requirements of this is, is 47 megawatt wind turbines, 40 of them, will need to be installed every month until 2030. So I'm just wondering, we're nearly at the end of October, where are the first 40 going? And where are the next 40 going in November? And the 40 after that in December? That's 120 needed by the end of the year. So I'm sure we'll get an update on where those 120, by the end of the year, wind turbines are going to be installed to ensure that we can work towards Mr Bowen's target. Now, we also require, on top of that, more than 22,000 500 watt panels need to be installed every day. 22,000 every day. So where are they going? over prime agricultural land? Who's going to make them? The Uyghurs in China? Because we don't seem to have a problem with slave labour when it comes to solar panels. We don't seem to have a problem of the landfill they create once they're finished with. We don't have any problems with that. So we need over 60 million solar panels by 2030. 60 million for those in the gallery. You need 60 million. Do you have a look where they're going to go? On your house, on your backyard, agricultural land along with 
those wind power wind Thank you, uh, turbines. Hughes. I put the question. Those the question. Uh, the, the question is that the motion moved to take note by Senator Macdonald. Those of the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the answer given by Minister Gallagher to questions I asked this morning relating to the budget. Uh, Senator, um, uh, budgets matter. They are a government's roadmap. With every budget dollar it allocates, a government signposts what it stands for and who it stands with. Budgets are about choices and choices about what you value. Choices about whether you want to make Australia fairer or look, look after the top end of town and leave others behind. In this budget, Labor have made a clear choice, their choice to retain stage three tax cuts, which will widen income, gender and intergenerational inequality, as have other choices they have made. They have retained negative gearing and capital gains tax benefits in relation to housing. They have refused to tax the windfall profits of the gas industry, unlike so many other countries have chosen to share those windfall gains with citizens. Indeed, the government's tax take from our existing oil and ta gas tax, the PRRT, actually falls by $450 million in this budget. What a failure of tax policy in a gas boom. These decisions all benefit corporations and the wealthy. They flow much more to men than to women, and they deliver much more for older Australians than younger. They widen inequality. And in giving away so much money to those who need it least, they narrow the opportunities to assist those who need it most. Appallingly, there was no help in this budget for those most in need in our society, those living on job seeker and youth allowance. That's a million Australians, amongst the 3.3 million who live in poverty. That's one in eight of us. Appallingly, it's one in six of our kids. Now, there's a statistic that should appear in any measure of wellbeing the ratio of our kids who live in poverty. Labor chose in this budget not to increase JobSeeker. Two weeks ago, with Senator Janet Rice, I met with a group of people living on JobSeeker, brought together by South Australia's anti-poverty network. They were living lives of anxious juggling of last dollars and complex bus route navigation to get to food bank. They talked about the long queues at free food outlets in Adelaide. They talked about rent. They often cannot afford food or medicine. They bear the scars of poverty on their faces and on their bodies. They cannot afford the health care they need. Their kids don't make it to school excursions and their, feet, their teeth hurt every day. They're living on $48 a day, well below the poverty line in this very wealthy country. It's shameful. Last night's budget was a chance to help these and all Australians who are facing the very real cost of living pressures documented in the budget by redirecting the stage three tax cuts. These cuts, a quarter of a trillion dollars, flow to very wealthy Australians, mostly men, older people, instead of helping those who are most in need. The stage three tax cuts, or a windfall tax on gas, or cutting back on housing or super tax breaks, there are a lot of unfair taxes to choose from, could have been used to help Australians. Australia does not have a tax revenue problem. It has a priorities problem, it has a courage problem, it has a leadership problem and it has a failure to stand up to sectional interests problem, whether it's coal, oil and gas or other vested interests. The cost of living crisis is real, rising rents, power, food, all against the background of flatlining wages, falling growth and rising unemployment. Why has the Labor government stuck with a $9,000 annual tax cut for the very wealthy, striking a real blow against Australia's progressive income tax system, while leaving low-income families struggling to pay for food and power. There is no economic theory or evidence to support the idea that giving older, wealthy Australians a tax break, men mostly, will increase their work participation, increase productivity, increase GDP. None of that. There is, however, a powerful bucket load of evidence that says helping women get to and stay in work, helping working carers, has a massive effect on work participation, productivity and GDP and gender inequality. We can make a difference for our kids and for women. 
In this budget, we could have done many things and made a real difference for those at the bottom end of our society, helping them face living, cost of living pressures and narrowing inequality. Instead, Labor have backed in a tax measure that mostly benefits wealthy men while offering women no superannuation on their paid parental leave, no matching of, paid parent, of their normal pay rate in their paid leave, and making them wait four years to just get 26 weeks of paid parental leave, which is half the international standard. Thank we you. can do put, so much better. I'll put the question to the motion moved by Senator Pocock. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Are there any motions? Well, oops, we've done that. Um, do, there's a petition, so I'm going to call the clerk. President, a petition has been lodged, as noted on the dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in the Hansard. Thank you. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Pratt? On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation and the Chair Linda White, I give notice of the intention at the giving of notices on the next sitting day uh, to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion numbers 135 sorry I beg your pardon 134 and 5 for eight sitting days after today proposing the disallowance of the air navigation aircraft noise amendment 2021 measures number 1 regulations 2021 Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment Health Measures No. 9 Regulations 2021 Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment Prime Minister and Cabinet Measure No. 11 Regulations 2021 and the Industry Research and Development Underwriting New Generation Investments Program Instrument of 2021 and Business of the Senate Notices of Motion 3 for 14 sitting days after today proposing the disallowance of the Bankruptcy Amendment Service of Documents Regulation 2022. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Are there any other notices to be given for another day? Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired or uh, to postpone or rearrange the business? No, uh, it's none of those. We'll uh, now move uh, uh, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 13th of October 2022 of Mr John Michael Spender KC, a former member of the House of Representatives for the Division of North Sydney, New South Wales, from 1980 to 1990. I shall now proceed to the, the discovery of formal business. Um, and I'll go to uh, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of the uh, Australian Green, Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. And I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Thanks, President. Uh, Australian households are hurting with high energy bills and rising interest rates. Electricity and gas prices will rise by something like 50 per cent in 2023. The Australian Energy Regulator has warned energy prices will remain high for years, driven by generator closures and a looming shortfall in gas supply. And Labor has already broken its 275 lower energy bill election promise and does not have a plan for new reliable 24-7 energy generation. The underwriting new generation Investment program is essential to keep, deliver, to keep delivering the dispatchable energy generation Australia requires to keep the lights on and the pressure on prices. So the question is that business of the Senate number one, moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes. Division required. Um, ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew for teller for the noes. Ayes and 29 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, I am advised there may be a couple of other divisions. So um, I'll now move to general business um, notice of motion number 68, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck. 68. On behalf of Senator Colbeck, I ask that general business notice of motion number 68 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 68 uh, be, take, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, the noes have it. No. Division required? Four minutes. Ring the bells for four minutes. One minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 68, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 30 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to uh, general business notice of motion number 66, standing in the name of Senator Hanson, please. I ask that general business notice of motion number 66 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator uh, Rustin. Uh, thank you, President. Um, we believe that the matter that is uh, the subject of uh, this request for attendance in the chamber um, is appropriately has been dealt with by referral to the Privileges Committee, so the opposition will not be supporting this thank motion. You, Senator Rustin. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 66, moved by Senator Hanson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. Order. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 66 in the name of Senator Hanson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order, there being two ayes and 51 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The next lot of um, just advised senators, there's a group of uh, order for production of documents which are grouped together. I'm going to deal with uh, general business uh, notices of motion number 61 to 65, standing in the name of Senator Macdonald. I oh, beg your pardon, sorry, Senator McKim. Um, thank you, President. It just was a little bit hard to hear. Can I ask, are you dealing with the group from 61 to 65? That's correct, Senator McKim, but we haven't called them even yet. Thank you. Senator Macdonald. Notice, no, notices of motion number 61 to 65 be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to these motions being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Macdonald. I move the motions. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. Could I please uh, indicate that the Greens have a different position on some of these motions sure. and we'd like the question to be put sure. separately. Yep. Uh, so I can indicate that our position on numbers 61 and 62 is different to our position on motions 63 to 65. Okay. Um, so uh, Senator Macdonald has put the motion and as the Chamber's just heard, um, Senator McKim's indicated he wants them split out. So we'll deal with uh, general business notice of motion number 61. Uh, it's been taken as formal um, uh, 61 and 62 together. Were you happy for them together? Thank you. Um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And then we'll deal with uh, six, general business notice of a motion number 63. 63 to 65. And Senator Macdonald has moved those, so I'm going to put that vote. So uh, those in favour say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Thank you. <laughs>
lock the doors. So we're now dealing with general business, notice of motion number 63 to 65, moved by Senator Macdonald. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. There being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 56 to 57, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Senator Smith. No, are you right? Okay. okay. Uh, yes. I ask that general business notice of motions number 56 and 57 be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to these motions being taken as formal? Uh, yes, there are. Oh, no? <laughs> it's dangerous. So put your hand up. Senator Steele John. Put a statement on the motion, not on the formality. Okay. All right. Well, we'll move it and then you can make your motion. So, Senator Dean Smith. Thank you. And Senator Steele John, you're seeking. Yes, leave. I am. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, the, the, the object of this OPD is of critical importance to the Senate and to the public. Uh, we are seeking to obtain from the government uh, information provided to the Defence Minister uh, in relation to their co-hosting of the ASEAN Defence Ministers plus experts meeting in Brunei. Uh, in early November. Now, this is of utmost importance because present uh, at that meeting uh, will be representatives of the military junta currently uh, in control of Myanmar. The public, uh, the National Unity Government, uh, the Myanmar diaspora deserve to know exactly what is being told to our Defence Minister as they prepare to cohabitate uh, a space alongside uh, such representatives of such a reprehensible regime. Thank you, Senator Steele John. So the question is that Oh beg your pardon, Senator Chisholm. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. Uh, the government won't be supporting this order for production of documents. Australia is gravely concerned about ongoing human rights abuses by the Myanmar military regime, including recent reports of civilian killed by military airstrikes in the Kachin state. We will continue to speak clearly and consistently in support of human rights around the world, and we will act. Australia has reduced contact with the Myanmar uh, military regime to any essential engagement. Uh, while engagement is unavoidable, we take every opportunity to convey Australia's grave concerns about the deteriorating security and humanitarian situation in Myanmar and strongly condemn the actions of the military regime. Neither the Minister for Foreign Affairs nor the Minister for De Defence will attend the workshop in Brunei for the Asian Defence Minister's meeting, uh, plus experts' working group on military medicine. While Australia is a co-host, this is an ASEAN-led 
meeting with the final decision on participation is phrasing. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 56 to 57, standing in the name of Senator Smith, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Uh, the ayes have it. Division required? No. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Moving right along. I will now move to uh, general business notice of motion number 54, standing in name of Senator Roberts. Thank you. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 54 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 54, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <clears throat>
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 54, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 40 ayes and 19 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to general business notice of no motion number 55, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie. Senator Askew. Senator Mackenzie, I ask that general business notice of motion number 55 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the, oh, Senator Chisholm? Short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. Our budget delivers on our plan the Australian people voted for. The budget contains billions of dollars for major investment projects in our cities and in our regions in every state and territory. The Albanese government wants Australia's regions to thrive. Importantly, the government is delivering two new regional programs worth $1 billion, working with communities and local councils to invest in infrastructure in a way that is transparent, fair and more sustainable. We are working with local communities to deliver sound and planned infrastructure in regional Australia that creates jobs, builds opportunity and unlocks economic growth and productivity. It's a responsible budget that starts to clean up the mess the Liberals left behind and begins to build a better future the Australian people and people in regional Australia deserve. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 55, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie and moved by Senator Astrid, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Uh, lock the doors. 
So the question is that general business notice of motion number 55, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Order, there being 39 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We now move to business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Orman Payne. Senator Payne. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, President. I ask that the business of the Senate notice of motion number two be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Orman Payne. I move the motion. Senator Chisholm? You have to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government will be opposing this disallowance motion. The Capital Grants Program provides funding for non government schools to improve capital infrastructure where they otherwise may not have access to sufficient capital resources. The Capital Grants Program has strong long-term bipartisan support. Funding is allocated to schools according to identified student need. We made the point before the election that we remain committed to working with the states and territories to get every school to 100 per cent of its fair funding level, and that absolutely remains the case. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Orman Payne? Seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, one minute. Uh, is granted. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, President. Uh, these regulations would increase the capital funding indexation percentage for block grant authorities for non government schools in 2022, thereby increase, increasing federal funding to capital works for private schools by 15.6 million, up to a total annual sum of 194.5 million. As of last night's budget, private school funding across the forward estimates will now be $1.7 billion more than the amount the previous government committed in their final budget. A greater proportion of federal funding for schools is now going to private schools worse than the Morrison government. This disallowance would maintain the indexation for capital works for non-government schools at its current rate. It doesn't suddenly rip money away from private schools. They still get $179 million per year for capital works. Thank you, uh, Senator Orman Payne. So the question is that business of the Senate uh, notice of motion number two, uh, be, as moved by Senator Orman Payne, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate notice of motion number two uh, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Uh, Senator Lambie, once the doors are locked, you shouldn't be allowed in. On this occasion, it's not going to make any difference, um, but really, you should not have been allowed in. But I called close the doors, and the doors had been closed. Um, I'll put the motion again. Business of the Senate, number two. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 12 ayes and 42 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now am moving to government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Chisholm. Before asking that it is taken on for as formal, I seek leave to amend government business notice of motion number one. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Uh, is, is that agreed to? The motion be taken as formal? Yes. No objections. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. So, so the question is that a government business number one, uh, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to government business uh, number two, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, and I call Senator Chisholm. I ask that government business notice of motion number two, proposing a reference to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion and table a statement in relation to the works. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business. Notice of motion number 53, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Bragg, I ask that general business notice of motion number 53 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute. Senator Chisholm. It is not appropriate for Africa to appear at budget estimates. 
AFCA is a non, not a government department or regulatory agency. It is not for profit public company and is not publicly funded. AFCA have made themselves available to Parliament for oversight and transparency through various committees. Senator Bragg had the opportunity to ask questions of AFCA when they appeared before the Senate Economics Legislation Committee as recently as the 14th of October. The government does not support this precedent where the Senate as a whole negotiates witness lists for respective committee hearings. That should remain a role for individual committees to establish. This is a political stunt, as we often see from Senator Bragg, and we will not support this motion. So the question is that general business order. The question is that general business notice of motion number 53, standing in the name of Senator Bragg, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion uh, 58 to 60, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Senator Smith. That general business notices of motion 58 to 60 to be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to those all being taken together? No, there are none. Senator Smith. I move the motions. So the question is that general business 58 to 60, standing in the name of Senator Smith, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The following proposal from Senator David Pocock has been received under Standing Order 75. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The rate of job seeker needs to be raised in order to lift more than three million Australians out of poverty and stop one in six Australian children growing up in poverty given the current cost of living crisis that last night's budget forecast will worsen, with huge increases to energy costs, food and rent, amongst other essentials. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussions. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. Behind some of the welcome and big-ticket items in last night's budget, like the new housing accord that aspires to deliver a million homes over the next five years, expanded childcare subsidies, more paid parental leave and cheaper medicine, there lies a bigger, much more worrying story. A story of rising inflation, rising interest rates, slowing GDP growth, rising unemployment and rising cost of living across the country. The last one is a real killer. A 56% forecast rise in electricity prices, a 44% forecast rise in gas prices, a jump in both groceries and rent. The Treasurer is saying we're unlikely to see a rise in real wages for at least another couple of years. But despite this acknowledgement, the government hasn't done anything in terms of raising the rate for job seeker, Oz study, or Commonwealth rent assistance. Now, I absolutely understand and commend the need for responsible economic management to live within our means and the many other phrases bandied around this place when it comes to the budget. But equally, I simply don't accept that we can let this crisis continue. The budget is about priorities, and what we've heard from the new Labor government in their first mini-budget is that the three million Australians living in poverty are not a priority. The one in six children across Australia who are growing up in poverty are not a priority to the new government. We have to think about this in terms of the things that we are happy to spend money on. 
at a time when fossil fuel companies are pulling in record profits, we're still happy to subsidize them. We're still happy to pour money into things like the Middle Arm project, $1.9 billion here, um, a few, a few billion dollars there for the, for the gas industry. But yet when it comes to Australians in our communities who desperately need the support, we're silent. The government had an opportunity to increase JobSeeker. $48 a day is not enough to live on. We heard the government pat themselves on the back when that was indexed and went from $46 to $48. $48 is still nowhere near enough. And let's be clear, the choices that we make in this place and, and in the other place are keeping one in six children across Australia, one of the most wealthy countries in the world, living in poverty. This has huge implications, you know, not just for those kids' future, but for all of our futures, to have one in six children growing up in poverty, to have three million Australians living below the poverty line. We know times are tough. Here in the ACT, our frontline services are stretched to breaking point. Food pantries have massive lines, are battling to get enough staff. People with jobs are struggling. So how do, how do we not support people who are in between jobs, looking for jobs, trying to get their lives back on track and to get back into the labour market? I really implore the government to think more about this. You're governing for the Australian people. You're answerable to those three million Australians that through your decisions are being left to live on $48 a day. Those one in six children who are growing up in poverty, whose whole, the rest of their life will be shaped by the experiences of growing up in poverty, of growing up not being able to afford things, of looking at their friends at school and asking, why can't I have that? Why do I have to live like that? These are the choices that we are privileged to make in this place. I implore the government to raise the rate before or at the next budget in May. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Pratt. Thank you to Senator Pocock for this motion, but I have to say there is not a day that goes by that I don't, do not take this issue extremely seriously. We recognise that living on income support payments is extremely challenging. As a government, however, we face competing calls on the budget, which sadly we have to make very difficult choices on. In the budget that we have just done, we have sought uh, to put some money back in people's pockets, including through cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicine, more affordable housing, and to support uh, low-income households that are, in, uh, the, uh, that are earning wages. To, to demonstrate how complicated this issue is, and I, I don't mean to overstate it in terms of complexity, but the, the kind of way the issue has to be managed. 4.7 million Australians received a boost to their government payments just through the indexation adjustments made uh, in September this year. Now, I'm not saying that that fixes the problem, but what I'm saying to you is that that increase in and of itself adds about $10 billion worth of costs to the, to the bottom line of the budget over the forward estimates. And so when we look to supporting families and we look to supporting households, particularly the most vulnerable ones uh, in our society, we need to make sure that the changes that we make are sustainable. 
the rate will be considered again in the next budget. But there is little point, as we've had a history of doing, of having a one-off supplement bu uh, boost here or there, uh, if we are simply setting up a system that is unsustainable. I also think we need to look at the whole package of needs of a family, and it's important to recognise that it's not $48 a day uh, when we're dealing with families. We need to include your family tax benefits A and B, and that these are targeted payments along with rent assistance for low-income households. So when it comes to looking at government policies in the future in this regard, we need to be looking at the holistic system of the kind of support that people get. I would note in this regard that uh, the House of Representatives currently has an inquiry, for example, into Workforce Australia and is also doing an inquiry into Parents Next. Parents Next uh, has purportedly been a program to support parents with young children to get ready for re-entering the workforce, and it has had historically a whole bunch of mutual obligations attached to it, uh, which I might note uh, have been suspended in recent times. And I note in that context that uh, these programs like that uh, that have been driven by uh, the last government haven't really known whether they are a parenting support program or whether they are an employment pathway program. And I note in that regard that the resources that we put into parts of the uh, community for programs like that the resources that we put into places like Medicare, they're only good if people can use them. They're only good if, uh, and so we do need to continue to deliberate about where our funding is best spent in a social welfare and community sense. And that is why we are looking very actively at these issues, for example, uh, through uh, the inquiry in Workforce Australia in the lower house. We acknowledge uh, that the release of the Poverty in Australia report of Thank 2022, you, for Price. example— Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I too rise to speak on this MPI. And I'll, I'll start uh, through you. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, to uh, the mover of this MPI, Senator Pocock. Um, and I, I will start by noting the change of tone from those opposite on this topic since, uh, since we were in government. There, when they were sitting on this side, it was all very easy. It was all very easy to throw round promises, to make claims, to, to push barrows that could never be fulfilled when you have to take a responsible economic approach to the budget. I mean, the sad reality uh, of what we've seen over the last 24 hours uh, in terms of cost of living pressures impacting all Australians, including those on, uh, on social welfare, is that there's very little in this budget for them. Uh, in fact, we've seen an abject failure on one of the key promises uh, surrounding energy costs, and we've seen uh, the abject failure today, just today, of the Treasurer in explaining the promise to deliver a $275 uh, reduction in electricity costs, which would make a difference, particularly, particularly to low-income Australians. $275 would have made a real difference to low-income Australians. But the Treasurer today, in his, his mishearing of a question, uh, in the press club and, and his, his uh, subsequent response in question time shows that he's not even sure if the $275 was in the budget or wasn't in the budget. And if it was in the budget, 
then it was clearly a broken promise because the budget shows that electricity prices are going to rise. They're going to rise, not, not, not just by a small amount, but by something like 50 per cent. Uh, and so you've seen in a situation where Australians, particularly low-income Australians, do rely on a budget taking these kinds of issues seriously, that uh, this government's failed the first test. It's failed the first test of achieving what it said it was going to achieve, and it's, it, it's failed the test of competence in answering questions on what are very straightforward issues. Are they going to deliver the 275? Is it in the budget or not? These aren't complex questions. These are easy questions. And a lot of Australians, including Australians on income support, would like the answer to them. And unfortunately, we just get confusion from the Treasurer. Now, uh, in the few minutes remaining to me, I just do want to set the record straight on the issue because sometimes um, there's a lot of misinformation distributed about the coalition government's record in this area. Uh, in particular, in the last couple of years of the government, the coalition government provided unprecedented payments uh, right across the economy to assist those on low incomes, to assist those on welfare, to assist those uh, uh, who were doing it very, very tough in an unprecedented time. In fact, $32 billion in emergency support payments, which the which the current government now often labels as wasted spending or, or somehow uh, poor expenditure of money. At the time, of course, they, they supported it and, uh, and it kept the economy strong. In fact, we delivered an economy that was in very good shape, an economy that was growing, an economy that had delivered record low unemployment, growing, uh, job, uh, growing numbers of people in jobs and uh, extraordinary opportunities in the economy for people who were looking for a job. So the coalition government uh, also delivered uh, the first increase in support payments uh, since I believe, uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right, since um, 1986. So the coalition government actually had a very proud record in this area. We also made it clear to the Australian people that there were economic headwinds, including inflation, uh, and that um, a sensible response by the Commonwealth Government was required as we shepherded the economy forward. Now that is the challenge of the Labor Government, and they failed the first test. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President. Last night we watched the Treasurer, Mr Dr Chalmers, and the Labor government deliver a budget that's going to give tax cuts of $9,000 a year to the wealthy, to billionaires, to everyone in this place. Tax cuts of $9,000 a year, while doing absolutely zero in the budget last night for the millions of Australians who are absolutely struggling to survive on income support. This was a Labor government budget. What is the point of Labor? Poverty is a political choice, and Labor last night showed they had made their choice. In this budget, they have chosen to give tax cuts to the wealthy at the cost of $254 billion over the next 10 years, rather than do anything for the millions of Australians, including the one in six children in Australia, who are living in poverty. This is not complex. These are people who are absolutely struggling. Every day, millions of Australians are having to make decisions as to whether they eat, whether they pay for their medicines, whether they pay for their rent. I recently spoke to one person struggling to survive on the job seeker payment who told me, I'll be 63 in a couple of weeks. No one will employ me at my age. I went food shopping the other day. For the first time in my life, I contemplated shoplifting because I could not afford the food I wanted to buy. My next door neighbour is, is older, an ex tradie His knees and back are gone due to hard work. He's a year away from the pension. He is shoplifting food to survive 
and he's giving me some of it. I volunteered all my life, but due to a bad motorbike accident that almost severed my right hand 10 years ago, I've had to stop doing that. I was a volunteer wildlife rescuer. I volunteered for the women's hospital, the children's hospital, op shops. When I lived in a regional town, I volunteered with the CWA, the CFA, the SES. I've consistently put back into society, and now I and many like me have been left behind on the scrap heap, forced to contemplate breaking the law to eat. I would prefer my name remain anonymous, as I don't want people to know that I'm considering stealing food. I don't want that stigma attached to me, even though I'm living a stigmatised life while on job seeker. Raise the rate and lower the retirement age. I'm tired. We are living in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet people are forced to shoplift to eat. And there are tax cuts that are going to give the wealthy a $9,000 a year extra in their pocket, delivered last night in a Labor budget. And the budget also told us that rents are in increasing sharply, that electricity is going to go up 56 per cent. This budget does not cater for people who are just barely scraping by. It punishes people living in poverty. If this had been a Greens budget, there would have been different choices being made. It would have included a livable income guarantee, ensuring support was there for everyone who needed it. Because poverty is a political choice. We would raise the rate of job seeker to above the poverty line, to above $88 a day, abolish all punitive parts of our income support system and return the provision of employment system services back to the Commonwealth. And our livable income guarantee would sit side by side with the Greens' plans to build a million affordable homes, to increase wages and reduce the costs of essential services like dental care and childcare by making them free. I mean, we know this is possible if we are willing to make the billionaires and the big corporations and the very wealthy pay their fair share rather than giving them tax cuts. Instead, we are pay going to be paying out hundreds of billions of dollars in tax cuts. I mean, lifting people out of poverty can be done. We saw during the height of the pandemic the government double job seeker above the poverty line and abolish all mutual obligations. And during this time, people were able to improve their lives, meet their basic needs, and their mental and physical health improved. Advocacy groups, people living in poverty, have repeatedly called on Labor to raise the rate of income support. Yet Labor has failed to listen, and this budget has done nothing to improve the lives of the 5.1 million Australians struggling to survive on meagre income support payments. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Burdett. Thank you. Now, Labor's budget is a disaster. The cost of living is going up. Power prices are going up. Taxes are going up. Unemployment is going up. The only thing that isn't going up are your wages. Now, this Labor government continually promises to reduce the cost of living while simultaneously increasing the cost of living. Their strategy to lower prices is to increase prices. I can't for the life of me work out which is more incredible. The claims that this Labor government makes or the fact that this government expects Australians to believe their claims. Now, during the election, Labor promised many times that they would reduce the cost of power prices by approximately what, by $275. Instead, they're set to go up by more than 50 per cent. Now, this Labor government insists, insists that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy, or at least it will be, just as soon as they spend $10 billion here and another $10 billion there. You know what? There seems to be a direct relationship between how much of our money Labor spent on their renewable energy fantasy and how many times they assure us that it result in cheaper power. It'll just take a few more billion dollars, as always. Now, if you believe that, if you believe that, you have the one prerequisite necessary to do the energy minister's job. And what is that prerequisite? Well, it is wishful thinking. 
That's what it is. Now, the energy crisis, which in turn is increasing the cost of everything else, has nothing to do with Vladimir Putin and the war in Ukraine, like some would have you believe. Labor made its promise to reduce power prices after Russia invaded the Ukraine. It has everything to do with Labor, the Greens and the Closet Greens on all sides of this chamber who are sabotaging cheap energy in this country. Now, while Australia is pursuing, frankly, crazy climate policies, China is building more than half the world's coal-fired power plants, strengthening their economy, increasing their standard of living. At the same time, the price of food is going up, partly because of floods, but mostly because of the skyrocketing cost of energy, making it more and more expensive to get Aussie food onto supermarket shelves. And now, for good measure, the Labor government also wants to lower methane, which will almost certainly become a tax on cows farting. That's what's going to happen, a tax on cows farting. It's going to drive up the cost of your average Aussie barbecue at the same time. Now, the soaring cost of living is not just a problem for the unemployed. It is a problem for everyone. Families paying off a mortgage, pensioners, retirees trying to keep cool in summer and warm in winter, businesses trying to employ people, everyone. In fact, as energy prices go through the roof, manufacturers are going to be forced to go offshore, probably to China, because China isn't crippled by crazy climate policies, which obviously results in unaffordable energy, and it is becoming harder, obviously, for businesses to keep the doors open and the lights on. Now, the real solution to the cost of living crisis is not a handout. It is affordable energy, getting rid of red and green tape and keeping government spending and taxes low so that Australia can be a land of opportunity. Raising the rate of job seeker is not a viable long-term solution. We absolutely have a responsibility to keep disadvantaged Australians um, well looked after. But the best way to do this is by creating conditions in which industry can thrive so that they can be gainfully employed. It is industry that creates jobs, not government. Now, increasing the size of our welfare programs will raise our already unsustainable debt level further. This will inevitably lead to higher taxes and it will make it harder for families and pensioners to look after themselves and harder for business to employ people. The government can't have skyrocketing power prices and a generous welfare system. The government can't trash our competitive advantage, which is cheap, reliable, abundant energy in the form of coal and gas and then expect people to prosper. Thank you, Senator Babette. Your time has expired. And if no one else wants to call, the time for the discussion has expired. The President has also received the following letter from Senator Dean Smith. Pursuant to Senate Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Albanese Labor government has delivered a high-taxing, high-spending budget that has no plan to address the cost of living crisis, predicts 140,000 Australians losing their jobs, slashes funding to regional and rural Australia, breaks Labor's promise to the Australian people to reduce power prices by $275 annually, instead hiking power prices by 50 per cent, and a budget that has left Australians poorer, with the average family being at least $2,000 off worse by Christmas. Is the proposal supported? So, Could I just ask, seek some clarification in terms of a vote on the motion from Senator Pocock? Is that Senator Rice, it's a matter of public importance, so it wasn't a vote. Votes happen when there's a matter of public urgency. They're different. They're treated differently. Uh, so the proposal is supported. There were five people standing. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I hope Australian families know how to swim, because the Labor Treasurer of just six months standing, Mr Jim Chalmers has thrown them in the deep end and is not 
offering them a lifeline. Not offering them a lifeline. This afternoon, you'll hear coalition senators, Labor senators, make their contributions, their observations about last night's budget. But let me share with the chamber what the Daily Telegraph had to say today. Bug all. That's what the budget does to combat intense cost of living pressures being felt right now. But Jim Chalmers argues new immediate help would do more harm than good by adding to inflation. No lifeline for Australian families. The Financial Review this morning said the Albanese government has warned of hard days to come as it laid the groundwork for an agenda of tax increases and spending cuts, with a federal budget that forecasts debt and deficit over the next decade to be worse than just six months ago, and no lifeline for Australian families. The Australian newspaper has said today Jim Chalmers puts hard calls on hold in a forgettable economic statement. I think Labor took a huge liberty last night, took a huge liberty over the last six months, by calling, preparing the country for a budget which at best was an economic statement, at worst provides no confidence to Australian families as they face the very real, immediate impacts of rising cost of living. And then finally, Sky News has said this budget is about giving with one hand to families and telling them, on the other hand, power prices are going to take it away again, if not more. Six months ago, Australian families put their faith in Labor. Labor's narrow election victory carried the hopes of many ordinary Australian families and what they got last night, the news that they woke up to this morning, is that the priorities and the needs of Australian families are of no interest to Labor, are of no interest to Anthony Albanese, are of no interest to Jim Chalmers. What did the budget say last night? The budget added to those 97 occasions already where Labor had promised a 275 cut in power prices. This budget confirms a more than 50 per cent increase in energy prices. Labor had promised to the Australian people in the lead-up to the election campaign there would be an improvement in real wages. The budget showed that real wages are going backwards. The budget also showed that Labor has dumped the tax cap and Labor's plans are to deliver a sneaky new tax on investors and retirees. Let's see how far that goes when that particular Treasury bill comes to the Senate. The situation facing Australian families is stark. Petrol is on the rise, mortgage costs are on the rise, food is on the rise. And Mr Chalmers and the Prime Minister have decided that Australian families should suffer that Australian families should be the front line of this country's defence in these challenging economic times. In his first speech as Prime Minister-elect on election night, Mr Albanese, the Prime Minister, made it very, very clear, made it very, very clear to Australians who did vote for him, but also Australians that didn't vote for him, what his core promise would be what his core promise would be. He said, no one would be left behind because we should always look after the disadvantaged and the vulnerable. He went on to say, he went on to promise that no one will be held back because we should always support aspiration and opportunity. And at the first opportunity, Labor had to put its values on display to our country. It decided it would not provide much needed support. It would not provide a lifeline to Australian families. It is a shocking, rude, sad revelation. Australian families would have gone to bed last night, woke up this morning realising that the future is bleak ahead of them. Senator Sheldon. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Yeah, I said, you know, we've been here before, you know, hearing this cost of living arguments from the opposition. 
you know, I've, I've said you know, they lean in with their chin. Last time they leaned in with their entire body. Now the whole team of them are throwing their selves over the cliff. Like to think that these people have no shame. They come here and lecture the Australian people what they demanded for this last election, which we delivered last night, as a mistake. See, these are the people that brought a trillion dollars debt and showed nothing for it. They show absolutely nothing for it. These are the people that had a design feature for low wages. They said low wages is a design feature of how they are going to run the economy. And guess what? That's what we've got from them. That's what the consequences are. These are the same people that have seen, for the first time in the history of this country, the middle class shrinking under their watch. And they're coming here and lecturing us about what should or shouldn't be done. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. They have no policies. Remember that was official? They have no policies. They've got no plan. They've got no thought. They've got no strategy. Because we know the strategy they've adopted has done over people in this country now for nine years. And of course, then you say you look at some of the areas where change has taken place. But think about what they've done in the aged care sector. Think about what their position was about the aged care sector. No support for aged care workers, feminised industries. Think about all the low paid workers, men and women of this country, when they, uh, the, the proposition for a dollar an hour wage increase. Where were they? They opposed it. They opposed it. And they come in here with no shame, every one of them, and say that they have a position that's right. Well, quite clearly, in the budget last night, there's a whole series of critically important pieces that will make a change and a difference for thousands and millions of working Australians and people in our community. The cheaper childcare strategy. I mean, quite clearly, there are going to be millions of people that are going to be better off as a result of the early education program. That is an investment in the future, not money given off to Alan Joyce with no accountability, $2 billion. Not something where you know, uh, we can watch and see you know, the, the, um, some of the you know, biggest names in some of the companies around this country which were given uh, billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, to turn around and, and spend on bogus training pa packages. I mean, I mean look, no offence to Grill, I occasionally eat their burgers myself. But I tell you what, giving them millions of dollars to set up a burger university to train people for just cheap labour. That's the strategies they have. The difference for us is that we have a clear strategy. 180,000 places, fee-free for TAFE and vocational educational places. That will give capacity for our economy. It will give ability for people to earn more. It will give an opportunity for our economy to turn around and have the skilled labour that we need to have from Australians. And those 20,000 new university places over the next two years, again, it's investment in our future. It's an investment in right now. It means that money that would be coming out of people's pockets to do those things aren't happening, but it's value-adding to the economy. It's value-adding to households. And, of course, expanding the paid parental leave to six months. Where are they about that? You, you don't think that's a cost of living saving? You don't think that's actually an advantage for people, women in particular, but for men and women in our community? You think that's an important gender equity question, which actually has value right across the economy? Or, more, of course, more affordable housing. More affordable housing. I mean, that, seriously, you're going to sit here and say to the government, as the ex-government, the ones that shrunk the middle class, said low wages as a strategy, have turned around and given us this housing crisis, then when we're coming up with solutions from our side, that that is not a solution that's actually affecting the cost of living? Well, of course it is. It logically is. It has the capacity to. It has the obvious support that will have that, uh, that outcome. And of course, getting wages missing, uh, moving will be the great example that there will be the real test for these people with no shame. That will be the real test to see whether they support improvements in employment relations arrangements in this country that will finally get wages moving and not put it off to the never-never, do it as quickly and as smartly and as effectively as we possibly can to make sure Australians get a better and a fairer go. Senator Roberts.
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak in favour of the matter of public importance moved by Senator Smith. This budget contains page after page of regulations and schemes designed to centrally manage the economy and extra bureaucrats to make sure that happens. Missing from this budget is real infrastructure. Queensland has lost Hell's Gates Dam, despite a business case that clearly showed the dam will provide a return on investment. And I thank the Senate for agreeing this afternoon to my document discovery to bring that report to the public. Urana Dam funding has been cancelled, a dam that would have grown Australia's high value agriculture industry and make a substantial contribution to the government's own target of $100 billion of agricultural output at Farmgate. Hewenden Irrigation Project, a wonderful project in North Queensland, has been deferred despite the agricultural potential of the Flinders River Black Soil Plains to bring prosperity to our north. Queensland deserves better than Labor government that hates agriculture. Energy is missing from this budget. Nature-dependent power currently receives $13 billion a year in renew renewable energy subsidies. If the, nature of nature in the, na if the number of nature-dependent power plants is to increase to meet the 2030 target, then the allowance for the increase in subsidies should be showing in this budget. Yet it's not. Where is the baseload power generation? Nowhere. Blackouts, here we come. In Wednesday's financial review, the ABS announced that power prices in the September quarter rose 15.6 per cent, or 60 per cent annualised. This is a catastrophe for struggling families and small businesses. How can any business have the confidence to invest when they see a basic business input blowing, with no, blowing out with no end in sight? This budget is an economic suicide note. One Nation support productive capacity, less red tape, creating wealth and a future for everyday Australians who are the core of our nation. Senator McDonald. No, Senator Brown. Oh, no, yes, it is Senator McDonald. Sorry. Thank you very much. This budget, I, I rise with, with great pleasure to speak to this MPI as proposed by Senator Smith, because this budget is a, truly a fabrication, uh, a, a paper mache collection of lies and mistruths. Uh, the Labor Party, the uh, government now, went to the last election uh, with a whole series of commitments and promises which they have one by one broken, whether it be uh, Rockhampton Ring Road funding, whether it be uh, the capital of Israel, whether it be uh, funding for various projects where they led Australians on and uh, made the, um, the commitment that they would be supporting particularly regional Australia. This budget is actually uh, has more income than the last budget. It's up by $50 billion, thanks to commodity prices. But what has the government done with that increased income? Well, they've spent it. They've spent it. <clears throat> so spending is up from $628 billion to $651 billion. And that's not talking about the balance sheet items, the $20 billion for the power grid sp expenditure, $15 billion for the reconstruction funding and another $10 billion. This budget is based on inflation increasing effectively to 7.75 per cent by the end of this year, but the government projects that by next year it will have fallen to 3.5 per cent, which seems a bold a very bold statement to make. Real wages will continue going backwards. Wages will increase by 3.75 per cent, but that is not going to meet the inflation figures. People will lose jobs uh, in 2023, according to Labor, based on the predicted unemployment rate of 4.5 per cent—140,000 people out of work. I think this is a budget that is misleading in the extreme, because what, what has happened is that money has been ripped out of productive projects, projects that you would invest in if you were building a nation, if you were looking to the future. What this is is a Robin Hood budget that steals jobs from the future, but I just don't know who they are giving them to. Uh, families will be $2,000 worse off under Labor by Christmas. Uh, we already pay more in the regions, but this is going to increase. We pay more for fuel, for groceries, for insurance, for electricity, for airfares. But to Labor's eternal shame, they looked Australians in the eye, they begged for their vote, 
and promised, in exchange for that, a reduction of electricity prices by $275 per year. Now, uh, Minister Gallagher has told us that that $275 reduction is in the budget. She said that today at question time, that it's in the budget. And I look forward to having that being explained further to me. Labor's telling regional people and businesses here that a war 12,000 kilometres away is why they have to break a key election promise made 97 times. And regional people have a nose for political spin, and these excuses stink. Power prices going up by more than 50 per cent, gas prices going up by more than 40 per cent, taxes up, employment up, interest rates up, inflation up. But there's one thing that's not going up. Under Labor, real wages are not going up. Labor wants to cut Australia's methane emissions, but this will be impossible if they continue with these excuses and lies. And on the upside, at least our meat herds won't need culling. We'll just need Labor to stop talking. Regions have smaller populations. I wonder if those opposite would like the opportunity to speak, because they're certainly speaking a lot now. No? Thank you. Regions have smaller populations. Businesses have static customer numbers, and an increase in costs will push them to the wall. 50 per cent increase on power prices will result in business closures, jobs lost and uh, increasingly difficult circumstances thanks to the headlong rush to emissions reductions without a plan, without a plan to genuinely transition the economy. Local butchers and pubs will have to charge people more and put people off staff. Why do regions matter? Well, for Labor, a small town is just a photo opportunity but so much more for the people, businesses and councils that live and operate there. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I, that contri contribution by Senator MacDonald was like we were in some sort of twilight zone. Um, um, that she talked about interest rates rising, cost of living rises, real wage increases when after uh, 10 years of uh, a coalition government, their whole, um, their whole deliberate uh, act design feature of their budget was to keep wages low. It, it's extraordinary, that contribution. It, it completely ignores act the actual facts of um, what this um, a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong, wrong priorities that this um, coalition government let, uh, left us in. And let's not forget, they did leave us with a trillion dollars worth of debt uh, without much to show for it. And I have to say, I have to say, I was so uh, proud to be in the other place last night to hear our Treasurer deliver the 2022-23 budget speech. It's for the first time in 10 years, a Labor budget was presented to the people of this country, a budget which is responsible, right for the times and ready for the future. Making good decisions now is critical to making sure no one is held back and no one is left behind. Because much of what we presented last night was motivated by cost of living and pressures faced by Australians around the country brought about by the lingering impacts of the pandemic, the war in the Ukraine and by natural disasters at home, leading to pressures on supply chains and prices. Budgets at their best bring together the global and the local. This budget delivers for all Australians, helping them manage the cost of living pressures and plans for the future with our five-point uh, cost of living plan. Cheaper Childcare, cheaper medicines, expanding the paid parental leave to six months, more affordable housing, and getting wages moving again. Our plan for cheap childcare will support families and deliver an economic dividend. The $4.5 billion plan will cut, cut the cost of early education and care for around 1.26 million Australian families, easing the cost of living pressures 
giving children access to critical early education and giving parents the opportunity to work and earn more if they want to. And we're making medicines cheaper for Australian households. For the first time in its 75-year history, the maximum cost of general scripts under the PBS will fall. We are delivering $531 million investment to, to expand the paid parental leave system up to 26 weeks by July 2026. This is the biggest boost to Australia's paid parental leave scheme since it was created by who? The former Labor government in 2011, because the other side, the coalition government, they don't create. They don't create those, project, those uh, programs that make significant real change in people's lives. So this, the extension will support parents to spend more time with their children and share caring responsibilities more equally. We will also deliver 40,000 new social and affordable houses, including 30,000 from the Housing Australia Future Fund and an additional 10,000 dwellings under the new housing accord. And we will introduce measures to get wages moving again while ensuring a safer, fairer and more secure workplace. Well, on top of the five-point plan for the cost of living, this Labor budget builds a stronger, more resilient and modern economy with investments so in so many vital areas. Infrastructure is critical to building the nation. As we all want, um, and the Albanese government's investment in infrastructure will deliver the best outcome for the Australian people now and into the future. The budget takes an important first step in ensuring the Commonwealth's infrastructure spending is responsible, affordable and sustainable. We are delivering on our election promises, which takes the total investment in transport infrastructure in every uh, state and territory in this budget at $55 billion over the forward estimates for new and existing projects. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, in the words of the Treasurer from last night, this budget is uh, solid, steady and sensible. I think it's probably a fair yarn to say it, uh, it's in that sort of solid and steady territory. There's a lot, not a lot that's new here. Uh, it's not particularly bold or, or visionary, um, but I do take uh, I do take umbrage with the word sensible. I don't think it's sensible to be spending 240 billion dollars on tax cuts that are mostly going to benefit the wealthy in this country. And nor do I think it's sensible in a time of climate emergency to be uh, spending 40 billion dollars plus on fossil fuel subsidies, including billions of dollars in direct corporate welfare from the taxpayer to facilitate fossil fuel projects. And to put that in perspective, you know, $40 billion versus in this budget a $97 million over four years contribution to the Great Barrier Reef. Now, Acting Deputy President, um, I support money going to the Great Barrier Reef. It's not going to fix the problem. It's only acting on emissions is going to fix the problem. So no more new uh, oil and gas and coal. But I do support that money going to the Barrier Reef. The Barrier Reef is, is clearly uh, a World Heritage-listed uh, international gem. Uh, it contributes $6.4 billion annually uh, to this country's GDP, and it employs 64,000 people. So it is by no means uh, it is a very important uh, that we try to do whatever we can to help the Great Barrier Reef. But I wanted to raise today that there is no money in this budget for the Great Barrier Reef's southern sister, the Great Southern Reef, which spans from New South Wales down through Victoria, Tasmania across to South Australia. This system of reefs, these temperate reefs, contribute nearly $10 billion annually, nearly double what the Great Barrier Reef contributes to our economy. And of course, they're absolutely critical ecosystems. So it's disappointing that there's nothing in here for the Great Southern Reef. And you look at the money that's going to the Great Barrier Reef, for example, $1.6 billion that the government has spent in the last five years. What have they spent on the Great Southern Reef? Around $30 million only. And if you look at one of the programs on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in recent years have gone to tackling the crown of thorns outbreak on the Barrier Reef. But only $4 million 
over 20 years to tackle Centris stephanus, the long-spined sea urchin, that is creating barrens in our oceans and devastating commercial fisheries, ecosystems and local communities. So there's a lot the government's got to do to actually uh, fund research and adaption measures down in the Great Southern Reef. There's amazing people down there. You're going to be hearing a lot more from the Greens on this in the months to come, and we're looking forward to getting some budget outcomes uh, in the next few years. The time has expired, As Senator Wish Wilson. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the Treasurer had his big night last night. Uh, if you think we're disappointed by this budget, you can't imagine the disappointment that the Australian people must be feeling, indeed those in my home state of Western Australia. All this budget did tell those in Western Australia is that there is much more financial hurt and pain for their household budget. Be in no doubt we are in a cost of living crisis. Things are getting a lot worse before they're going to get better. Cost of living is going up, power prices are going up, gas prices are going up, taxes are going up. Western Australians will have to spend more in their budgets just to be able to make ends meet. Now, one reliable way of putting downward pressure on inflation is to put a limit on spending. But what we're seeing is that this budget contains measures that are actually going to put an upward pressure on inflation. Let me give you an example. We've got $4.5 billion in here for so-called cheaper childcare. Now, that sounds noble. That sounds noble. Uh, but what we know is that by this government's own admission is that this policy will not add a single childcare place. Worse still, it's likely to drive up the cost of childcare, swallowed up by the increased subsidy. Uh, the increased subsidy will be swallowed up and will have further inflationary impacts. Now, on the issue of no extra places, can someone from the Labor Party please explain to someone that's living in a childcare desert how an increased subsidy is going to help their cost of living if they can't actually access a childcare place in the first place? Now, despite uh, ruling it out before the election, what we've seen is that the retiree tax is back. Labor's sneaky new tax will slug people who invest their own savings in superannuation, people who have worked hard and saved for a better retirement. Labor will now hit retirees and investors with a new $555 million tax, depriving investors of franking credits which they have previously relied on. This government has been in power for just five months. In that time, we've seen interest rates rise five consecutive months. Now that's an increase of 2.25 per cent in five months, the most rapid increase in nearly three decades. Inflation is out of control. Before the last election, the then opposition leader repeatedly told Australians that Labor would cut power prices for families and small businesses by $275. And despite the Treasurer telling the National Press Club today that it was in the budget, Labor have not included it. It's a broken promise. And now when Australians think that it couldn't get much worse under this government, this government turns around and slashes funding for rural and regional Australia with the abolition of the coalition government's Building Better Regions Fund, the BBRF. Now, this is a great program which supported Australians living in non-metropolitan regions. It highlights that this government is completely city-centric. It, it's very clear in this budget that this budget is all about helping the re-election campaign of the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews. In the electorate of O'Connor, in the electorate of O'Connor in, in Western Australia, there were 20 BBRF uh, round, ap round six applications, two of which were in the Shire of Catanning's application to uh, to facilitate an early childhood hub, and then also one in the Shire of Laverton's application to facilitate an upgrade of the airport uh, at, at Laverton. Now, these are the kind of important projects that are needed by these local communities, which will now miss out by Labor's poor treatment of regional Western Australia. Last night's budget, last night's budget was a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity. It further underlined that this government is very good at talking, but slow on taking responsibility. Slow on bringing forward a plan to make life better and to make life better for those in Western Australia. Just, they've just, they're not providing for, the, for our communities. There is real pain in this budget. Make no doubt about that. 
And for this Christmas, for this year's Christmas, Western Australian families will know it will be very different to the previous years. Instead, this government is too busy rewriting history books and blaming everyone else for the job that they have been elected to do. Thank you. Given, given that the time for the MPI has expired, I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents which are listed on page four of today's order of business. If no one wants to take note, no one need rise, and we can move on to the next item of business. Quorum required. Is quorum present? Quorum is required. Ring the bells. So we are on the consideration of documents which are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator O'Sullivan. Yes, uh, I take note of docu all documents. Can I say that or do I have to number each one? Okay, all documents on page four and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? No one else is standing on that question, so we now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, 
Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Just checking my mic's on. Um, I uh, present delegated legislation monitor number seven of 2022 of the Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation, together with ministerial correspondence relating to the report. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Um, Acting Deputy President, on behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's fourth report of 2022. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the Scrutiny Digest No. 6 of 2022 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills and move that the Senate take note of the report. Uh, as Chair of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, I rise to speak to the tabling of the Committee's Scrutiny Digest No. 6 of 2022. The Digest contains the Committee's assessment of all bills recently introduced to the Parliament. Each bill is assessed against the Committee's technical scrutiny principles as set out in Standing Order 24. These principles focus on the effect of proposed legislation on parliamentary scrutiny and individual rights, liberties and obligations. Importantly, the Committee has a strong and long-standing commitment to non-partisanship and, accordingly, the Digest does not consider the policy merits of bills. Scrutiny Digest No. 6 of 2022 reports on the Committee's consideration of 16 bills which were introduced into the Parliament during the previous sitting week, as well as amendments introduced in relation to four bills. It also contains the Committee's comments on recent ministerial responses in relation to eight bills. The Committee has identified potential scrutiny concerns in relation to eight bills, including two private senators and members' bills. I particularly wish to highlight the Committee's comments in relation to two recently introduced bills. The first is the Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Biosecurity Bill of 2022. Among other things, the bill seeks to amend the Biosecurity Act to confer three new instrument-making powers on the Agricultural Minister, which, which mirror, mirror existing powers that are available to the Health Minister in relation to human biosecurity risks. Legislative instruments made under each of these new powers will be exempt from disallowance. Scrutiny Principle 4 sorry, five, requires the committee to report in respect of bills which insufficiently subject the exercise of legislative power to parliamentary scrutiny. As disallowance is the primary means by which the parliament exercises control over its delegated legislative power, the committee will have scrutiny concerns in relation to any bill that seeks to exempt delegated legislation from disallowance without appropriate justification. The committee has long-standing scrutiny concerns regarding provisions in the Biosecurity Act, which allow delegated legislation to be exempted from parliamentary disallowance. I note that these concerns are also shared by the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee. In 2021 and 2022, the committee conducted a review of exemption from disallowance provisions within the Biosecurity Act and recommended that, from a scrutiny perspective, the Biosecurity Act should be amended to provide that all instruments made under the Act it's worth repeating that all instruments made under the Act are subject to disallowance. Rather than responding to those recommendations, this bill would introduce three new exemptions from disallowance provisions. Our particular concern is that these new exempt instruments may deal with significant matters which may impact upon an individual's personal rights and liberties, such as determining requirements for individuals entering Australian Territory at a prescribed point of entry. In June 2021, the Senate resolved that all delegated legislation should be subject to disallowance unless there are exceptional circumstances justifying an exemption. The Senate also resolved that any claim that circumstances justify such an exemption will be subject to rigorous scrutiny with, that, with, the, exemption, with the expectation that the claim will only be justified in rare cases. The committee does not consider that the justifications provided in the explanatory memorandum to this bill adequately address the committee's scrutiny concerns. The committee has therefore requested the minister's advice, advice as to whether the bill uh, can be amended to provide that these new instrument-making powers are subject to disallowance to ensure they receive appropriate parliamentary oversight. The committee has also written to the ministers administering the Biosecurity Act to request that they move amendments to provide that all instruments made under the Act are subject to disallowance. In this digest, the committee also considered the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill of 2022 and the National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill of 2022. As senators know, these bills have been referred to the Joint Select Committee on, national, on the National Anti-Corruption Commission legislation for inquiry and report by the 10th of November. 
The committee makes six recommendations that more information be included in the explanatory memorandum book to the bills, and a further nine recommendations that consideration be given to amending specific provisions. The committee encourages the Attorney General and the Select Committee and all parliamentarians to consider these recommendations in detail. The committee's concerns relate to possible impacts on an individual's rights and liberties and to provisions which provide broad administrative powers or exclude judicial review. Under scrutiny principle I, the committee will have scrutiny concerns in relation to any bill that introduces provisions that may trespass unduly on the personal rights and liberties. The measures in these bills would provide the Commissioner with a range of investigative and reporting powers which may limit an individual's personal rights or liberties, particularly in relation to long-standing common law rights relating to privacy, self-incrimination and legal professional privilege. The bill sets out a number of offence provisions which the committee considers require further justification. In addition, the bill also provides for the broad delegation of administrative powers and functions. Generally, the committee prefers to see a limit set either on the scope of powers that might be delegated or on the categories of people to whom those powers might be delegated. The committee has recommended that the bill be amended to provide that powers and functions may only be amended to persons who have the appropriate qualifications, training or experience. Importantly, and as I've already noted, the committee's concerns relates to matters of technical scrutiny and not to matters of policy. I encourage all parliamentarians to carefully consider the committee's analysis contained in the digest and with these comments I commend the com committee's scrutiny bill, scrutiny digest number 6 of 2022 to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Urquhart? Oh, sorry, the is that the motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, I think the ayes have it. Uh, is someone standing on behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works? Done that one? Done all three. Cool. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Gallagher. Thank you. On behalf of the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, I table the regional budget statement. Now we're on to committee memberships. The president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Thank you. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it carried. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the social services and other legislation amendment lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card Bill. 2022 and informing the Senate that the House has disagreed to amendments 2 to 7 and 14 to 16 made by the Senate and has agreed to the remaining amendments. Minister. Thank you. I move that the message be considered in Committee of the Whole immediately. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no, I think the ayes have it. The committee is considering message number 59 from the House of Representatives relating to the social services and other legislation amendment lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health, Care Health Card Bill 2022. Minister. Thank you. I move that the committee does not insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. The question is that the amendments not be insisted on. 
Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes. Sorry. Is quorum present? Six. Yes, quorum. It's a quorum. Can't leave the chamber. All right. One, two, three. How many are there? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Quorum present. Quorum present. So the question before the chair and the chamber. Sorry, Senator Rice. Sorry, I didn't see you on your feet, Senator Rice. Yes, I wish to speak to the, the motion about insisting on the amendment. So, look, I just wanted yes. to make a few short points about the bill and to note that the Greens um, who supported these amendments when we were considering it won't be insisting on our amendments. I mean, as we know, the underlying component of this bill is to extend the availability of the Commonwealth Seniors Healthcare Card. It's got cross-party support. Everybody agrees to it. But the amendments that were moved to this bill um, last, when we were considering it included key provisions relating to the work bonus for aged pensioners. And I just wanted to put it on the record that when there are good amendments, we are, as Greens are open to be supporting those good amendments from the opposition where they improve the bill. And in this case, we thought they would improve the bill. And we thank, again thank the opposition for putting forward an amendment to this bill that would have provided greater support to aged pensioners, which is why we voted in support of that bill, in, those, in support of those amendments. However, since we considered this bill, I recognise and thank the government for introducing a workforce incentive bill in the other place. And the provisions of that bill are currently being considered by the Senate Community Affairs Committee. And we're going to be listening very closely to stakeholder affairs on that bill, stakeholder views on that bill that we hear through the inquiry. And I really do want to particularly thank, in terms of those stakeholders who've engaged on this issue, um, National Seniors Australia, um, for their advocacy on this issue of allowing pensioners to be providing greater support to aged pensioners and allowing them to be earning more before their pension gets reduced. And more broadly, I want to reiterate a point that I've made a, a number of times, particularly um, last night and today, that we support changes that make it easier to access income support and to make income support more generous. And we think that it's appalling that the government hasn't chosen to raise the rate of job seeker because poverty is a political choice. It was a choice that the Liberal government made for a decade and now it's a choice that Labor is making as well. And so for everyone who is struggling to survive on income support payments, whether they be job seeker or the age pension, we hear you and Excuse we're going to keep Senator on fighting Rice, and advocating to, for you. Senator Rice, I need to interrupt you just because there's too much chit chat to my side and I need to ask senators to just keep it down so that I can hear. Please However, continue. given that we have a bill, the Workforce Incentive Bill, which is now in the other place, which largely overlaps 
with the measures that we introduced as amendments to this bill, the Commonwealth Seniors Health Care Bill, we think it is appropriate, given that, that we do not insist on our amendments. Senator Smith. Thank you. Uh, the opposition will be insisting yeah. on the Senate's amendments. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. have heard today, we have heard today, indeed from Green senators themselves, that the priority for this budget, the priority in the hearts and minds of Australian families is cost of living. Today, today we could insist on these amendments, send back to the House of Representatives an immediate remedy to some of the cost of living pressures that pensioners and yeah, veterans yeah. are experiencing in our community. Nothing demonstrates more, nothing demonstrates more how tardy the government is in acting on some of its own initiatives that would go to the heart of addressing labour shortages in many of our communities and go to the heart of providing cost of living relief for pensioners and for veterans. Wow. Senator uh, Senator, uh, Rice, apologies, Senator Rice is absolutely right. The government does have a bill in the House of Representatives at the moment. It was introduced in the House of Representatives just on the last sitting day, the 28th of September, and it still, not ha and it still has not progressed. It still has not progressed. I think the government owes pensioners and veterans in our country an apology that they are not doing more on these sitting days in this budget week to help deal with labour shortage issues in our country, which, would have a, which will have a downward pressure on inflation. Let's remember that. Anything that can be done to ease labour shortages in this country will have downward pressure on inflation, and Labor is ignoring an opportunity to do that now, to do that tonight. And in the process, aged pensioners and veterans are going to have to continue to endure cost of living pressures with limited means to be able to correct that for themselves. This is outrageous. This is a powerful demonstration that the priorities of Australian families with pensioners, with veterans, are not the priorities of this government. Are not the priorities of this government. It is disappointing that on this occasion the Greens aren't able to support us. But to be fair to Senator Rice and to other Greens, we were very, very grateful for the support that you were able to give to the coalition when it moved the amendments on that sitting day in the last sitting week, because it shone a very important light. It shone a very, very important light on this issue. On this issue. So while we have a point of disagreement today on this matter on whether we insist on the amendments, when we were in this Senate chamber. On the 28th of September, on that afternoon, guess who was caught asleep at the wheel? The government. The government. You would think just six months into the job of being the new government, they would be alert, they would be attentive, they would be paying attention to what was going on and what was in the minds of pensioners and veterans in this country and that they would be offering up solutions, joining in some bipartisanship, joining in some tripartisanship, if I might add, agreeing to those amendments, allowing them to go to the House of Representatives and providing an answer for aged pensioners and for veterans. This is a sad, sorry day for the new government. For the new government. In the government's own budget, delivered last night is exactly this initiative is exactly this initiative so they're deciding to wait they are going to make people wait not one day not two days they are going to wait make people wait and wait and wait so this afternoon in previous conversations we heard almost unanimous views in this senate chamber minus the government that everyone recognizes that cost of living pressures were real and that the budget did not provide a solution. And now, at this time of the early evening, we've got an opportunity, real, immediate, to say to pensioners, to say to veterans, and to say to the business community, not just in our cities, not just in our regional towns, but in our smaller communities across this country, 
We know the pressures are real about labour shortages. We know that you need some answers, and here is some step towards providing those answers and providing those solutions. But no, the Labor Party has decided that it will come here and not and make an attempt to not, as, not insist on these amendments. Wow. I just wonder, out there in the Australian community, how they will react to the realisation that at this particular point of this day we had an answer for aged pensioners and for veterans and for small business owners and small, small to medium business owners, and Labor squibbed it. Labor squibbed it. This will come back to haunt the government. This will come back to haunt the government. So we have no, as disappointed as we are, we have no argument with the Australian Greens. You understand the issues. You supported the amendments. You've now had a different attitude, given that a matter is now before a Senate committee. But there is no excuse. There is no excuse. There is no apology that can be provided to the Labor government for not making the most of this immediate opportunity. The question before the chair is that the committee does not insist on its amendments, to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye, aye. Uh, those against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Can I have order? Can I have some order at my, to my left, please? The question before the committee is that the committee does not insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. Those for the proposition uh, move to the right of the chair. Those against to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Urquhart for the ayes and Senator Cadell for the uh, noes as tellers. The result of the di division are that there are 31 ayes and 20, 24 noes. It is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. I move that the resolution be reported. I put the question. Those of the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it. That's one we just decided yeah. then. So it'd be reported to the Senate. So we take that up to the top and move that out. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered message number 59 from the House of Representatives relating to the social services and other legislation amendment lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card Bill 2022 and has resolved not to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Can I have some order, please? The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment More Competition, Better Prices Bill 2022 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 and the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act 2001 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. 
Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Put the I'm going to put the question. Those questions say aye against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Clark. Government business order of the day number one, Fair Work Amendment, Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022, in committee. The committee is considering the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022 and amendments on sheets RU110 and PF105 moved by Senator Watt. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Minister. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. I just where we left things um, when we hit the hard marker was that Senator Cash had just asked a couple of questions and uh, I've got some answers to those. I also would like to just clarify uh, some evidence that I provided earlier now that we've had an opportunity to consider some of those matters further. Um, to begin with, uh, I wish to clarify one of the things that I said earlier regarding employers' ability to recoup any family and domestic violence leave paid where it becomes apparent that the employee was a perpetrator uh, and was not entitled to paid family uh, and domestic violence leave. As I stated, employers would be able to recover these payments. However, as for other entitlements under the Fair Work Act, recovery would be for a debt owed to the employer. This is because a payment will have been made that the employee was not entitled to. So in that situation, the employer's right to recover would be similar to other overpayments of entitlements under the Act, such as for allowances, salary errors and so forth. Uh, no provisions are required in the Fair Work Act to enable this. Uh, I also wish to clarify that the regulator for Fair Work, uh, of course, is the Fair Work Ombudsman, and civil penalties will ultimately be decided by a court. Uh, I uh, misspoke in my answer regarding penalties for payslip contraventions and referred to the Fair Work Commission. So it would be the Fair Work Ombudsman. Yep. Um, also, um, Senator Cash earlier today asked a question, um, and this is essentially what I think the question was, if, if an employer were to call a casual employee asking what days they are available for work but does not specify the times the employee would be offered work, the question is whether the casual employee would be entitled to paid family and domestic violence leave, and how would the rate of payment for family, paid family and domestic violence leave be calculated in these circumstances? Um, the advice I've received is that in those circumstances the casual employee has not been rostered to work and has neither been offered nor accepted a shift and therefore the entitlement to paid leave would not arise in those circumstances. The amount of pay they would be entitled to would therefore be nil. However, the casual employee would be able to take family and domestic violence leave without pay if they wish to do so. If the employer is simply testing the employee's potential availability to work, this would not be regarded as rostered hours and the employee would not be entitled to payment for the leave. If a casual employee needs to take time off to deal with the impact of family and domestic violence on a day they have not been rostered for work, the workplace right to take the leave and be absent from work to deal with the impact of domestic violence can still be accessed, but the employer would not be required to pay the employee for the unrostered hours. Uh, the term rostered hours is intended to take its ordinary meaning. This acknowledges that businesses have a wide range of rostering systems according to their usual practices and human resource capabilities. Most commonly, it will be a situation where the employer makes available a list or a plan of shifts to be undertaken by an employee. Subsection 106, capital B, capital A, subsection 2 further clarifies that without limiting the ordinary meaning of rostered hours, an employee is taken to have been rostered to work hours in a period if the employee has accepted an offer by the employer of work for those hours. Offer and acceptance, as Senator Cash would be aware, is a long-established common law principle. There is no set form to, uh, to establish offer and acceptance. 
The offer and or acceptance can be in writing or via text message uh, or verbally, such as over the phone or during a team meeting. Hopefully that uh, clarifies some of the questions at least. No, and, and I very much do appreciate that additional clarification. I may have some further questions. I know Senator Waters will have some questions in relation to the bill generally. I will then continue to ask away. Um, this is just, um, Senator Watt, in relation to the rate of pay. And again, small and family business understand obviously the current leave arrangements in the Fair Work Act, in particular as they apply um, to casuals with a 25 per cent loading. This decision does go beyond, obviously, what the Fair Work Commission itself had recommended in three aspects which we have been discussing. In relation to the rate of pay, these are questions that have been put to me by small and family businesses in particular, hence why I am seeking um, the answers on Hansard so they can refer to them. If I could go to what are referred to as, say, contingent entitlements. So contingent entitlements or work-related allowances are payments above the base rate of pay. Normally, leave is paid at the base rate of pay under the, uh, the Fair Work Act. The government has determined uh, that in this case it will be paid at the full rate of pay. So in terms of the contingent entitlements or work-related allowances, payments above the base rate of pay which relate to the work that the employee is participating in, for example, uh, they are made to employees who do certain tasks, have a particular skill they use at work, use their own tools at work, work in unpleasant or hazardous conditions, incur an expense for doing their job. Then you have a look at, and I know you'd be familiar with them, common allowances, for example, hot work allowances, call room allowances, confined space allowances and travel allowances. The issue obviously has now arisen that because the government has moved towards what the ACTU had put forward as opposed to what the Fair Work Commission has stated, there is now confusion amongst businesses and, and genuine confusion in terms of how would I actually calculate the rate of pay? So I'm just going to take you through a few scenarios to try and seek guidance on Hansard for businesses to actually turn to in the event that they are confronted with certain scenarios, very similar to what we just went through. Sorry to interrupt, Senator Cash. Um, I'm wondering. I do. I think I have an answer for you, and it may, in the interest of time. Would you, would you like me to provide the answer, which may actually answer the various examples? Um, do you want to, potentially, I know this is a bill that we all want to get through, that's all. Um, um, the, so the, the purpose of the paid family and domestic violence leave entitlement is to provide financial security for those experiencing family and domestic violence. Um, of course, the principle underlying this is that employees should not have to choose between doing things to ensure their own safety or going to work to make ends meet. Uh, the new family and domestic violence leave payment will be paid at the full rate of pay, which is the payment an employee would have received had they not taken a period of leave. This includes any loadings, penalty rates or allowances the employee would have ordinarily received had they been working. Uh, for example, the casual loading, overtime, higher duties or a living away from home allowance are payable if they would have applied to the shift the employee would have worked had they not taken a period of leave. Um, you gave a number of examples, you know, um, working in hot conditions, hot or unpleasant conditions, and unless if I'm told otherwise, I'm going to assume that if that was an allowance that a particular employee was paid um, in their ordinary work time, um, then that would be payable as part of the leave payment um, should someone uh, seek to exercise that right. Senator Cash. Thank you. That does provide further guidance for, for business, so I, I, do, I do appreciate that. The issue is, if it is not determined at the time the shift is offered what the employee will be doing on that particular day, but, for example, they would normally work in a confined space, they would normally work in a cold space or in a hot space, 
but it's not an everyday occurrence. So there still is an element of we may have to decide on the day. But the shift has been offered, subject to not actually knowing what they'll do on the day. The employee has accepted the shift, so tick, tick. However, they then have to take the paid family and domestic violence leave. The very genuine issue raised by employers is how do I know whether or not, in determining that rate of pay, I would factor in the allowance or not? The reason being, if I get it wrong, I'm now subject to a penalty. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, just to supplement what I said previously, for irregular payments or amounts contingent upon certain events that may or may not have happened during the employee's rostered hours, an employer may not be liable to pay an employee those amounts. I mean, it's difficult to give an absolutely categorical assurance that applies to every single circumstance. Um, but the principle is that if an allowance is ordinarily payable, if an employee is at work, then they they would be paid at a rate that included those allowances. If, if an allowance is contingent upon certain events, um, then depending on the reg regularity uh, and other factors, um, that an employer may not be liable. One example I can give you is that an employee may not be entitled to be paid a travel allowance in relation to a period of paid family and domestic violence leave if the calculation of the allowance was based on the distance travelled where the distance that would have been travelled during the period the employee took the leave cannot be ascertained. Um, and of course, as I mentioned previously when we were discussing this earlier today, um, it is certainly the department's intention to provide advice to small businesses about how to interpret these new laws uh, and the usual uh, option of small businesses seeking advice from the Fair Work Ombudsman um, to understand uh, their legal requirements would be available for this as well. Senator Cush. Thank you. And Senator Watt, that actually was my next question in relation to the travel costs. So I, you, you have now answered that. Um, so I appreciate that. I'm just looking at whether or not there are any other questions that I can look at. Page one. Just in relation to on the rate of pay, the Fair Work Commission in their decision about the rate of pay for paid family and domestic violence leave, they had stated, and I know you'll be aware of this, but just to put it on the Hansard record, however, we considered that it would be overly disrupted to the integrity of the safety net to establish on an across-the-board basis a new paid leave entitlement which operates on a radically different basis to the paid leave entitlements for which the NES currently provides. It also stated at paragraph 863, we cannot identify a persuasive rationale for taking a different approach in the case of paid family and domestic violent leave only. Just again, just again to get it on the record, given that was the Fair Work Commission's opinion, and I do understand the ACTU had put forward um, another view, and the government accepted that, and, and that's what we're looking at, at today. Can I just again get the government's rationale? Because when we asked it at the actual committee, the department were not able to provide that assistance, and to be fair for them, they're not the government. Um, what was the government's rationale in actually going further than what the Fair Work Commission itself had stated, in particular given the concerns that the Fair Work Commission have put on the record overly disrupted, overly disrupted to the integrity of the safety net in terms of this part of the bill, um, and how it determined it would depart from the advice and the decision of the Fair Work Commission. Minister. Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Senator Cash. Really, it comes down to one of the underpinning policy objectives of this legislation, which is that employees should be able to take leave to deal with the impact of family and domestic violence without the loss of income that they would have otherwise experienced. Um, that's really what it comes down to. Um, so, probably can't elaborate any further. No, 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 and I, I, I do understand what you're saying. It then goes to the next issue, which is. 
Given the statements that you have just made um, and the need for income continuity, one of the issues that has been raised now time and time again by business is will the government now then also seek to amend all needs-based entitlements uh, to follow that model? And that obviously then goes to effectively upending the entire national employment standards and departing from what even the Fair Work Commission have stated um, would be obviously disruptive when you go down this path. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. We have absolutely no plans to do that whatsoever. Is that a full stop or is that a, at this point in time? I have not, I have not seen anything that makes me uh, think that there is any possibility um, that we would do that. Senator Cash. Thank you. And we are obviously now also um, referring to the amendments that the minister has moved, the first amendment on sheet PF 105. In relation to this amendment, just to put the um, coalition's position on the record, the new sub-clause would provide that on application by an employer, employer, employee organisation covered by a pre-commencement enterprise agreement that includes terms entitling employees to paid family and domestic violence leave, the Fair Work Commission can consider whether the effect of the terms is detrimental when compared with the entitlement to paid family and domestic violence leave in the national employment standards. If the Fair Work Commission considers the effect of those terms is detrimental compared to the national employment standards, it may vary the terms of the agreement to make the agreement consistent with the national employment standards. The coalition, as we have advised the government, uh, will support the amendment. Uh, it is a technical amendment to ensure that the Fair Work Commission uh, is not the language of the new sub-clause, and it would be updated to clarify that they may consider the interaction between the agreement and the uh, national employment standards, rather than make a decision about the agreement's effect as provided by uh, the original sub-clause. And in relation to the amendment moved by the minister on sheet RU110, this amendment will require employers to not provide information on an employee's pay slip um, that they have basically taken paid family and domestic violence leave. I understand that the amendment does deal with the concerns that victims who may be financially abused could be put at risk if their perpetrator is watching their pay slips. And again, we have advised the government that the coalition will support this amendment. Um, I think there are still some questions, and I do hope that they are worked through during the consultation period with small and family business in relation to the actual operation, etc., how it will be administered uh, for small and family businesses. Uh, but we do support this amendment as it will address the concerns raised by stakeholders uh, in both conversations with the coalition uh, and certainly stakeholders who appeared uh, at the committee hearing in August. Thank you. The question is that the amendments on sheet RU110 and sheet PF105 be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, no? I think the ayes have it. Senator Lambie. Oh, you can do that. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, I move amendment number um, 1608 mm -hmm. on sheet PF105, RU1110. No? I think uh, Senator Lamb. Oh, 1 to 37. Uh, Sorry. So I think, uh, Senator Lamb, if yep. I could um, uh, suggest, I think we're up to your amendment, which is sheet 1608 revised. That's it. Sorry. That's quite okay. We're here to help. Oh, no. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. We're going to learn to do this by ourselves. Uh, I move amendment number 1608. Mm -hmm. Do I have to say the number one and on sheet? Uh, okay. Numbers 1 to 37 on sheet 1608. Yep. And you're seeking to, loo uh, to move them together? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Great. Uh, thank is you, leave Deputy granted? President. Leave is granted. Would you like to speak to those, Senator? Sorry. 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 
Um, Senator, could I just clarify? So it is just 1608 revised? Uh, um, 1 to 37 on sheet 1608 revised, correct. Thank you. Yep. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, if you need help, you should be able to get help. That is a very basic principle. It's one this bill seeks to sustain, and I support this ambition. Many people have campaigned for a long time to get this bill to where it is today, and that is both commendable and impressive. You should be congratulated for the hard work to make today possible. But there are problems with this bill, and there are problems that need fixing. They are fixable, but they are not being fixed. The biggest problem with this bill is the name of the entitlement it creates. It's called Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave. And you might think, if that's what you're going through, call it as such. But there are plenty of people who are going through what you or I would recognise as family or domestic violence, and not all of them know it. Um, because if you love the person who's abusing you, you make excuses for it. You don't think of them as an abuser. Because how could they be? How could someone who loves you do that to you? It's why you don't self-identify as having experienced domestic violence because your partner loves you and nobody who loves you would do that to you. So you don't think of yourself as suffering from domestic violence. You had a blue. He lost his temper. You pushed him too hard. You make excuses. You minimise it. And all of that is understandable. I don't want to pass judgment on you for doing that. This bill would say that if that's where you're at, you don't get help because the name of the leave is paid family and domestic violence leave. And you haven't experienced domestic violence. So it's not for you. In fact, in order to get it, if you need it, you have to not only come forward and say what you experienced is domestic violence, but by extension, the person who did it to you is a perpetrator of domestic violence. That's why the name matters, because the only type of person who's eligible for paid family and domestic violence leave is the type of person who's experiencing domestic violence. And if you don't think that's you, you rule yourself out. This could be fixed. I've got amendments that would fix it. Calling this emergency leave would not require you to self-identify as experienced domestic violence. Mm. You'd only need it to be an emergency, an unforeseen emergency at home that would prevent you from coming to work that day. Nobody experiencing domestic violence would miss out. Nobody experiencing domestic violence would be worse off. This would be a change that would only serve to increase the chance that people who need help get help. That's the principle this bill is supported to advance. This makes it more universal, and that's a good thing. It should be supported, so I foreshadow that my amendment would do just that. But there are benefits beyond simply whether a person self-identifies as being a victim of domestic violence. If you're sick at work and you want to take sick leave, you've got to tell someone at work you're sick. If you're experiencing domestic violence at home and you want to take domestic violence leave, you've got to tell someone at work you're experiencing domestic violence. Some people aren't going to see that as a barrier. Often, they're in big cities working in big companies with well-defined rules around confidentiality. They wouldn't know their HR manager from a bar of soap. Some people in small towns, in small businesses, aren't in the same boat. Not everybody wants their whole workplace to know what's happened to them. If your boss knows your partner, then telling your boss about what's going on at home in a is a particularly big deal. Because you're not just saying what you're going through but you're de facto naming who's putting you through it. That is a big step for someone to, take to decide to take. You have no right to say to a person that they should have to meet a standard we impose on them before they're entitled to safety and protection. We have absolutely none. You should be entitled to privacy. You should be entitled to safety. No lawmaker should make you choose between them. That's us. We shouldn't be doing what we're doing. When you ask for domestic violence leave, even in asking the question, you're explaining why you need it, and it's absolutely none of your employer's business why you need safety in that moment. It's an emergency. Get out of the way. When you work, ask for emergency leave, on the other hand, you're saying you're experiencing an emergency, one that prevents you from attending your work for a period of time. Your boss might ask for evidence, but all you need is evidence you're experiencing an emergency. That would be an improvement, but it wouldn't take long for businesses to realise that anybody who's requesting emergency leave is requesting what used to be called domestic violence leave. It's a rose by any other name. So the second bit of what I'm proposing is to combine domestic leave with compassionate leave. That's the leave you take when there's been a death in the family. 
Combining the two would mean you'd be eligible so long as there's a family emergency. The grounds for eligibility would be the same. If you're eligible for what's currently called compassionate leave, you're eligible for emergency leave. If you're eligible for what's proposed to be called paid domestic violence leave, you're eligible for emergency leave. There's no change there. This is a change that makes a good thing available to more people. It does not cost a dollar more to implement. It does not restrict access to a single person. It expands access. It makes it easier to access. It is a good thing. And yet I understand that this amendment will not be supported. For the life of me, I do not understand why. Don't get me wrong, I've heard the arguments. They make no sense. I have heard that this is complex. It's not exactly. Changing the name of an entitlement is about the easiest change you can make when you're dealing with workplace laws. You just change what you call something. We changed Newstart to Job Seeker, and we all just moved on. We changed the names of public service departments, and nobody blinks. Those changes don't do anything. This change does something. Isn't that worth doing? If it's worth the effort to rebadge a building, isn't it worth the effort to save more lives? Maybe the complexity is about the implementation rather than the name itself. Maybe it's about how it operates. But this simply combines two existing entitlements. If anything, it makes them simpler to administer. Employers have fewer entitlements to take care of. This doesn't change eligibility for those two entitlements. It just makes it simpler. That's the opposite of complexity. I've heard, the Greens, I've heard from the Greens how important it is to bring domestic violence out of the shadows and into the spotlight so we can reduce the stigma attached to it. I think we should too. I think we should reduce the stigma. I think we should make it as ordinary to claim as any other entitlement. But whose responsibility is it to do that? That's where I disagree with the Greens, because I do not believe that the responsibility for dealing with the stigma around domestic and family violence should fall on the people experiencing the violence in real time while they're trying to keep themselves alive. They should not be made to serve as examples for others. They should be protected. That is the overwhelming obligation we have to them. That is what we should be focused on. We should make it the job of survivors to survive, not to be ambassadors. A problem that's baked into the design of this bill is making this a workplace entitlement, made available through the employer and not through the government. If this was delivered through the government, it would help more people. Confidentiality would be guaranteed. Privacy would be protected. It would extend not just to people who are employed, but go to people who aren't in work as well. It would not push costs for administering this onto businesses, because by making this the responsibility of businesses, you're making support for domestic violence leave conditional on market forces. Think about this. In a recession, people lose jobs. Businesses go bankrupt. Families struggle financially. In recessions, domestic violence increases. That was the finding of the National Library of Medicine's 10-year review of the evidence coming out of the United States. It found that unemployment and economic hardship at the household level are positively related to abusive behaviour. So when people lose their jobs, when they're struggling to make ends meet and when domestic violence rates climb, that's when we cut them off from domestic violence leave. That is the situation we're about to create. If this was run by the government, you'd be protected even when you lose your job, in good times and bad, you'd be protected. I understand that I have support for one amendment which addresses an issue where survivors could be outed by their employer in situations where they work with their abuser. The amendment, amendment which I'll foreshadow now makes it clear that employers can't use the information provided by an employee in the course of seeking family and domestic violence leave to take action against another employee, not without consent. Your privacy should be yours, and it's not up to others to give it away on your behalf. It's a fix that goes a little bit of the way to protect privacy, but we could have gone much further. Ultimately, I'm disappointed that this bill will proceed the way it's currently written. That's not because I think it's a bad bill. It's just a missed opportunity to turn it into a great bill. Everything that's good about it makes it all the more painful to see it get through in a form that limits how valuable it can be, because paid family and domestic violence leave will save lives. But doing it in a way that asks people to choose between their privacy and their safety means we're going to save fewer lives. More people will suffer. People we could have helped. To you, I'm sorry, but we'll keep fighting. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the question is, uh, sorry, Senator Waters. 
Thanks, Chair. I'll just make a brief uh, contribution to explain the Greens' position on uh, this amendment. Now, throughout the inquiry into this bill, we heard from experts and advocates for victim survivors about the importance of workplace cultures where employees felt safe to disclose abuse. Dedicated family and domestic violence leave is an important component of building that workplace culture and the associated support. In our view, calling it emergency leave just reinforces the idea that family and domestic violence is something that should be hidden. We've continued to push for measures to remove barriers to victim survivors accessing leave uh, and to protect the confidentiality of any information provided. And I'm pleased that um, earlier in the uh, committee stage of this bill we have passed an amendment that ensures that the payslip need not record the fact that it is family and domestic violence leave that is the source of the payment. And we strongly support that amendment because, of course, any such mention of that could be a red flag to a perpetrator who you know, may well be having a look at their partner's or former partner's payslip. So, in our minds, that notion of privacy and protection has been upheld with that amendment, which we supported, but we still need that cultural change. And If we don't start calling this for what it is and the sheer epidemic of violence against women in this country that we are facing, we won't change anything. That's why we strongly support continuing to call this leave family and domestic violence leave. Um, it's important to show employees that employers will recognise the significance of family and domestic violence leave, uh, violence rather than that they understand the complex impacts and that support is available. Without society-wide efforts to break down the stigma of disclosing abuse, too many people will remain in dangerous situations. So whilst we have some sympathy for the sentiments, uh, for the reasons I've just outlined, we won't be supporting this particular amendment. Senator Lambie. Sorry. I just wanted to go into this a little bit further, if I can, and make sure this is quite clear. Okay. The reason the military—and I, I take it from this—is this is where the emergency leave. So I'm going to explain all this. Emergency leave is there so you don't explain your circumstances. Emergency leave leaves it open for other things, not just about domestic violence. There are other things going on in people's lives, whether they're losing someone, whether they're suffer whether there is a partner or somebody in their family who is suffering serious illness that they do not want to speak to their employer about before they take this leave. So ours was simply to make it quite clear, when you are in a rural and regional area and we are so clicky and so related to each other, I can assure you, if I did have a partner, you can guarantee if I was working in a firm in that little rural and regional area, my partner would know that person, my boss, if I was working there. I am not very comfortable in telling my boss, who is probably good friends with my partner, on what is going on in my home life. I'm just not comfortable with that, and I'm not sure anybody would be out there. I shouldn't have to explain to someone, I know you want awareness, at what cost? At what cost? You don't know everybody's situation, and I don't know why they have to explain their whole life of why they're running around under abuse. That's the last thing I would want to be doing explaining that to my boss. I'm giving them a little bit more room here. So it's great to say we want awareness out there and all that, but at what cost? So I'm just being very, very careful. I would like to make that very clear to employers that I shouldn't have to explain to them if I'm on a domestic violence situation when I'm already reduced to nothing, sitting down to explain my story again because they are going to ask. At least we could do is offer them cover. That's all this amendment was going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, conscious that we are wanting to move through this quickly, so I'll keep my um, question um, as brief as I can. Uh, Minister, are you able to just uh, explain to us something that uh, some stakeholders and, and obviously victim survivors in particular have raised? And no doubt many of us uh, here have received emails on, uh, on this issue of uh, privacy, confidentiality and uh, I guess this goes to the, this particular amendment. Um, I'll give you a cameo. That might, that might help. Uh, if an employee uh, claims domestic violence leave, it's recorded in the HR system and you know, it's good to, that amendment means that it won't necessarily need to appear on the, um, on the pay slip. But if it's recorded in the system and that employee moves on from that employment, 
would the privacy of the individual still be protected if that person moves on, uh, applies for another job, and that new prospective employee goes back to that employer and asks the question, has this person ever claimed domestic violence leave? Uh, would it be a breach of privacy? Would it be a breach of that person's uh, um, situation to, to not provide, uh, uh, if, that, if that was provided to that new employee, that information that that person had at some point claimed domestic violence leave? So it would be good to have that uh, four hands are just recorded. Thank you. Minister. Um, thanks, uh, President, and thanks, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Um, the advice I've received is that um, in the situation you're talking about, uh, it would not be possible, it, it would be possible, of course, for a future employer to ask a previous employer whether someone had applied for or used domestic violence leave, just as it would be possible for a future employer to ask someone, a previous employer, about annual leave or sick leave. But it would be absolutely illegal for a previous employer to provide that information to a future employer. So that's an existing provision under the law that future employers are not entitled to receive information from previous employers about leave claims that have been made of any kind. Uh, and that would certainly apply here. That's correct. Yep. Um, could I, just while I'm on my feet, um, Acting Deputy President, uh, put the government's position on this amendment on the record? And just in case those following aren't entirely clear, uh, this amendment, which has been moved by, um, I'm not sure if it's Senator Lambie or Senator Tyrrell, um, uh, seeks to combine family and domestic violence leave with compassionate leave and rename the entitlement as emergency leave. Uh, and I accept that um, uh, the mover of this amendment uh, has the very best of intentions in seeking to do so, and I think there's been some very productive conversations uh, with the Shadow Minister's Office about this. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, the government does not agree to this amendment. Um, compassionate leave, which is what the existing category is called, which is sought to be renamed, is a special category of leave providing up to two days paid leave per occasion for full-time and part-time employees. This allows employees to spend time with a severely ill family member or allow them to deal with a family member's death. If this amendment were to pass, it would significantly change the current compassionate leave settings, uh, and that could very easily result in a number of undesirable consequences. For example, women experiencing family and domestic violence who also need to take compassionate leave, either to take uh, to spend time with severely ill relatives or due to a family's member, family member's death, would have to choose between escaping violence and grieving or caring for a severely ill family member, as compassionate leave would, not, uh, would be lo no longer reserved for grieving purposes. Combining these forms of leave into a single leave balance may in some cases uh, provide less paid leave than what we're actually proposing to do in this bill. Um, the proposed amendment makes significant policy changes to compassionate leave. Uh, it would increase the potential amount of compassionate leave that can be taken from two days per occasion to up to 10 days per year, extend paid compassionate leave to casuals and make compassionate leave payable at the full rate of pay instead of the base rate of pay. None of these changes have undergone proper and adequate consultation, um, and for that reason we do not consider it appropriate to support the amendment. Um, what I will say, though, is that we, we've tried to pick up the intent of this amendment through the amendments that we've already passed relating to um, the changes to uh, records on payslips. Um, the government fully understands the importance of protecting personal privacy and acknowledges the concerns uh, of the mover of the amendment regarding the importance of maintaining confidentiality for employees. We have listened to a range of stakeholder concerns around payslips. Uh, and that's why we made the amendments earlier um, that try to deal with the same problem via a different way, but we won't be supporting this amendment. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And if I could just make a few comments uh, on behalf of the opposition, uh, just in terms of the amendment moved by Senator Tyrrell on behalf of the Jackie Lambie Network uh, on sheet 1608. Uh, in terms of what the amendment does, uh, the amendment, unfortunately, just doesn't change the name um, of the leave. What it actually would do 
is wrapped in a new form of leave called emergency leave, hence the change of the name to emergency leave. Um, that would be expanded upon uh, what this bill is actually looking at, which is the paid family and domestic violence leave. It would, in fact, extend the leave to a range of other circumstances, uh, including caring for an immediate family member with severe illnesses uh, that is a threat to their life and the employees caring for them, caring for an immediate family member for severe personal injury that is a threat to their life and the employees caring for them, or a child um, is stillborn where the child would have been a member of the employee's immediate family or a member of the employee's household. Uh, if the child had been born alive, or the employee or the employee's spouse or de facto partner has a miscarriage. The Coalition won't be supporting the, the amendment, very similar to the reasons provided uh, by the government. certainly appreciate the intent of the amendment, and I think you have stood up and you have articulated that well. As we all know, sometimes, though, when you are seeking uh, to move an amendment to legislation, Whilst the amendment itself does look very simple on the face of it, uh, given we are dealing with the Fair Work Act, a very technical piece of legislation, it already has in place a framework for leave. Uh, we are looking at amending that framework uh, in relation to leave uh, to add in another entitlement to a different form of paid leave. But in particular, the Fair Work Commission itself, uh, in its most recent uh, review, the four yearly review of the award system, they had undertaken an extensive, an extensive consultation and inquiry into the question of whether or not um, the unpaid provision for family and domestic violence leave that is currently in the Fair Work Act should be extended to 10 days paid leave. They said that it should be. They made their decision, and the government obviously determined that it would then um, enshrine that in the national employment standard, going further than what the Fair Work Commission had said. But that is what this bill is dealing with. Your amendment actually takes it beyond that. Uh, to be fair to your amendment, if the government were to look at going down this path, I think it is something that does need to be looked at in detail, uh, in particular in relation to are there any unintended consequences, uh, and if so, what are there, and how does the Senate deal with them? But in particular, because of the nature um, of what is being looked at, uh, it should be subject to consultation with the relevant stakeholders. In particular, how would this provision actually operate within the Fair Work Act, um, and particularly its potential impact on small and family business? So, absolutely understand the intent, uh, but it's the unintended consequences, and it does go further than the bill that we're actually debating here today. Senator Lambie. Yeah, um, so I do, I do have another question. I just want to clear this up. So, um, with someone that's uh, been um, under domestic violence, and they're in that situation I explained about, how much do they have to tell their boss to get that domestic violence leave? Do they have to mention the word domestic violence to get that leave? What do they have to tell their boss? How much information do they have to tell them or give them to get that far? Minister. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. Senator Lambie, the advice I've received is that uh, if a person uh, wanted to access that leave entitlement, they would need to, sorry to use legal terminology, but provide the level of evidence that a reasonable, uh, reasonable person would expect. That's the technical uh, explanation. Um, if they're asked to provide that ev evidence, um, but I mean, in a, in a sense, that's similar to a claim for sick leave or any other form of leave where an employee needs to at least disclose a reason for their request for leave. Um, there's no requirement under the legislation to produce photographic or other evidence. Um, and what I would certainly hope is that employers treat these requests with respect and that if an employee were to make a request and, and um, explain that they are experiencing family or domestic violence, that an employer would agree to that request. But of course, people would need to 
make that request and it's implicit in that that they are saying that they have experienced domestic violence. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you. Um, if an employer breaches the confidentiality of an employee with respect to domestic violence leave by going to police because of a sincerely held view that it is necessary to protect that employee but does so against the wishes of the employee, how will the employee recover their lost confidentiality? Is there anything in place for that? Or do they, is there reprimanding from the Fair Work? What, what, what sort of area? Are we in grey area here? What? Minister. Um, Senator Lambie, uh, in this and other similar situations, if an employer were to breach an employee's confidentiality um, in ways set out under the law, then they would be subject to a civil penalty. Senator Lambie. That also goes with police when you're reporting because you are sincerely um, concerned for the welfare. Wouldn't you? Oh, I would have thought if you were sincerely concerned that I was sitting here not saying anything and they were getting bashed, um, that I would be feeling quite responsible by sitting on my butt not doing anything more than offering that I can help you. Where's the rights of the employer that can see that their employee is getting, um, is, is, is getting hurt? What is their duty of care here? Minister. Senator Lambie, um, uh, earlier in the debate, um, I don't think you were in the chamber at the time, we were talking about um, the, how this legislation interacts with mandatory reporting obligations. Um, and this, what the bill does not place any reporting obligations on employers to report concerns around violence. Uh, but of course, there are a range of reporting obligations that exist under state and territory laws, um, and, and they are not prohibited by the bill. So, for instance, state and territory laws, as you'd be aware, um, often um, apply to require workers to mandatory, mandatorily report suspected abuse of children, um, and those laws would not be affected. There's an exemption to the confidentiality obligation that normally would imply to an employer or someone else in that situation if a disclosure uh, is necessary to protect the life, health or safety of an employee or another person. So um, if there are confidentiality obligations in place for an employer to not go and disclose personal information of an employee, um, if we're talking about a situation where the life, health or safety of an employee um, was in danger, then those confidentiality obligations would effectively be, lift, be lifted. And I think a situation involving domestic and violent, family violence would surely fall um, under that category. S Senator Pocock. I'd like to applaud the Jackie Lambie network senators, uh, Senator Lambie and Senator Tyrrell, on the way that they consult with their community and then bring the community's concerns and ideas into the Senate. We are certainly richer for it, and it's really important to be talking these through. I held similar concerns, and on consulting with my community here in the ACT, speaking to experts, speaking to frontline workers, the overwhelming consensus was that it was important to call it family and domestic violence leave. Though Senator Lambie raises an important point that I'm, I'm keen to get clarification from the government on. Uh, Senator Watt, you talked about um, reasonable proof to be able to access this leave. Knowing just how stretched our frontline domestic violence services are, um, I'm assuming that in most instances uh, women will go to frontline services to I guess, speak to them and get some sort of uh, letter of reference or support or share some of the, the casework. Given how stretched they are, does this legislation come with a commitment to better funding of frontline services, and not just better funding, but longer-term funding? I know a lot of uh, local organisations are surviving on 12-month, um, at most two-year funding cycles, which makes it very hard 
to actually um, keep a keep a workforce in the current uh, current climate. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. Um, I won't repeat the point about the evidentiary requirements, but um, because the issue you're more raising is about support for domestic violence services, and I think absolutely my own dealings with domestic violences, violence services in Queensland uh, convince me that they are very short of resources and very stretched to do extremely stressful work. Um, you're probably familiar that the government just released, uh, in, in partnership with states and territories, um, a new national action plan uh, f uh, f relating to domestic violence and family violence. I've forgotten the exact name of the national action plan, but that also committed governments, federal and state, to increased resourcing for those services. So that is something that we take very seriously, and we're providing those resources through that plan. Senator Lambie. Oh, um, thank you, I'm acting, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I just have one more question. I just were well, just a little bit confused about if you're working in different workplaces, okay? So, which always gets confusing in most things. But how many days leave will a person be entitled to if they're casually employed by more than one employer? I just I can't quite get that clear. Minister, um, the advice I've got, uh, Senator Lambie, is that it would be ten days. Uh, per job, if you like, and therefore 10 days per employer. Senator Lambie. So if you're working for three small businesses, so 10 days, that, that could be up to 30 days. Well, I'm just I'm a little bit confused. Sure. Um, Minister. Is theoretically right. I, I guess that is theoretically right. Um, Senator Lambie, but in the situation you're talking about, a casual employee, if they're working for three different employers, then I'm going to take a punt that they might be working you know, one day a week at one employer, two days a week at another, or part days, and the person would only qualify for the amount of leave that they actually work. So if they're working three half days at three different employers, they'd qualify for three, four, ten days at part-time pay levels. Um, so I don't think we're likely to see situations where people get to take three lots of 10 days at a full-time pay level because um, you know, I know there's lots of people in this chamber who work far more than a full-time day's work, but we're not talking about people who work three full-time jobs who would qualify for three full-time levels of this form of leave. Senator Lambie. <coughs> Um, do permanent, um, permanent part-time employees get 10 days per employer as well? Yes. Minister. Yes, they would, but obviously at the part-time rate. If, if, you're talk, if you're talking, it's effectively the idea is to provide leave for the amount of time that you actually work. So, sorry, at part-time hours. Part-time hours. So, if I was working. Um, 20 hours a week and I accessed this form of leave, then I would be entitled to 10 days leave at the rate that I'm being paid, being the part-time rate, the 20 hours a week. You don't qualify for 40 hours a week or 38 hours a week leave if you're only working 20 hours a week. You get up to 10... <laughs> Sorry. You, yeah, you get you, your your entitlement is to be paid the amount that you're paid when you're actually at work. The question is that the amendments on uh, one to thirty seven on sheet one six zero eight revised moved by leave together be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. No. The noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that amendments 1 to 37 on sheet 1068 moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chairs, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Lambie, teller for the ayes, and Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 3, noes 41. The question is resolved in the negative. Senator Walters. Yes, thanks very much, Chair. And uh, I seek leave to move all of my amendments together. So that is uh, amendments 1 to 41 on sheet 1652 by leave together, but also. 1 and 2 on sheet 1641 by leave together and 1 and 2 sheet 1653 by leave together in the interest of passing this imperative bill. It's granted. Senator Walters. Thanks, Chair. So I'll just briefly speak to these amendments. Um, the first one, 1641, are minor amendments to the definitions and to the notes to clarify the eligibility for family and domestic violence leave. We do welcome the bill's uh, existing amendments to provide more examples of activities that would justify taking family and domestic violence leave. However, uh, submitters like the Women's Legal Service and the Law Council and a few others told us that more clarity would help victim survivors and employers. 
So the amendments that we've proposed to provide that uh, clarity are that leave would be available to not just those who are currently experiencing, but to those who have experienced family and domestic violence. So this responds to concerns by the Law Council that victim survivors may need to access leave over a long period of time related to the same abuse, um, even after an employee has escaped an abusive relationship and is no longer directly experiencing the violence. They might still need leave to attend court hearings or counselling or related medical appointments. Um, the amendment that I'm moving also would clarify that an employee can access leave to undertake activities uh, that it is unsafe for them to do outside of work hours. So that expands the existing bill's provision, uh, which relates to activities that are impractical to undertake um, other than outside of work. Uh, rather outside of work hours. So this would say, well, it's, it could also be unsafe. Um, obviously, safety is a key issue in matters of um, keeping women free from violence. So we think that's an important addition that would provide that, that reassurance. Um, we also would like the note to be expanded so that the examples provided of the sorts of things that you can seek to access the leave for um, are nice and clear. Uh, and give employees the reassurance and employers the guidance on the sorts of activities that might be permissible. So that's our first amendment, 1641, uh, which for some reason the government has said they won't support, although frankly they have absolutely no reason not to support because it's a technical clarification amendment. So I would urge them uh, to rethink their opposition to that amendment. Um, it's very simple and would be worthwhile doing. Um, the second amendment, uh, 1652. Uh, recognises the fact that 10 days uh, paid leave won't always be enough to do all the things that are needed, and so this proposal would allow for additional unpaid leave days on top of the 10 days paid. And the reason for that it was, uh, would be, as I've said, to uh, ensure that workers have enough time to do the things they need to do, but also that would reflect the best practice minimum standards um, in other jurisdictions. Now. Um, I'm told that the government doesn't support that one either, although, again, we wish they would. Uh, the final amendment, 1653, um, is another amendment that I, that I think the government should give serious consideration to supporting. It would insert a new provision into the Fair Work Act uh, to make experiencing or having experienced family and domestic violence a protected attribute. So this is critical to preventing workplace discrimination against employees who disclose family and domestic violence. The whole objective of paid family and domestic violence leave uh, is to drive cultural change and destigmatise disclosure. So this amendment is, uh, naturally supports that by ensuring that employees who do disclose family and domestic violence aren't then um, sacked or discriminated against for disclosing that. Uh, so they are the substance of the three amendments that the Greens are seeking to move, and we urge the government to not wait for some review of this bill to consider those sensible amendments, but just make them now. Thank you. I'll, I'll go to the minister, and then I'll come to you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, the government does not agree to the three amendments the Greens are uh, proposing. Uh, in a number of cases because um, our very strong view is that the bill, as it currently stands, achieves exactly what the amendments are seeking to achieve. So just stepping to them, through them quickly, um, the amendment um, sheet 1641, uh, which seeks to broaden the wording to apply to an employee who has experienced family and domestic violence and also seeks to um, amend um, the wording to apply to situations where it's impractical or unsafe for an employee to do certain things. Um, the current wording of the bill, um, which talks about uh, applying to an employee who, has, who is experiencing uh, family and domestic violence, that is a flexible concept and picks up a broad time period in which a person experiences the consequences of family and domestic violence. Um, other forms of leave, such as personal and carer's leave, may be available to eligible employees to deal with longer-term physical and psychological issues. Um, it's also We don't consider that it's necessary to add the word unsafe um, to the particular clause in the bill. The existing clause uh, refers to situations where it is impractical to do something uh, and 
I would find it very hard to believe that any court or tribunal would not consider something to be unsafe to also be impractical. So we think that that uh, covers the field effectively. Um, the, what Senator Waters described as the technical amendment uh, here as well um, relates to a note um, to a clause. The note does not, ha is not, does not have operative effect, although it gives guidance to employers and courts as to the intended scope of a section. Um, as Senator Waters would, would know, the Act, Act's Interpretation also, Act also makes clear that examples in notes are not exhaustive, and the note itself clearly states that the examples are non-exhaustive. So we don't believe that that part of the amendment is necessary. For sheet 1652, we are also not, not agreeing to this one. Um, this seeks to provide an entitlement for a further four days unpaid family and domestic violence leave annually, where employees have exhausted their annual 10 days of paid leave. One of the underpinning policy objectives here is that employees can take leave to deal with the impact of family and domestic violence without the loss of income that they would have otherwise experienced. And of course, the National Employment Standards sets out minimum requirements. Employers are already free to provide additional leave at their discretion, either on, a, on an ad hoc basis through workplace policies or as a result of bargaining. Uh, the bill also amends subsection 106, capital A, subsection 5. Uh, to clarify that employers and employees can agree that the employee may take more, more paid or unpaid leave in addition to than a minimal, uh, minimum entitlement. Uh, set sheet 1653, um, which seeks to add a new section to the Fair Work, Work Act, providing that an employer must not take adverse action against a person who is an employee or prospective employee uh, because the person has experienced or is experiencing family and domestic violence. Again, um, we don't agree to this amendment because the Act already does this, exercising a workplace right, including taking or requesting to take paid family and domestic violence leave, is already protected uh, by the general protections in the Fair Work Act. Uh, an employee requesting or taking family and domestic violence leave is protected from adverse action, including an employer dismissing an employee, injuring them in their employment, altering their position to their detriment or discriminating between them and other employees, and an employer refusing to employ a prospective employee or discriminating against them in the terms and conditions the employer offers. So the, the existing Fair Work Act already does what the Greens are seeking to achieve via their amendment, so we don't support this amendment being made. Uh, I'll go to Senator Lambie. I, okay. Senator, Lam Senator Walters. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I won't be long. Um, thanks, Minister, for um, outlining that you think many of these amendments are actually already the intent of the bill. As you and I both know, the fact that you've said that also means that when people are interpreting this bill, they can rely on that. So thank you. But just one question uh, of clarification in relation to 1641, when we're talking about people who have experienced uh, rather, uh, those who are experiencing versus those who have experienced. I, uh, my ear picked up two things that sounded contradictory, so I'm just seeking your clarification. You said it was a flexible concept, but you then also said that people could use other forms of leave. Can I just ask you to clarify, is it your view that the current wording in the bill, which says that the leave is available to those who are experiencing FTV, are you suggesting that that is a broad enough definition to encompass those who have experienced it, or are you saying that if it's a past abuse, you can use other forms of leave? It's a very important clarification. Oh, sorry, uh, Minister. Well, I was, can I suggest I just take a bit more advice on that, and um, perhaps we could hear from Senator Lambie or one of the other senators while I get that advice. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I, I just have a request, if I may. Um, I was just wondering if we may split um, and vote 1652 and 1641 together, and 1653 separately, please. Yeah. Can you just repeat Thank that you. for my own paperwork? Sorry, Mike. So, sorry, Acting yeah. Deputy President. Mm -hmm. So together is 1652 and Amendment 1641 mm -hmm. and 1653 be taken separately. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, I, in the hands of the chamber, I might go back to uh, the minister. Uh, minister. Uh, we certainly have no objection to Senator Lambie's request. Um, the point I'm making. Uh, Senator Waters, is that 
Um, the legislation, as is currently drafted, um, provides the entitlement to an employee who is experiencing family and domestic violence. Um, what I'm advised is that um, the, the intent here uh, is not to say that someone needs to be um, I'm trying to f think of appropriate terminology. Um, having violence inflicted upon them at that very moment in time, if it if it is something, for instance, if it's violent violence that has been going on for some time, it might not be happening at the exact moment that the request is being made, but they are experiencing domestic violence because it's been happening in in recent times. Then they would be able to make a claim for that. Now I can't get into you know how long. You know how long ago, like as you know, every piece of legislation is left to courts and tribunals to interpret um, using a reasonable person test. We're not saying that someone has to have experienced domestic violence in the last five days, five weeks, five months. It's um, we we will leave it to courts to interpret that as they do every other piece of legislation. Um, but I would think that a reasonable person would interpret that legislation to say that if someone is experiencing um, family and domestic violence, maybe not necessarily at that m exact moment in time, but in recent times that it's having an effect on that person in the form of trauma or something else, then they would be able to make a claim. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just for absolute clarity's sake, can I put that in a, a simpler way and you can tell me if I'm correct or not? So you're saying it also applies to people who have experienced domestic violence, which is exactly why we wanted to move the amendment to put that beyond doubt. But I just want to confirm that. Minister. Well, I, I can't really add to what I've already said. Uh, Senator Walters. Well, people shouldn't have to go to court to understand the parameters of otherwise really good laws. And it sounds to me like you want to support it, but maybe you don't want to because the Greens' name's on the top of the piece of paper. <laughs> Which has happened before. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a bit cross here, but can you please just let us know now whether or not your definition of those experiencing violence includes those who have experienced family and domestic violence? Minister. It's disappointing um, that even in legislation dealing with a new form of leave for family and domestic violence position, uh, leave, um, that the Greens would try to make a partisan point. Uh, in suggesting that we're taking a position, no, you're in suggesting Order. in suggesting that we might be taking a position because it's got a political party's name on it is a ridiculous partisan comment in a really important piece of legislation, and I'm disappointed that that comment has been made. This debate has been conducted in a very civil manner, without partisanship, and it's disappointing to hear a suggestion that we are taking a position because of the name of a, a party that's Order. on an amendment. I am giving you the best advice I possibly can. You know, Senator Waters, you're a lawyer, as I am, and you know that every piece of legislation that is passed by this parliament leaves matters open to interpretation by courts and tribunals. What I am saying to you, as I have said three times now, is that, um, that the words is experiencing, that someone is experiencing family and domestic violence. I have said repeatedly that that does not require that violence to be occurring at the moment in time that someone makes that request. We all know that people experience domestic violence um, beyond the time that violence is actually being physically inflicted, the trauma that it causes. And so if someone has, has, has had violence inflicted upon them, for example, in the days leading up to them making a request and they are traumatised by that and they are fearful of their position, then, then I would suggest that a reasonable court would interpret these laws to say that that person could take that leave. And I'd appreciate it if we could keep the partisan comments out of a very important bill um, that I would like to think that we can all support just for once. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks, Chair. Look, I'll thank the minister for the clarification. And I have reasons for making the statements that I made. I have no disgruntlement with the minister at the minute in the, uh, in the chamber. Um, but we have sought for a very long time to get support for these amendments and have been stonewalled. And it's not Minister Watt's fault. I just want the record to note. I don't cast those aspersions lightly. There's a reason for why I've said them. But I thank the minister um, representing for his clarification on the scope of what those experiencing family and domestic violence means in this context. 
If there are no further speakers, uh, what we're going to do is, at the request of Senator Lambie, we will deal with uh, sheets 1652 and 1641. So the first question before, before the, the, the committee will be that amendments 1 to 41 on sheet 1652 and amendments 1 and 2 on 1641 uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. 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 Then the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, Senator Walters. Thank you, Chair. Again, in the interest of saving time, can I please ask, rather than a division, that the Greens' support for our very sensible amendments be recorded? Uh, thank you, Senator Waters. That, that, um, le leave is granted for that. So yes, uh, thank you, Senator Waters. Uh, then we move on to uh, amendments one and two on sheet one six five three. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Walters. Yes, likewise. Can we record the Australian Greens' support for our own amendment? And I believe Senator Lambie might wish to do the same. Okay, but by leave that that is, that is that is agreed to. So I now move on to. I think I'm going to call the opposition. Uh, Senator, Senator Cash. Thank you, Chair. And I seek to leave move, move opposition amendments on sheet 1645, revised 1 and 2. Uh, no objections. Uh, leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you. This amendment is intended to ensure an independent review is conducted into the operation of paid family and domestic violence leave, especially in relation to the impact the bill will have on small business and sole traders. Uh, the bill is currently before us does not have a review mechanism in place. Uh, and it is important that, with a change like this to the operation of the National Employment Standards, that we review those changes to ensure that they are appropriate in the way that they have been developed. Uh, the committee that inquired into this bill, and I do thank Senator Matt O'Sullivan uh, for all the work that he did, recommended that the Australian Government commission an independent review of the provisions of the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill uh, to be undertaken. Uh, 18 months after the commencement of this schedule. Um, I do appreciate uh, the cooperation that the government has provided to us. Uh, the amendment that they have requested uh, and that the opposition have agreed to is in relation to uh, section 2C adding the words people experiencing family and domestic violence and, of course, in relation to the amendment that has been moved by the opposition uh, at part four, the review must start as soon as practicable after the end of the period of 12 months uh, after the commitment of Schedule 1. And I do thank the government for its support. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I might go to the minister. Minister. And then I'll come to you, Senator Walters. Minister. Uh, um, thanks, Deputy President. Uh, the, now that this amendment has been amended by the opposition, we will be supporting the revised amendment. Um, the government was already intending to conduct a review uh, of this legislation. Uh, with this amendment that's now been made to the original amendment, our concern is that, st that the statutory review would not take into account the views and, and voices of survivors is resolved, uh, and that's why um, uh, we will be supporting the revised amendment. Senator Walters. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Look, it is a very interesting change of position uh, because we heard the minister wrapping up on the second reader saying that the time frame was wrong and the scope was wrong. Now, the scope's been changed to add in women, which is a very good, albeit belated, recognition from the opposition that that is, in fact, uh, survivors' experience should, in fact, be considered in reviewing the operation of these new laws. So, congratulations for. Um, for remembering women in your proposed review, but the scope of the time for the review still has not been changed. The government earlier were objecting on the basis that 12 months was too short, given the delayed implementation of these new laws for small business. They will have only been in operation for six months. Um, the government's view earlier today was that that would not be enough time to adequately consider the impacts on small business. Uh, they've apparently changed their mind. Um, uh, can I just add it's also highly unusual to be reviewing a bill in this fashion in any case. And the only reason we would support this review would be to expand the scope of the bill. Uh, so with that said, I'll sit down. Thank you, Senator Waters. And if there's no uh, further contributions, the question before 
uh, the chair is that amendments one and two on sheet 1645 uh, revised uh, be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call uh, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Deputy President, and I move amendment number one on sheet 1691. Thank you. If there's no one uh, speaking uh, to that, the question before the chair is Amendment 1 on sheet 1691, and that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. <coughs> Nothing else. The question uh, now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. <laughs> Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Fair Work Amendment Paid Family and Domestic Violence Leave Bill 2022 and agreed to it with amendments. Clark? Oh, sorry. Uh, Minister. I move the report be adopted. Those of, that, uh, those, uh, that, uh, who, uh, uh, those of those who agree with that say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion uh, say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 to provide for paid family and domestic violence leave and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day Number Two. National Health Amendment General Co-Payment Bill 2022. Resumption of second reading debate. And uh, I'll just call order in the chamber before I call Senator um, Rustin. All right, Senator Rustin. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the opposition is very pleased to support this bill, uh, the National Health Amendment General Co-Payment Bill 2022, because it enables the implementation of a key coalition election commitment, a commitment that the Labor Party was shamed into copying during the election campaign. The bill amends the National Health Act 1953 to reduce the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme general co-payment by $12.50 from $42.50 to $30, saving patients on out-of-pocket expenses. The opposition remains absolutely committed to ensuring Australians have access to affordable medicines when they need them. And we support this legislation to reduce the cost of medicines because the coalition has always been committed to ensuring Australians can access the essential and life-saving medicines at an affordable price. The coalition has a strong record of delivering affordable, life-saving medicines for all Australians, and we encourage this government to continue our policy to list all medicines on the PBS that are recommended by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Council. The bill amends the PBS general co-payment from the current amount of $42.50 to a new amount of $30, taking effect as of 1 January 2023. For certain medicines or treatments that have a Commonwealth price between $30 and $42.50, which are indexed annually, the bill gives pharmacists an option to discount that price to general patients by more than $1 while supplying as a PBS script. This ensures no patient is worse off after the reduction of the general patient charge, given the established practice of pharmacists to be able to discount medicines that have a Commonwealth price at or below the current general patient charge. The bill gives effect to an election commitment made by Labor in response to the Coalition's clear leadership on this issue. On 30 April 2022, the Coalition announced an election commitment to reduce the PBS general patient's charge by $10 as part of an annual $150 million hip pocket saving for Australians. We plan to wind the clock back on the cost of medications, reducing the cost per script back to 2008 prices. Following this announcement, on the very next day, Labor announced that they would reduce the general co-pay by an additional $2.50. 
I also note in the budget last night that Labor continued their long-standing commitment of copying coalition policies by listing medicines on the PBS that had already been announced were going to be listed. We had provision for skin cancer patients to get PBS access to, the, to Libteo, which will benefit around 1,000 patients with metastatic or locally advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma each year. Without this subsidy, patients face costs of more than $144,000 for a single course of treatment. We had also provision for the 1,450 patients with advanced and metastatic gastroesophageal cancers to benefit from the listing extension of Obdivo on the PBS, saving these patients over 92,000 per course of treatment. Another copycat initiative of this new government is also trying to claim credit for its funding of support for an additional 71,000 people who live with type 1 diabetes enabling them to get access to subsidised continuous glucose monitoring, an initiative that was announced by the coalition government earlier this year. I welcome the government's decision to put support these measures and their recognition that the coalition is a policy leader when it comes to affordable medicines and is supporting Australians who rely on them. We are pleased that we were able to lead the government into making commitments on this important policy area to support the hip pockets of Australians who rely on essential medicines and treatments. The Coalition has a strong track record of providing Australians with timely, affordable access to effective medicines, treatments and services. When we were in government, we listed more than 2,800 new or amended medicines on the PBS, representing an average of around 30 new listings per month. Most recently, from 1 April 2022, our strong economic plan meant that we were able to ensure patients suffering from severe heart failure, high cholesterol and high blood pressure could afford cheaper medicines to treat their conditions. We were also able to lift, uh, list life-saving drugs to support Australians with asthma, prostate cancer, Castleman's disease, HIV and Crohn's disease. This includes the PBS listing of Trelega tre tre Elipta 200, which was funded by our government to expand for Australians with severe asthma. Asthma is a, a common chronic condition and can become serious, especially if untreated. Without the PBS subsidy, over 1,000 Australians may have paid more than $1,000 per year for treatment. Another integral listing supported by the former coalition government was an oral treatment that has shown improved survival outcomes for patients with prostate cancer who have specific gene variants. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer diagnosed in men in Australia and the third most common cause of cancer death, with one in six men estimated to be diagnosed with prostate cancer by the age of 85. And we did not stop our plan to stop there. In the coalition's 22-23 budget, we provisioned $2.4 billion for new, more new and amended PBS listings. These listings also included critical treatments for breast cancer, cystic fibrosis, severe eczema, asthma, spinal muscular atrophy, HIV infection and heart failure. By listing medications on the PBS, we ensured that Australians have access to affordable, life-saving medications that would otherwise cost thousands of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars without a subsidy. It's disappointing that, on the other hand, Labor had stopped listing medicines on the PBS when they were last in government in 2011 because they couldn't manage money. Australians requiring medicines to treat severe asthma, chronic pain, schizophrenia, <coughs> blood clots, IVF, endometriosis and prostate conditions were all impacted by Labor's inability to afford important investments in the PBS. In announcing this legislation, the Albanese government highlighted the reduction in the co-payment as a cost of living relief measure to address the significant pressures facing Australians right now, right across the country. And although the opposition supports reducing the cost of medicines to provide relief directly to the hip pockets of Australians, it's important to note that this is one of the very few cost-saving relief measures the Albanese ha government has announced in its budget so far, and it also doesn't take effect until 2023. We support Labor's bill to reduce the maximum general co-payment for medicines on the PBS. However, we hope that they do not consider their job done on supporting Australian families with the rising cost of living by this one initiative. The opposition has significant concerns that the Albanese government could fall back into their old pattern of having to stop making critical investments into essential supports for Australians and will hold the government to account to ensure that they do not repeat the disaster of their poor economic management in the last government that saw important medicines stop being listed. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Steele, John. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, President. 
Um, now, uh, the Australian uh, Greens will be uh, supporting this bill to uh, reduce the general co-payment of the PBS uh, of PBS items uh, from uh, $42.50 down to uh, $30. Uh, we know, in doing this, that this is in fact the bare minimum um, that this government could be doing um, to improve access uh, to medical supports um, that members of our community need at the moment. Um, I hear uh, from many members of our community, and particularly from young people, uh, that when they seek support, uh, particularly mental health support, they are confronted with a system that either doesn't have the capacity uh, to see them in a timely manner or simply costs too much. Our community needs access to affordable and accessible Medicare services like never before. They need their dental care to be covered under Medicare. They need their mental health supports uh, to be covered. They need their GP to be affordable and to be well trained. Tax cuts for billionaires, like uh, those which were provided uh, in the budget last night during a time when people can't afford to see the dentist, to go to a doctor, to access mental health supports uh, when they need them, is a completely unjustifiable move. Uh, by this Labor government. Now, I will flag in this contribution um, that the Greens uh, will be supporting the amendments uh, offered by Senator Pocock. Um, the amendments to this bill uh, offered by the Senator uh, relate uh, to Section 100 um, to ensure uh, that decisions made under the Section 100 powers uh, are always created as legislative instruments, um, allowing them to be uh, scrutinised and to be uh, disallowed ultimately uh, should the Senate see fit. I have actively questioned the Health Department at Senate Estimates about the Section 100 programmes under the National Health Act, uh, particularly in relation to, to the opioid uh, dependency treatment programme. Now, opioid dependency is a complex health condition that requires long-term support and long-term care. Such treatment programs as opioid dependency um, make a real impact on people's lives. I'll say that again. Programs like this, the opioid dependency treatment program, make real impacts on people's lives. These are real programs that shape people's lives every single day. And this particular program, at the moment, as constituted um, and enabled under the Section 100 pro provisions, has come into being and been enforced through an instrument that is not subject to the scrutiny of this parliament. Scrutiny in these issues is so vitally important because it acts as a counterbalance on government, particularly when government thinks that it can get away with mistreating people, uh, when it thinks it can get away with placing burdens upon communities because those communities are subject to stigma. And that is very much the case uh, with those who access uh, this particular programme. The general co-payment bill, and I'll say this again very clearly, is the bare minimum that the Australian community needs. Let's get the Australian community the health care that they actually deserve. Let's get dental care into me to Medicare. Let's get mental health into Medicare. Let this Senate proclaim the radical proposition that the teeth and the brain are part of the body. The Greens will continue to make this logical case for the expansion of Medicare and to work with our community to drive out stigma and barriers uh, where they exist and to work to reshape the system in line with community need. Thank you, Senator Steele. John. You. Senator Pocock. Thank you, President. I rise to speak in support of the National Health Amendment General Co-Payment Bill 
This bill provides welcome and needed cost of living relief to people who regularly use medicines. I would have liked to have seen the government extend the support to concessional payments, noting that prices of concessional medicines are about to increase in line with record inflation figures. I'll be moving a separate amendment on this bill during the Committee of the Whole stage, but would like to speak to it now to save time. Section 100 of the National Health Act allows the Minister to make special arrangements for the supply of medicines. One such special arrangement is the Opiate Dependence Treatment Program, sometimes referred as the ODTP. As it currently stands, this arrangement compels pharmacists to charge private dispensing fees for opiate dependence treatments. Studies have shown these fees vary markedly across the country. While some pharmacies may charge as little as $1.50 per dose, some may charge up to $10. Therefore, the average cost for a patient can exceed $1,800 per year. Some can be as high as $3,640 a year. It's worth remembering that for every other PBS medicine, the government will pay the dispensing fee. Dispensing fees are also charged on a per-prescription basis, whereas for opiate dependence treatments, they are charged on a per-dose basis because of this special arrangement. The effect of this has been truly disappointing. These fees provide a financial barrier for people looking to manage their addiction. It's no stretch to say that they are actually contributing to deaths that could be prevented. This was substantiated in a 2019 coronal inquest in New South Wales, which found that it was, to quote, alarmingly clear that many opioid deaths were genuinely preventable. The New South Wales coroner further recommended that urgent attention be given to improving the affordability of drug substitution programs for all drug-addicted persons wanting access to them. Three years on, and not much has been done. Three people likely died yesterday from an overdose, and by the end of the day today, another three people in Australia will likely die. And this is all preventable. In Australia, guaranteed access to safe and effective medicines is a much-loved, well-protected component of Medicare. Our pharmaceutical benefits scheme provides financial protections to all Australians accessing any PBS medicine. Whether you're managing diabetes, a heart condition or reflux, you're guaranteed access to affordable medicines. Through the PBS, the government will subsidise the price of the medication if it's too expensive. It also protects people who need lots of medicines throughout a year through the PBS safety net. Once a person hits the safety net, they pay the concessional price for medicines, or if they're already paying concessional prices, then their medicines are provided for free. Senators may be alarmed to find out that the protections of the PBS safety net have been removed for opioid dependence treatments through this special arrangement, despite them being PBS medicines. There's no rationale for this. People accessing opioid dependence treatments are also subject to cost of living pressures, including rising health care costs. This is bad policy at best and discrimination at worst. To remove a nationally guaranteed protection for a group of people living with addiction disorder. The research is clear that these fees put people in a position where they have to choose between treatment and food. Some will skip meals to afford their treatment. Others will have no choice but to relapse or seek treatment in the already stretched public system. It is important to remember that opioid deaths and hospitalizations are caused by prescription opioids. Some of these prescription opioids are on the PVS and do count towards an, a patient's annual safety net. In that regard, the cost of the poison can be cheaper than their treatment. This special arrangement has baked in a financial disincentive for people to start treatment. 
This arrangement also negatively impacts community pharmacies. These are small businesses who have to make decisions to accrue debt in the interest of providing good health care. And that's exactly what they're doing across the country. In a survey of pharmacies in New South Wales and Victoria, over 70 per cent reported that they were providing credit, often bad credit, to patients who were un unable to pay their dispensing fees. I applaud these pharmacies for making these compassionate decisions to help members of their communities. While it speaks to the integrity of our healthcare providers that they are willing to make these decisions, they shouldn't have to. The Parliament has not been given an opportunity to review the specific arrangement due to the way that it was constituted. The arrangement has been set up under a non-legislative instrument. It has therefore never been considered by our scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee or the Joint Committee on Human Rights. It has been set up to specifically put it out of reach of the people in this chamber. I don't think that it's appropriate and it may not even be lawful. My amendment would make clear that all arrangements under Section 100 must be legislative instruments by 1st of July 2023. This is the effect of giving the Senate back its oversight of these arrangements. It also puts a lifeline, a, a, sorry, a timeline on actually having a reform to this existing instrument. If the current arrangement is not made a uh, legislative instrument by this date, I am advised that it will cease. I thank Minister Butler and his office for engaging with me on this important issue and for committing to reform. I understand there is a process to engage states and territories in this process, and this may take some time. Nonetheless, in the interest of those struggling every day, I urge the government to do all they can to ensure that this is dealt with as quickly as possible. I thank senators for their consideration of this amendment. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, Senator Watt. Um, thank you, President. Uh, over the last two days, the House of Representatives has debated legislation to introduce the biggest cut to the cost of medicines for Australian households in the 75-year history of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, uh, a cut in prices for general patients of almost 30 per cent to the maximum cost of their scripts, from $42.50 to just $30. It was a Labor government that first introduced the legislation to make life-saving drugs more affordable, and the Albanese government now remains committed to ensuring that the PBS continues to enable Australians access to affordable medicines. After almost a decade of Liberal and National Party neglect, the costs of living are soaring, with many Australians cutting back on essentials to make ends meet. They are being forced to choose between filling prescriptions for potentially life-saving medicines and providing for their families. This bill amends the National Health Act 1953 to reduce the maximum general patient co-payment under, under the PBS uh, from the current maximum of $42.50 to $30. From 1 January 2023, around 3.6 million Australians with current prescriptions over $30 will benefit through this initiative of the Albanese Labor government. People filling a prescription for one medication per month will save around $150 a year, while a family filling prescriptions for two or three medications per month could save $300 to $450 per year. The bill will ease the cost of living pressures that Australian households are experiencing around the country, but this bill will also have a profound benefit for public health. We know from the Bureau of Statistics that every year as many as 900,000 Australians go without the medicines that their doctors have said are important for their health simply because they cannot afford them. There is no doubt that all Australians place great value on the medicines and essential health care the PBS provides. All Australians deserve access to universal, prompt and world-class medical care. Pharmacist after pharmacist has told stories of their customers coming into their pharmacy and putting a number of scripts on their counter and asking for advice about which ones they can go without because they can't afford to fill all of their scripts that their doctor has said is important for their health. We know this policy will make a difference because Australians are telling us. Cherie from Bribe Island in my home state of Queensland says that after buying medications, she also must pay for groceries and rent. Every dollar adds up and she doesn't want to have to choose. She knows this change will make a big difference for her and her friends. 
or Grace, a 20-year-old type 1 diabetic who has just moved out of home. She told the Minister for Health, Mark Butler, I am so thankful that insulin will be cheaper for me now that I live out of home. Or Cornelia, who said, this will make such a difference to us. My husband is on about a dozen scripts a month to keep him well enough to keep on working. He's been able to work in a physical job thanks to great specialists, GPs, pharmacists and especially medical research staff. And thanks to the PBS, we can just about afford all of these drugs. Any further discount will help enormously. This bill will ensure patients receive the essential medical care needed to prevent serious illness and stay healthy. It will also allow Australians to shop around to get the best price for their medicine. The bill will ensure that no Australian will be worse off under this change by including provisions to allow pharmacies to continue offering discounts at current levels to their customers. Right now, Australians are paying the price for a decade of missed opportunities and drift. Through this bill, we will make a real difference to household budgets for millions of families, but also to people's health. After nine years of neglect from the former government, costs of living are soaring and Australians are cutting back on essentials to make ends meet. The maximum cost to general patients for PBS medications has doubled since 2000, and the previous government did nothing to help. Um, the Liberals and Nationals, when they were in power, committed to cutting the costs of medicines, but only the Albanese Labor government committed to cutting the general patient maximum co-contribution from $42.50 to just $30. Cutting the maximum price by nearly one third will mean more people can afford to get the medications they need to stay healthy. Um, this change will put close to $200 million back in the pockets of Australians each year. Just like Medicare, it was Labor that built the PBS, and Labor will always protect it so that all Australians can access affordable medicines when they need them. I thank all senators for their contributions and commend the bill to the House, to the Senate. So the question is that this bill will be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. <clears throat> a bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed, and I believe we have an amendment moved by Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move Amendment 1 and 2 on sheet 1684 together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Chair. I move the amendments. The question is that the amendments, uh, as moved by Senator Pocock, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Great job. The committee has now considered the National Health Amendment General Co-Payment Bill of 2022 and agreed to it um, with amendments. <clears throat> Senator Watt. I move that the report be adopted. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. And I move that the bill be read a third time. Thank you. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. Government business order for day number three, Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022 and a related bill. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cash. Thank you, President, and I rise to speak on the Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022. Uh, the Coalition understands that this legislation will become law and we will be supporting the bill. However, in my second reading contribution, I do want to acknowledge the significant deficiencies that have become apparent in the legislation that is being looked at before the Senate. The Coalition is sceptical about the benefit of the new arrangements, given that it has taken considerable time for any clarity on the organisation itself, the structure of the organisation and its remit. The government's stated objectives are to drive vocational education and training, 
vocational education and training and to strengthen workforce planning by establishing an organisation that includes employers, unions and the training and education <coughs> sector. It is important to note that this is the first of two tranches of legislation regarding Jobs and Skills Australia. What the bill before us does is merely establish the agency within the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations. It is unfortunate that the Labor Party were not able to outline the full remit and scope of this agency or how it will operate before they pressed ahead with establishing a new part of the bureaucracy. As a result, over 150 days into this new government, we only found out that the full remit of Jobs and Skills Australia just recently. It is, frankly, just a reconfigured National Skills Commission with some union paymasters appointed to the board. While developing better information coordination and leadership of Australia's workforce and skills is a noble aspiration, this function is already being provided by the National Skills Commission, established by the former coalition government in 2020. Over our nine years in government, the coalition strengthened and expanded Australia's vocational education and training system. After, of course, we cleaned up the mess that the former Labor government had wreaked in, on the VET sector in Australia, uh, and I'm particularly referring to their disastrous VET fee help policy that decimated vocational education and training in this country. In terms of the coalition's record, we achieved record investment in skilling Australians, including our $2 billion job trainer fund, which was specifically training Australians in areas of labour market demand, our $1.9 billion for the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees program, and of course, this is without a doubt one of the most successful programs the government has ever put in place in relation to apprentices. The coalition introduced this wage subsidy to shield apprentices and trainees from the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because after all, we all know, when a pandemic hits, who are the first people to be let go? The apprentices. And the coalition understood that we needed to take strong and decisive action to ensure that this did not occur, and we were successful. $1.91 billion in wage subsidies have been paid through the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees Wage Subsidy. We have assisted with that wage subsidy around 74,900 employers, and we supported over 152,700 apprentices and trainees. We also invested $1.5 billion in our boosting apprenticeship commencements. In terms of that, we invested $4.8 billion over four years, uh, from 2020 to 2021, through the boosting apprenticeship commencements wage subsidy to support businesses and group training organisations to take on new apprentices and trainees during the pandemic. This included $1.2 billion that we announced in the 2020-21 budget and a further $2.7 billion announced in the 2021-22 budget. We also invested $716 million to help second and third year boosting apprenticeship commencement apprentices complete. The coalition government expanded support to help apprentices finish their training protecting the skills pipeline delivered under the government's successful $3.9 billion boosting apprenticeship commencements program. We actually had record trade apprentices in training—220,000 of them. We established the National Skills Commission, which tonight, unfortunately, uh, we were abolishing, uh, to identify emerging and future workforce skills needs. We delivered 10 industry training hubs in regions with high youth unemployment. They will unfortunately also, I understand, they're being cut by the Albanese government. We delivered $75.3 million to revitalise TAPE campuses across Australia. And of course, our $585 million investment to deliver on the report for the skills and training system for tomorrow. The National Skills Commission, currently under the outstanding leadership of the National Skills Commissioner Adam Boyton, 
monitors, reports, researches and analyses employment dynamics across different groups, industries, occupations and regions. It considers how changes in the labour market will impact jobs and how those changes will impact the economy's education and skills needs. It also has an important role in simplifying and strengthening Australia's vocational education and training system. The Minister for Skills and Training actually stated that Jobs and Skills Australia will build on the National Skills Commission and has, given the resource profile, indicated that National Skills Commission staff will come across to Jobs and Skills Australia. In fact, we are told that Jobs and Skills Australia will be cost neutral because the existing funding for the National Skills Commission will cover the work for Jobs and Skills Australia. So the question that really does need to be asked is, is the new agency doing more than the current agency, the very successful National Skills Commission, or is it doing the same amount of work? It appears that Labor are just rebranding the National Skills Commission. And of course, this is something that the coalition will be monitoring very, very carefully because we know that the National Skills Commission has done, under Adam Boyting, absolutely outstanding work. The National Skills Commission was, of course, a key part of how the coalition government got the vocational education and training sector in Australia back on track. And as I said, uh, said in my opening comments, the coalition, of course, when we came into government, we inherited an absolute mess, the absolute decimation of the vocational education and training sector in Australia had been caused by the former Labor government by certain policy decisions that they had made. And what worries me more than anything, in particular when we look at the bill that we have before us tonight, we're over 150 days into the Albanese government and it is becoming increasingly clear that they have no plans for skills in Australia. The Labor Party, on any analysis, inherited a booming skills and training sector from the coalition government. There was, again, on any analysis, anyone will tell you, there was real momentum in skills and training thanks to the policy decisions that had been made by the former coalition government. The few announcements that we have seen the Albanese government make they have been delayed in implementation, of course, to align with the much-hyped Jobs and Skills Summit, uh, where the Prime Minister announced an additional 180,000 fee-free TAFE places for 2023. It sounds good, but it also belies the truth. We have since learnt that the Prime Minister misled the Jobs and Skills Summit. His training blitz is nothing more, as we now know, and one quite frankly should have expected, nothing more than marketing spin, with the vast majority of funded positions not new or additional at all. In fact, reports in the Australian newspaper suggest of the 180,000 committed places, over 66 per cent already exist and will only be further subsidised, hardly attracting real momentum in skills and training in Australia. And in fact, just 45,000 of them will be new, and all of them were already announced as part of Labor's fee-free fee TAFE pre-election commitment. Most incredibly, 15,000 of the aged care places were announced in the coalition government's March budget through its Job Trainer Fund. So the Labor Party, in doing that, have re-announced 15,000 new places that we announced when we were in government in March. I think, though, possibly from the Skills Summit, the announcement that has well and truly sent shivers down the spine of the industry-led training providers is the Prime Minister's reveal that, quite literally, the funding will go to public training providers only. This, as I said, has sent a shiver through the industry-led training providers because we know that private registered training organisations do 70 per cent to 80 per cent of the training across our VET sector in Australia. And on top of that, they're estimated to train 79 per cent of all women across the training system. The coalition's perspective is very, very clear, unlike the Albanese government's perspective. We need an even-handed approach to the entire skills sector that provides choice for our next generation. 
We would be extremely concerned if Jobs and Skills Australia embedded a bias for any part of the skills sector. So we need to safeguard and prevent unions from dominating this agency and turning it into an entity that only backs pro public providers in Australia. And then when I look at the Labor Party's track record on skills, again, you start to fear for the success of this agency. When they were last in government, despite all their talk, despite all their rhetoric, despite all their announcements, Labor delivered system-wide policy failures. And in fact, it's 2022. Many in the sector still talk about the dark old days of the former Labor government and the system policy failures that they delivered. The last Labor government decimated vocational education and training in Australia. Apprenticeship numbers took a nosedive, um, and that is obviously the reality uh, when it comes to skills policy. Labor failed. When they last left office, apprentice and trainee numbers were in free fall with the number in training collapsing by 22 per cent, or 111,300, between June 2012 and June 2013. And this was, as a direct result, a direct result of funding cuts by the Gillard Labor government in 2012. But I have to say, the worst policy failure when it came to skills and training under the former Labor government was, of course, the disastrous vet fee-help system, which literally saw the reputation of Australia's skills system hit rock bottom as tens of thousands of Australians were loaded up with debt for doing courses that would never, ever land them a job. And that is, of course, if the course they had enrolled for even existed. And I hate to tell the taxpayer, but in 2022, you are still picking up the tab for this enormous public failure to the tune of now over $3.3 billion. That is $3.3 billion that the Australian taxpayer has paid out in relation to Labor's disastrous policy of vet fee help. And in fact, over half a billion dollars, $516 million, was paid to over 37,000 students in the last financial year alone. That is the legacy of the former Labor government when it comes to skills in Australia. The scheme was established by the Labor government in 2008, expanded in 2012, and was plagued by system-wide rorting, with some training providers exploiting loose rules and charging students substantial debts for training that they never undertook or benefited from. It also targeted people with disabilities and substance abuse issues, public housing residents, non-English speakers and others with, lo and behold, offers of free laptops and other incentives. That is the system that the coalition government inherited from Labor. And yet we turned it around, we turned it around with good policy decisions. And the system that the Labor government have inherited from us is one that, quite frankly, should be the envy of many in the world. So whilst, yes, this bill will pass through the Senate tonight, uh, we fear it is nothing more and nothing less than effectively reconstituting the coalition's successful National Skills Commission. But the one fundamental change, and we will explore it in the committee stage, is with some union directors. I certainly hope uh, that, unlike other poor Labor policy, it does not end up costing Australia and the Australian taxpayer billions and billions of dollars for minimal and adverse outcomes. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Job and Skills Australia Bill 2022 and Jobs and Skill Australia National Skills Commissioner Repeal Bill 2022. These bills establish a new statutory body within the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations called Jobs and Skills Australia. Um, and establish an interim director to lead the body and abolishes the National Skills Commissioner. The Greens support this bill and have worked hard with the government to improve it. We secured amendments to ensure that Jobs and Skills Australia's functions 
include advising on opportunities to improve employment, vocational education and training, and higher education outcomes for marginalized cohorts, including First Nations people, people of color, and people with a disability. Uh, we've also secured amendments to ensure that Jobs and Skills Australia is required to advise on pathways into vocational education and training, and pathways between vocational education and training and higher education. Importantly, we also worked to ensure that in performing its functions, Jobs and Skills Australia consults more broadly, including with bodies representing First Nations people and migrants. These cohorts deserve a place at the table. The Greens are proud to be the party of public education. Our support for TAFE is unwavering. TAFE should be free, fully funded, and properly resourced with staff who are paid properly they are valued and respected for the incredible work that they do. Unfortunately, the coalition government gutted our TAFEs as they gutted our public education and training system over the last nine years, to the detriment of TAFE staff, students, and society more broadly. We need to recognize that the labor and skills shortage we are experiencing are the consequence of successive governments decimating TAFE and privatizing a perfectly good system, making education and training a bidding war between public and private providers, while removing essential funding from an already starving system. For many years now, hardly a week has passed without reports of plummeting apprenticeship numbers or for-profit private providers rotting funding or ripping off students. At the election just gone, the Greens recommitted to free TAFE and university and added a fully costed policy to abolishing all student debt. TAFE should be the priority for all federal funding for vocational education and training. There should be no government funding for providers that operate for private profit. Education is a public good and it should never be for profit. So now is the time not just to rebuild our TAFEs, but to unwind the crime of privatization, to restore the adult migrant English program, and to grow our education and training support for refugees and new migrants. Working conditions are also in need of urgent improvement. During the, during the sitting week a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of meeting with numerous TAFE teachers and staff on National TAFE Day. Secure long-term jobs for TAFE teachers and staff should be the norm, not the exception. There should be clear and measurable targets set for high rates of secure work with fair conditions across the sector. We also need a wholesale review to examine the impact of privatizations and the contestable funding model on TAFEs, their staff and students. The affordability of VET and the range and quality of courses provided. Jobs and Skills Australia can do this work, and they should do this work. With these goals in mind, I'm looking forward to continuing our work with the Labour government. It's been a good few years since we've had a government that didn't treat TAFE as an afterthought at best. In fact, if you were to scrub through the former government's budgets and policy documents on VET, you would be hard-pressed to find a mention of TAFE and the fine, hard-working people who deliver high-quality public education and training to all. I'm really pleased that we now have some common ground to build on, and I'm hopeful that we can work with the new government to bring back a strong public vocational education and training sector where teachers and students fl flourish. And I believe that Jobs and Skills Australia can play a role in that. I'm also hopeful that we can work together with the Labour government to ensure Jobs and Skills Australia's permanent functions, structure and governance arrangements give adequate prioritisation to the central importance of TAFE. Um, I do understand that there are some amendments being moved during committee stage. The Greens will be supporting the amendments circulated by Senator Cash as they actually improve transparency and accountability. We will also support Senator David, David Pocock's amendments 
which are about expanding consultation to include universities and his amendments on gender equality. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak tonight on the Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022 and Consequential National Skills Commission Repeal Bill 2022 uh, that proposes to establish Jobs and Skills Australia, the JSA, as the new statutory body to replace the existing National Skills Commission. The coalition supports securing Australia's workforce today and indeed into the future. The coalition has always supported our Australian workers, whether they're a young apprentice learning the tools of their trade at TAFE or a registered training organisation, a high school grad enrolled at one of our universities or uh, mid-career workers looking to switch their career paths. We have an excellent track record on supporting jobs as a coalition and supporting jobs, skills and training. And the coalition has always been the party of job creation. The coalition uh, has always been the party on the, uh, that backs the Australian people, that backs Australian businesses and employers. The coalition has always been the party of strong economic management, and uh, this is shown in our track record. In April 2022, more than 200,000 Australians were in trade apprenticeships, uh, the highest level since records began in 1963. And as a former apprentice myself, Having done an electronic servicing apprenticeship, completed it, worked in that field for a while, uh, I'm uh, incredibly proud of our record in ensuring uh, that Australians are able to take up apprentice apprenticeships. It's a, a terrific opportunity for people, and the more that we can create, the absolute better we are as a nation for it. Now, the other thing I'm very proud of is that during the pandemic, uh, the Morrison government worked to ensure that our apprentices were protected through wage subsidy measures and the $2.1 billion job trainer fund, which helped to set up job seekers and young people for the jobs of the future with low or, fee or low fee uh, training. Now, we know that whenever there's a downturn, it's, it, it's apprentices in particular, or those that are maybe less, uh, have lower skills, uh, are the first jobs to go uh, when there's an economic downturn, when there's any sort of disruption to the labour market. And for uh, this country to have seen an increase, for this country to have seen that record during that time is an absolute testament to uh, obviously the government who, who put in place the policies and enabled it to happen, but indeed, of course, to those employers that, that, that even in those times uh, took the steps to make sure that those jobs were available and that people were able to hold and secure those jobs. The pandemic measures, such as the JobKeeper and cash flow boost, saved around 700,000 jobs, according to Treasurer estimates. Uh, the coalition has a, a proven track record of supporting our Australian workers, trainees, apprentices, businesses and employers. So it's interesting to note that the proposed functions uh, and role of Jobs and Skills Australia bear a very strong resemblance to the existing framework of the National Skills Commission, which was set up in 2019 by the Morrison government at the recommendation of the Joyce Review. Now, it's an interesting rebranding exercise by the Albanese Labor government, uh, and unsurprisingly, it's not their first rebranding exercise that we've seen in this government. We've seen them with the cashless debit card, just rebranding it the so-called enhanced card. Uh, but I digress. Uh, it's refreshing uh, to see that the Albanese Labor government uh, that they've made a commitment to consult on the final model of Jobs and Skills Australia. After all, the National Skills Commission was set up in 2019 after broad consultation with businesses, employers, state and territory governments, unions, peak bodies and other key stakeholders from across every sector uh, of every capital city uh, in an additional re five regional locations. The overwhelming view uh, of these stakeholders was that the Commission uh, had to be independent, it had to be enduring, transparent and, importantly, it had to be authoritative. Uh, and under the leadership of Mr Adam Boynton, the National Skills Commission, uh, they've done excellent work in shaping Australia's skills and workforce needs. And I place on record uh, thanks for Mr Boynton, who did a terrific job, who has done a terrific job as a National Skills Commission. I always enjoyed uh, him in estimates and been able to quiz him. He was a wealth of knowledge and had a, uh, a, lot, to, a lot to offer. Uh, and I, I thank him very much indeed. 
Uh, I particularly commend uh, the, the Skills Commission's focus on training quality, on, on uh, efficient pricing for vocational education and training qualifications, and the rigorous analysis of the outcomes of the VET investment to ensure that Australia's VET sector is delivering the skills that employers need and setting students up for a valuable career. Yet it's concerning that the Albanese Labor government are now moving to scrap the Skills Commission, National Skills Commission, without having a detailed final plan uh, of what the final iterations of, of Jobs and Skills Australia will look like. Uh, this is looking dangerously like uh, government flying by the seat of their pants and making up policy on the run. Uh, so this, this doesn't bode well for the country, but uh, the Albanese Labor government have promised to consult with industry, with peak bodies, with employers, uh, with unions and with other key stakeholders and the opposition, and the coalition will, will hold them to this promise. They have promised that this will be an interim model and that it won't continue for a period longer than the 12 months that they said, so we will ensure that we hold them to this promise. So I, I call on the Albanese government to commit to finalising the JSA model within their 12-month Time frame. I call on them to honour their commitment to the sector, which deserves to know what the final model of JSA will look like, and I call on them to honour their promise for Jobs and Skills Australia to be an agency that will work in genuine partnership with industry and other key st stakeholders. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing how well the, the final model will come together uh, for Jobs and Skills Australia, we're align, whether it aligns with the expectations outlined by stakeholders during the hearing and in their submissions. And I was very uh, proud to be part of uh, that, uh, that, those hearings, and I commend the, uh, the, the Education and Employment Committee, Legislation Committee for the work that it did in hearing from stakeholders and examining this bill. Uh, but we're looking forward to seeing the Albanese Labor government keep their promises to consult widely with industry and businesses, with workers, employers, training providers, peak bodies, state and territory governments, unions and other key stakeholders. And we're looking forward to a successful Jobs and Skills Australia model that will reflect, reflect on a, a strong industry voice and takes leadership in conversations nationally and locally. Now, our workforce depends on this. Uh, it's important for the economy. Uh, it's important for the Australian people and particularly where my heart really goes it's important for young people that are making career choices that this government gets this right uh, because it's really critical that uh, people are given the best opportunity to fulfil their heart's desire when it comes to their career and of course training needs to match the needs of industry so that they can be employable and add value and feel good about the work that they do. So uh, our workforce depends on it. The Australian people need to know that this rebranding exercise, ultimately, is what it is, uh, is going to be worth it. Thank you. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the establishment of Jobs and Skills Australia. Australia's current skills shortages are felt acutely in Canberra by private and public sector employers and across the country and are uh, evidence that our training system needs attention and continued investment and innovation. We need a coherent national skills training and workforce plan that is developed and updated in collaboration with state and territory governments, industry, unions, vocational education and training providers, universities and job seekers across Australia. I acknowledge the work done in this place by many and the bipartisan support for improvements that ensure more Australians start and, importantly, more Australians complete apprenticeships, TAFE courses and university degrees. We need this to urgently address the skills gaps seen across the nation now and to guarantee Australia's position as an innovative leader in the industries of the future. A collaborative, nationwide, forward-thinking approach to skills, training and work workforce planning is needed to grasp the opportunities presented to Australia by the energy transition. We also need to provide vulnerable and underutilised Australians with the resources and opportunities they need to create a better future for themselves and their families. 
We could be doing so much more to close the gender pay gap, ensure training and education is accessible for First Nations people, and create opportunities in the workforce and inclusiveness in the workforce for people with disability. I am moving to amendments to this bill, which I'll speak about now rather than later in the interest of time. The first amendment acknowledges that universities are vital to skilling our population. They warrant explicit inclusion in the consultation requirements of Jobs and Skills Australia. I also look forward to further discussions with the government on how future legislation can better reflect the role of universities in supporting Australia's workforce. The Second Amendment is intended to deal with the gender pay gap in Australia, which is currently 14.1 per cent and widening. Gender inequality is not a social issue that can somehow be addressed in isolation from the day-to-day -day operations of government bodies. If we, are to be, if we are serious about pursuing gender equality, doing so must be embedded within the remit of such agencies and jobs, as Jobs and Skills Australia. I thank the Senate for consideration of these amendments and I commend the government on this bill. Senator Barbara Perkoff. Thank you, Acting De Deputy President. <clears throat> I rise today to speak in favour of these bills. Um, Senator Pocock, the other Senator Pocock, referred to the skills crisis in the ACT. It's a skills crisis that's felt across my own state, South Australia. And like Senator O'Sullivan, my first post-school education was in a VET uh, training enterprise, learning shorthand and typing in secretarial school. So I'm passionate about vocational education. I was a terrible failure at shorthand, but I consider touch typing to be the most significant and useful skill I've ever learned. I wrote my first book after undertaking a national study of the vocational training system in Australia and the many ways in which it needed to be strengthened. So for me, this bill is very important. It establishes Jobs and Skills Australia, a new statutory body, to advise government on Australia's current and future labour market and training needs. This will inform policy and create the workforce of the future. It will also change the lives of young people in our country. Labor have indicated this bill will be followed by a second tranche of legislation that further develops the role and functions of the JSA. At the Jobs Summit, I heard unions, business, community organisations unite in their call for urgent action to address workforce shortages and rebuild our public vocational education system. We had a very positive committee process, as Senator O'Sullivan has referred to, and many of the findings are reflected uh, in the things I want to say and others are making uh, the contributions they are making. The Greens have engaged in productive discussions with Labor to push and strengthen the role of the JSA from the outset. We're pleased to see these um, discussions reflected in the bill uh, and the changes that um, we've influenced. The JSA will now provide advice on pathways into vocational education and training, pathways between VET and higher education, as well as examining the resourcing and funding requirements for registered training organisations to, to deliver accessible, quality VET courses with an emphasis on public provision. This will include comparing the costs and outcomes of private training providers with publicly funded TAFEs. This is important because we know that a strong TAFE system is vital to improving the high-level skills and workforce development needs for our economic future. TAFE should be free, it should be fully funded, and it should be properly resources with staff who are paid properly, valued and respected for the work they do. TAFE should be a priority for all federal funding for VET and for profit uh, private providers of VET should not receive government funding. Sadly, our public TAFE system has been run down over the past 20 years, and as my colleague Senator Faruqi has outlined, we've paid a high price for that decline. The bills have been strengthened to provide advice on opportunities to improve employment, uh, vocational training and higher education outcomes for groups that have historically experienced labour market disadvantage and exclusion, as Senator Pocock has referred to them. This includes First Nations people, people with disability, people living in regional, rural or remote Australia and women. We need to ensure that the advice provided by the JSA focuses first and foremost on supporting women and other groups, migrants, 
uh, refugees, First Nations people that have experienced and continue to experience disproportionate disadvantage and barriers to ac accessing quality education, training and employment. The Greens uh, were also pleased to be able to strengthen the consultation requirement of the JSA to ensure that in undertaking its work it must consult and work with other persons or bodies, which include First Nations people, rural and regional Australians, uh, migrants and women. It's essential the JSA is required to consult with diverse voices so that the advice that it brings to government is well informed and has a tangible impact on improving outcomes. I acknowledge Senator David Pocock's amendments um, and that require the JSA to give advice on achieving gender equality in the provision of training and in the labour market and improving gender equality outcomes. What the JSA does can make a contribution to narrowing the intractable gender pay gap. We raised this concern in our negotiations with Labor and we're pleased to uh, support clear prescriptive treatment of particular groups that experience disproportionate labour disadvantage, such as women. Uh, we want to see gender equality as a focus of the JSA and we therefore support his amendment. We will always support greater transparency and accountability and acknowledge Senator Cash's amendments also requiring the JSA to publish an annual report and to table the minister's directions to the JSA. And we thank the Independent Tertiary Education Council of Australia for consulting with their members on these amendments and contributing their support uh, through those adjustments. While the Greens were pleased to see the JSA uh, strengthened in these ways, then in the next tranche of legislation we give notice that we will continue to push for stronger social equity outcomes and to ensure women get a fair share of the jobs and the training uh, as uh, the JSA evolves. All Australians deserve equitable access to vocational training. We need to increase the accessibility of quality vocational training. Uh, and we, this is critical because we know that accessible quality training leads to better jobs, to better lifetime employment outcomes. And this is good not only for young people, for workers and students, but also good for the economy more broadly. We heard at the Jobs Summit about the need to urgently address workforce and skill shortages currently facing so many parts of our country. Encouraging workforce participation for people with experience barriers will help address these shortages and support sustainable growth. We also need to make sure that women working in feminised industries—the care sector, retail, services and so on—experience training and employment outcomes on a par with male-dominated industries and male-dominated apprenticeship. For too long, feminised industries have been undervalued. This has resulted in lower wages and entitlements and second-class opportunities in too many places for training and progression. The JSA must also advise on how we can ensure that women get a fair share of the jobs of the future, including in new apprenticeships. As Australia and countries across the world transition to low-carbon economies, there is an opportunity for a huge, huge range, of, range of new jobs in existing and expanding areas. Women are currently underrepresented in many of these trades and areas, and they make up only 2 per cent, for example, of electricians, 1 per cent of mechanics and carpenters. We see similar results across the range of more male-dominated apprenticeships. Women make up only 5 per cent of electrical and mechanics apprentices and 2 per cent of carpenter apprentices. This is way too low. We can ensure women's participation in the trades through quality, pre-vocational and vocational education, the active recruitment of women and girls and good support in group training and employment environments. This takes planning and execution. It won't happen without targets and without tangible actions to achieve that target. I know this because I spent a few years of my life in the Newcastle region trying to increase the share of young women training in non-traditional occupations. It's hard work, but it pays off in pay packets for those young women, in lifetime careers in useful occupations like electrical apprenticeship, plumbing and so on. We heard in the process of our inquiries from the National Electrical and Communications Association, NECA, at our, um, at our meetings here in Canberra. They train about one in four electrical apprentices in Australia through a, a group training programs. In their ACT branch, <clears throat> they've reached a record 15 per cent of women apprentices. They've achieved this through targeted action, through quality pre-employment programs and good support for apprentices. 
Labor have announced in the budget a $95.6 million investment over nine years to train 10,000 new apprentices in the new energy jobs of the future. In my view, Labor needs to ensure that at least 15 per cent and hopefully more of these apprenticeships go to women. NECA have shown that with targeted actions it's possible to achieve it and it will change women's lives. This issue is particularly important in South Australia where we've got really severe shortages at the moment, for example, around electricians. Employers are desperately fighting for workers and we need to help them train the workforce of the future. It's critical we consider gender equity in our economic transition or women will be left behind and as an agency set up to provide advice on our future labour market, the JSA is well placed to perform this role. In sum and in conclusion, the Greens are supporting this bill as revised following our very productive discussions with Labor. At the Jobs uh, Summit, stakeholders including unions, business, women and community organisations were very clear that more needs to be done. The Greens will continue to push to ensure that gender equality and social equity outcomes are at the centre of any further jobs, skills and workplace legislation. And with Senator Faruqi, I look forward to working with the Labor government on a strong equitable public vocational training system advised by JSA. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to the Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022. This bill repeals the National Skills Commissioner Act and replaces that position with National Jobs and Skills Australia as a new statutory body within the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations and it sets out the initial functions of Jobs and Skills Australia. Initially, the Interim Jobs and Skills Director will commence urgent work now and lead the agency through its setup, initial setup. The agency's final duties and responsibilities and related matters will then come back to Parliament in legislation for our approval, or presumably modification. It's expected the agency will advise the government and industry on research, data analysis to inform policies that boost workforce participation, as well as better matching training and education with industry needs. Now, this seems fair, and One Nation will be supporting the bill. I must, though, say this. The role of this organisation, this agency, can be described as to assist in the central planning of the Australian economy. One Nation would be objecting more strongly to this bill if the agency did not already exist in another name the National Skills Commissioner. The not conservative Morrison government in 2020 introduced the original National Skills Commissioner for central planning. Having already created central planning in the labour and education market, this bill is a genuine attempt to make the planning better. Now, History around the world proves that industry has the resources and a vested interest a vested interest that gives it responsibility, a vested interest in planning its own needs in respect of the skill level, education, training and apprenticeship mix, and such like involved in running a business. History proves beyond any doubt, repeatedly, that individual businesses are best placed to do this planning for themselves, at times possibly with assistance of industry professional associations and unions. Instead, with this bill, the taxpayer bears the cost of forward planning, apparently with no cost recovery. Although, as the final form of the agency is not yet determined, I hope a cost recovery aspect will be put in place. Otherwise, the concept of this and the previous iteration is a concept One Nation objects to, the socialisation of cost and the privatisation of profits. Now, we hope the Albanese Labor government is not getting up to that caper. We had enough of that under the Liberal National Government under Morrison and Joyce, Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce. Governments lack responsibility for individual business outcomes. That is clear. That means governments lack accountability. And that is the fundamental reason why central planning fails. Every time it's tried, it fails. One Nation looks forward to a day when big business does its own planning, skills and training, like they used to before, the, before they got lazy and the government took it over. While we do not support government doing central planning of these basic business responsibilities, 
We see this bill as a step in the right direction, away from central planning, back to where the responsibility should be. We are one community, we are one nation, and the right to profit comes with an obligation for businesses to pull their own weight. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Minister. Thanks, Acting De Deputy President. I thank all members for their contributions to this debate. There has never been a greater need for an organisation like Jobs and Skills Australia. Australia is experiencing an acute skills shortage. Tightening labour market conditions have exacerbated the existing workforce pressures all across the country. Businesses are reporting significant challenges finding suitably skilled staff to fill vacancies, and many workers do not have skills that align with the current needs of industry and employers. There is a genuine and growing need for a workforce with relevant and high-quality skills in traditional sectors like construction and the care workforce and in emerging sectors such as clean energy and digital technology. We need to act now and the initial establishment of Jobs and Skills Australia will enable the essential work that is needed to find solutions to these skills and workforce challenges to start immediately. We also need to work in partnership with industry, unions, the education and training sector and students to ensure we get this right. We will continue to engage widely prior to introducing further legislation to establish the permanent Jobs and Skills Australia. This approach will ensure that Jobs and Skills Australia is designed in a way that considers the needs of all key stakeholders in our workforce and skills system. These are shared challenges and all levels of government, industry, business, employers, unions and education providers must work together if we are to unlock the full potential of Australia's workforce and ensure Australians have the skills and training needed for the jobs of today and the future. Once again, I thank everyone for their engagement, support and constructive nature of the proposed amendments of this bill. Thank you. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk.